Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of *The Prisoner in the Oak*, Book Four of *The Mists of Avalon*, by Marion Zimmer Bradley, narrated by Davina Porter. This book is copyrighted 1982 by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This recording is copyrighted 1993 by Recorded Books. And now. The Prisoner in the Oak. Chapter One. In the far hills of North Wales, rain had been falling day after day, and the castle of King Urien seemed to swim in fog and damp. The roads were ankle-deep mud, the fords swollen as rivers rushed down in spate from the mountains. And damp chill gripped the countryside. Morgane, wrapped in cloak and heavy shawl, felt her fingers stiffening and slowing on the shuttle as she sent it through the loom. Suddenly, she started upright, the shuttle falling from her cold hands. "What is it, mother?" Maylene asked, blinking at the sharp sound in the quiet hall. "There is a rider on the road," Morgane said. We must make ready to welcome him. And then, observing her daughter-in-law's troubled look, she cursed herself again. She had let herself slip into the half trance which women's work always brought upon her nowadays. She had long ago ceased to spin, but weaving, which she enjoyed, had seemed safe if she kept her wits about her and didn't succumb to the drowsy trance-like monotony of it. And Meline was looking at her in the half weary, half exasperated way which Morgane's unexpected seeings always evoked. Not that Meline believed there was anything wicked or even magical about them; it was just her mother-in-law's queer way. But Meline would speak of them to the priest, and he would come again and try to be subtle about asking her whence they came, and she would have to put on a meek woman face and pretend she didn't know what he was talking about. Some day she would be too weary or too unguarded to care, and she would speak her mind to the priest. Then he would really have something to talk about. Well, done was done, and couldn't be helped now. She got along well enough with Father Ian, who had been Uwain's tutor. He was an educated man for a priest. Tell the father that his pupil will be here at dinner time, Morgane said. And once again realized that her tongue had slipped. She had known Maylene had been thinking of the priest and had responded to Maylene's thoughts, not her words. She went out of the room, leaving the younger woman staring. All the winter, which had been heavy with rain and snow and repeated storms, not a single traveller had come. She dared not spin; it opened the gates too quickly to trance. Now weaving was likely to do the same. She sewed industriously at making clothes for all the folk of the household, from Urian's down to Meline's newest baby. But it was hard on her eyes to do fine needlework. In the winter, she had no access to fresh herbs and plants, and could do little with brewing simples and medicines. She had no companion. Her waiting women were the wives of Urian's men at arms and duller than Meline. Not one of them could spell out so much as a verse in the Bible, and were shocked that Morgane could read and write and knew some Latin and Greek. And she couldn't sit always at her harp, so she had spent the winter in a frenzy of boredom and impatience. The worse, she thought, because the temptation was always there to sit and spin and dream, letting her mind slide away to follow Arthur at Camelot. Or Acolon on quest. It had come to her three years ago that Acolon should spend enough time at court that Arthur should know him well and trust him. Acolon bore the serpents of Avalon, and that might prove a valuable bond with Arthur. She missed Acolon like a constant ache. In his presence, she was what he always saw her: high priestess, confident of her goals and herself. But that was secret between them. In the long, lonely seasons, Morgane experienced recurrent doubts and dreads. 
Was she then no more than Urian's thought her, a solitary queen growing old, body and mind and soul drying and withering? Still, she kept her hand firmly on this household, over country folk and castle folk alike, so that all should turn to her for counsel and wisdom. They said in the country around, The queen is wise. Even the king does nothing without her consent. The tribesmen and the old ones she knew came near to worshipping her, though she dared not appear too often at the ancient worship. Now, in the kitchen house, she made arrangements for a festal dinner, or as near to it as they could come at the end of a long winter when the roads were closed. Morgane gave from the locked cupboards some of her hoarded store of raisins and dried fruits, and a few spices for cooking the last of the bacon. Maylene would tell Father Ian that Uwain was expected at the hall for dinner. She herself should bear the tidings to Urien's. She went up to his chamber, where he was lazily playing at dice with one of his men-at-arms. The room smelled frousty and unaired, stale and old. At least his long siege with the lung fever this winter has meant I need not be expected to share his bed. It has been just as well, Morgane thought dispassionately, that Acalon has spent this winter in Camelot with Arthur. We might have taken dangerous chances and been discovered. Urien set down the dice cup and looked up at her. He was thinner, wasted by his long struggle with the fever. There had been a few days when Morgaine thought he couldn't live, and she had fought hard for his life, partly because in spite of everything she was fond of him and didn't want to see him die, partly because Avaloch would have succeeded to his throne the moment he died. "'I have not seen you all day. I've been lonely, Morgaine,' Urien said with a fretful note of reproach. "'Hugh here is not half so good to look at. Why?' Morgane said, tuning her voice to the broad jesting Urien's light. I have left you purposely alone, thinking that in your old age you had taken a taste for handsome young men. If you do not want him husband, does that mean that I can have him? Urien's chuckled. You are making the poor man blush, he said, smiling with broad good nature. But if you leave me alone all day, why, what am I to do but moon and make sheep's eyes at him? Or at the dog. Well, I've come to give you good news. You shall be carried down to the hall for dinner tonight. Wayne is riding hither and will be here before supper time. Now, God be thanked, Urien said. I thought this winter that I should die without seeing either of my sons again. I suppose Acalon will return for the midsummer festivals. In her body, Morgane felt a stab of hunger so great that it was pain, as she thought of the Beltane fires, now only two months away. Father Ian has been at me again to forbid the rites, Urien said peevishly. I am tired of hearing his complaints. He has it in mind that if we cut down the grove, then the folk would be content with his blessing of the fields and not turn away to the Beltane fires. It is true that there seems more and more of the old worship every year. I had thought that as the old folk died off year by year, it would grow ever less. I was willing to let it die out with the old people, who could not accustom themselves to new ways. But if the young people now are turning back to heathen ways, then we must do something. Perhaps even cut down the grove. If you do... I shall do murder, Morgane thought, but schooled her voice to gentleness and reason. That would be wrong. The oaks give pig food and food for the country people. Even here we have had to use acorn flour in a bad season. And the grove has been there for hundreds of years. The trees are sacred. You sound too much a pagan yourself, Morgane. Can you say the oak grove is not the work of God? she retorted. Why should we punish the harmless trees because foolish men make a use of them that Father Ian doesn't like? I thought you loved your land. Well, and so I do, said Urien's fretfully. But Avaloch, too, says I should cut it down so that the pagan should have no place of resort. 
We might build a church or chapel there. But the old ones are your subjects too, Morgaine said. And in your youth you made the great marriage with the land. Would you deprive the old people of the grove that is their food and shelter, and their own chapel built by the very hands of God and not of man? Would you then condemn them to die or starve, as they have done in some of the cleared lands? Eurians looked down at his gnarled old wrists. The blue tattoos there had almost faded and were no more than pale stains. Well, are you called Morgaine of the Fairies? The old people could have no better advocate. Since you plead for their shelter, my lady, I will spare the grove while I live. But after me, Avaloch must do as he will. Will you fetch me my shoes and robe, so that I may dine in hall like a king, and not an old dodderer in bedgown and slippers? Do be sure, said Morgaine, but I cannot lift you now. Hugh will have to dress you. But when the man had finished his work, she combed Urien's hair and summoned the other man-at-arms who awaited the king's call. The two men lifted him, making a chair between their arms, and carried him into the hall where Morgaine placed cushions about his high seat and watched as the thin old body was deposited there. By that time she could hear servants bustling about and riders in the courtyard. Uwain, she thought, hardly raising her eyes as the young man was escorted into the hall. It was hard to bear in mind that this tall young knight with broad shoulders and a battle scar along one cheek was the scrawny little boy who had come to her like a wild animal tamed in her first lonely, desperate year at Urien's court. Uwain kissed his father's hand, then bent before Morgaine. My father, dear mother, it's good to see you home again, lad, said Urien's. But Morgaine's eyes were on the other man who followed him into the hall. For a moment, she didn't believe it. It was like seeing a ghost. Surely, if he were really here, I would have seen him with the sight. And then she understood. I have been trying so hard not to think of Acalon, lest I go mad. Acalon was slenderer than his brother, and not quite so tall. His eyes darted to Morgaine, one swift, furtive look as he knelt before his father. But his voice was wholly correct when he turned to her. It is good to be home again, lady. It's good to have you here, she said steadily, both of you. Uwain, tell us how you got that dreadful scar on your cheek. Since the defeat of Emperor Lucius, I thought all men had pledged to Arthur to make no further trouble. The usual said Uwain lightly. Some bandit who moved into a deserted fort and amused himself by praying on the countryside and calling himself a king. Lot's son, Gawain, went with me, and we made short work of him, and Gawain got himself a wife out of it. The lady is a widow with rich lands. As for this, he touched the scar lightly. While Gawain fought the master, I took the man, an ugly bastard who fought left-handed and got through my guard. Clumsy, too. I'd rather fight a good swordsman than a bad any day. If you'd been there, mother, I wouldn't have quite such a scar. The surgeon who stitched it up for me had hands like cabbages. Has it spoilt my looks as much as that? Morgaine reached out and gently touched her stepson's slashed cheek. You will always be handsome to me, my son. But perhaps I can still do something. There is festering there, and swelling. Before I sleep, I will make you a poultice for it, so that it will heal better. It must pain you. It does, Uwain admitted. But I thought myself lucky not to get the locked jaw from it, which one of my men did. Ay, what a death. He shuddered. When the wound swelled, I thought I was for it too. And my good friend Gawain said, as long as I could drink wine, I was in no danger. And he kept me well supplied, too. I swear I was drunk for a fortnight, mother. He guffawed. 
I would have given all the plunder of that bandit's castle for some of your soup. I couldn't chew bread or dried meat, and I nearly starved to death. I did lose three teeth. She rose and peered at the wound. Open your mouth. Yes, she said, and gestured to one of the servants. Bring Sir Owain some stew and some stewed fruit too, she said. You mustn't even try to chew hard food for a while. After supper, I'll see to it. I won't say no to that, mother. It still hurts like the devil. And besides, there's a girl at Arthur's court. I don't want her to shrink away as if I were a devil face. He chuckled. But for all the pain in his wound, he ate hugely, telling tales of the court until they were all laughing. Morgaine dared not take her eyes from her stepson. But all through the meal, she could feel Acolon's eyes on her, warming her as if she were standing in sunlight after the winter's chill. It was a merry meal, but at last Urien's began to look weary, and Morgaine summoned his body servants. This is the first day you have left your bed, my husband. You mustn't weary yourself too much. Uwain rose and said, "Let me carry you, father." He stooped. And lifted the sick man as if he were a child. Morgaine, following, turned back before leaving the dining hall to say, "See to all things here, Maylene. I will bandage Uwain's cheek before I go to rest." Soon, Urien's was tucked into bed in his own chamber. Uwain standing beside him while Morgaine went to the kitchens to brew a poultice for his cheek. She had to prod the cook awake. And set him to heating more water over the kitchen fire. She should have a brazier and a cauldron in her own rooms if she was going to do this kind of work. Why had she never thought of it before? She went up and sat Uwain down so that she could poultice his cheek with the hot cloths wrung in steaming herb brew, and the young man sighed with relief as the poultice began to draw out the soreness from the festered wound. Oh, but that's good, mother. That girl at Arthur's court wouldn't know how to do this. When I marry her mother, will you teach her some of your craft? Her name is Shanna, and she's from Cornwall. She was one of Queen Isotta's ladies. How is it that Marcus calls himself king in Cornwall, mother? I thought Tintagel belonged to you. So it does, my son, from Egrain and Duke Gaulois. I knew not that Marcus thought to reign there. Morgan said, "Does Marcus dare to claim Tintagel as his own?" "No, for the last I heard, he had no champion there." Uwain said, "Sir Druston has gone into exile in Brittany." "Why, was he one of the Emperor Lucius's men?" asked Morgan. "This talk of the court was a breath of life in the deadness of this isolated place." Uwain shook his head. "No." There was talk that he and Queen Isotta had been over fond of each other," he said. "One can hardly blame the poor lady. Cornwall is the end of the world, and Duke Marcus is old and peevish, and his chamberlains say he's impotent too. Hard life for the poor lady, while Duston is handsome and a harper, and the lady fond of music. Have you no gossip of court save of wickedness and other men's wives?" Demanded Urien's scowling, and Uwain laughed. Well, I told the lady Shanna that her father might send a messenger to you, and I hope, dear father, that when he comes you will not refuse him. Shanna is not rich, but I have no great need of a dowry. I won goods enough in Brittany. I shall show you some of my plunder, and I have gifts for my mother too. He raised his hand to stroke Morgaine's cheek as she bent over him, changing the poultice for a fresh one. Well, I know you are not such a woman as that lady Isotta, to turn your back on my good old father and play the harlot. Her cheeks stung. She bent over the kettle of steaming herbs, wrinkling her nose at the bitter scent. Uwain thought her the best of women, and his trust was sweet to her. Yet there was the bitterness of knowing it unmerited. At least I have never made Urien's look a fool, nor yet flaunted any other lovers in his face. 
But you should go to Cornwall when my father is well enough to travel, Uwain said seriously, flinching a little as the heat of the poultice touched a new spot on his festered cheek. There should be a clear understanding, mother, that Marcus cannot lay claim to what is yours. You haven't shown your face in Tintagel for so long that the common people may forget they have a queen. I'm sure it will not come to that, said Uriens. But if I'm well again this summer, I will ask Arthur, when I write to Pentecost, about this matter of Morgaine's lands. And if Owain marries into Cornwall, said Morgaine, he shall keep Tintagel for me. Would you like to be my castellan, Owain? I would like nothing better, said Owain, except perhaps to sleep tonight without forty separate toothaches in my jaw. Drink this, said Morgaine, pouring one of her medicines from a small flask into his wine, and I can promise you sleep. I would sleep without it, I think, madam. I'm so glad to be in my own home and my own bed under my mother's care. Owain bent and embraced his father and kissed Morgaine's hand. But I will take your medicines willingly. He swallowed the medicined wine and beckoned to one of Urien's men-at-arms to light him to his own room. Acolon came and embraced his father and said, I too am for my bed. Lady, are there pillows there? Or is the room empty and bare? I haven't been home in so long. I expect to find pigeons roosting in that old room where I used to sleep, and Father Ian tried to beat Latin into my head through the seat of my breeches. I told Maylene to be sure you had everything you needed, said Morgaine, but I will come and see. Will you need me again this night, my lord? she asked, turning to Urien's. Or shall I too go to my rest? Only a soft snore answered her, and his man, Hugh, settling the old man on the pillows, answered, Go, Lady Morgan. If he wakes in the night, I'll look after him. As they went out, Acolon asked, What ails my father? He had the lung fever this winter, said Morgan, and he is not young. And you have had all the weight of caring for him, Acolon said. Poor Morgaine. And he touched her hand. She bit her lip at his tender voice. Something hard and cold inside her, frozen there since the winter was melting, and she thought she would dissolve into weeping. She bent her head and didn't look at him. And you, Morgaine? Not a word or a look for me? He reached out and touched her, and she said between clenched teeth, Wait. She called a servant to fetch fresh bolsters, a blanket or two from the store. Had I known you were coming, I would have had the best linens and blankets and fresh bed straw. He said in a whisper, It's not fresh straw I want in my bed. But she refused to turn her face to him while the serving women were making the bed up, bringing hot water and light, and hanging up his armour and outer garments. When they were all away for a moment, he whispered, Later, may I come to your room, Morgan? She shook her head and whispered back, I will come to you. I can have some excuse for being out of my chamber in the middle of the night, but since your father has been ill, often they come to fetch me. You mustn't be found there. And she gave him a quick, silent pressure of her fingers. It was as if his hand burned her. Then she went with the chamberlain on the last rounds of the castle to make sure that all was locked and secure. "'God give you a good night, lady,' he said, bowing, and went away. She tiptoed through the hall where the men-at-arms slept, moving on noiseless feet, along the stairs, past the room where Avaloch slept with Maylene and the younger children, the room where young Con had slept with his tutor and his foster-brothers, before the poor lad had succumbed to the lung fever. In the farther wing were Urien's own chamber, one she now kept for herself, another room usually allotted to guests of importance, and at the far end, the room where she had left Acalon. She stole toward his room, her mouth dry, hoping he had had the sense to keep his door ajar. 
The walls were old and thick, and there would be no way he could hear her at his door. She looked into her own room, went in swiftly, and disarranged the bedclothing. Her own waiting woman, Ruach, was old and deaf, and in the winter past, Morgaine had cursed her for her deafness and stupidity. But now that would serve her. Even so, she mustn't wake in the morning and find Morgaine's bed untouched. Even old Ruach knew that King Urien's wasn't well enough to share his bed with the Queen. How often have I told myself I am not ashamed of what I do? Yet she mustn't bring scandal on her name, or she could accomplish nothing here. But she hated the need for secrecy and furtiveness. He had left the door ajar. She slipped inside, her heart pounding, and pushed the door shut. Felt herself seized in a hungry embrace that waked her body into fierce life. His mouth closed on hers as if he had starved for this as much as she. It seemed as if the whole winter's desolation and pain fell away, and that she was like melting ice, that she would flood and overflow. She pressed her body to Acalon's and fought to keep from crying. All her resolve that Acalon was no more to her than priest of the goddess, that she would not allow any personal tie between them, had gone for nothing in the face of this wild hunger in her. She had felt so much scorn for Guinevere, bringing the court to scandal and her king into contempt, because he could not keep his wife in order. But now, in Acalon's arms, all her resolve melted. She sank down in his embrace and let him carry her to his bed. Chapter 2 the night was far advanced when Morgaine slipped away from Acalon's side. He lay heavily asleep. She ran her fingers over his hair, kissed him softly, and stole from the room. She hadn't slept. She had feared to sleep too long and be surprised there by day. It was more than an hour before sunrise. Morgaine rubbed her burning eyes. Somewhere outside a dog barked. A child wailed and was hushed. Birds chirped in the garden. Morgaine thought, looking out through a narrow slit in the stone wall, in another moon it will be full daylight at this hour. She leaned for a moment against the wall, overcome by memories of the night past. I never knew, she thought. I have never known what it was to be only a woman. I have borne a child, and I have been married for fourteen years, and I have had lovers. But I knew nothing, nothing. She felt a sudden rough hand on her arm. Avalok's hoarse voice said, What are you doing sneaking around the house at this hour, girl? He had evidently mistaken her for one of the servant women. Some of them were small and dark with the blood of the old ones. Let me go, Avalok she said, looking at the dimly seen face of her older stepson. He was heavy and soft, his jowls blurred with fat, his eyes small and set close. Acalon and Uwain were handsome men, and one could see that once Urien's had been good-looking in his own way, but not Avaloch. Well, my lady mother, he said, stepping back and giving her an exaggerated bow. I repeat... What were you doing at this hour? His hand remained on her arm. She picked it off as if it were a crawling bug. Must I account for my movements to you? It is my house, and I move in it as I will. And that is my only answer. He dislikes me, she thought, almost as much as I dislike him. Don't play games with me, madam, said Avaloch. Do you think I do not know in whose arms you spent the night? She said contemptuously, Now is it you who play with sorcery and the sight? His voice dropped and took on a cozening sound. Of course it must be dull for you, wed to a man old enough to be your father. But I wouldn't hurt my father's feelings by telling him where his wife spends her nights, provided... He put his arm round her, and by main force drew her close to him. He bent his head and nibbled on her neck, 
his unshaven cheek scratching her. Provided you come and spend some of them with me. She pulled away from him and tried to make her voice jocular. Come now, Avaloch. Why should you pursue your old stepmother when the spring maiden is yours and all the pretty young maidens in the village? But I've always looked on you as a beautiful woman, he said, and his hand stole out to caress her shoulder, sliding under the half-fastened front of her robe. She pulled away again, and his face twisted into a snarl. Why play the modest maiden with me? Was it Acalon or Uwain, or both at once? She stared at him. Uwain is my son. I am the only mother he can remember. Am I to think that would stop you, Lady Morgane? It was common talk at Arthur's court that you were Lancelot's paramour, and tried to lure him from the Queen and that you shared the Merlin's bed, that you hadn't stopped at making unlawful love to your own brother. And that was why the king sent you from court, that you might tempt him no more from Christian ways. Why should you stop at your stepson? Does Urians know what kind of incestuous harlot he took for his wife, madam? Urians knows everything about me that he has any need to know, said Morgane, surprised that her voice was so steady. As for the Merlin, we were then both unwed, and neither of us cares anything for the laws of a Christian court. Your father knew and absolved me of that. None but he has any right to complain of my conduct since then, and when he does so, I will answer to him, as I need not answer to you, Sir Avaloch. And now I will go to my own room, and I bid you do the same. So you throw the pagan laws of Avalon at me, Avaloch said, his voice a sneering growl. Harlot, how dare you claim you are so good? He grabbed her, his mouth crushed hers. Morgane stabbed her stiffened fingers into his belly. He grunted and let her go with a curse. She said angrily, I claim nothing. I need not answer to you for my conduct, and if you speak to Urians... I will tell him that you laid hands on me in a fashion unseemly for your father's wife, and we will see whom he will believe. Avaloch snarled. Let me tell you, lady, you may cousin my father as you will, but he is old, and on the day I am made king in this land, be sure there will be no more grace extended to those who have lived on, because my father cannot forget that once he wore the serpents. Oh, rare, said Morgane scornfully. First you make advances to your father's wife, and then you boast of how good a Christian you will be when your father's land is yours. You first bewitched me, harlot. Morgane couldn't keep back her laughter. Bewitch you? And why? Avaloch. If all men save you vanished from the earth, I would sooner share my bed with one of the puppies. Your father may be old enough to be my grandsire, but I would sooner lie with him than you. Do you think I am jealous of Maylene, when every time you go down to the village at harvest or spring ploughing festival, she sings? If I made such an enchantment, it wouldn't be to enjoy your manhood, but to wither it. Now, get your hands off me, and go back to whoever will have you, for if you touch me again with one fingertip, I swear I will blast your manhood. He believed she could do it. That was clear from the way he shrank from her. But Father Ian would hear of this, and then he would question her, and he would question Acalon, and he would question the servants. And then he would be at Urien's again to cut down the sacred grove and put down the old worship. Avaloch wouldn't stop until he had set this whole court by the ears. I hate Avaloch. Morgane was surprised that her rage was physical, a scalding pain beneath her breastbone, a shaking through her whole body. Once I was proud. A priestess of Avalon doesn't lie. And now there is something about which I must avoid the truth. Even Urians would see me as a treacherous wife, 
creeping in secret to Acalon's bed for her own lusts. She was weeping with rage, feeling Avalok's hot hands again on her arm and her breast. Now, soon or late, she would be accused, and even if Urien's trusted her, she would be watched. Oh, I was happy for the first time in many years, and now it is all spoilt. Well, the sun was rising, soon the housefolk would be waking, and she must make arrangements for the work of the day. Had he been only guessing? The Urians must keep his bed. Certainly Avalok wouldn't disturb his father this day. She must brew some more of the herb medicine for Uwain's face wound, and the roots of one of his broken teeth must be dug out too. Uwain loved her. Surely he wouldn't listen to any accusation Avalok might make. And at that, she felt the flooding, surging fury again, remembering Avalok's words. Was it Acalon or Uwain, or both at once? I am as much Uwain's mother as if I had borne him. What kind of woman does he think me? But was that rumour indeed in Arthur's court that she had committed incest with Arthur himself? How then, in the face of that, can I bring Arthur to acknowledge Gwydion his son? Galahad is Arthur's heir, but my son must be acknowledged, and the royal line of Avalon. But there must be no further scandal about me, certainly not any hint that I have committed incest with my stepson. And she wondered a little at herself. She had flown into a desperate rage when she knew she was to bear Arthur's son, and now it seemed trivial to her. After all, she and Arthur hadn't even known themselves brother and sister. But Uwain, no blood kin to her, was far more her son than Gwydion. She had mothered Uwain. Well, there was nothing to be done about it now. Morgaine went to the kitchen and heard the cook complain that all the bacon was gone and the storerooms were near enough empty to make it hard to feed all these homecomers. Well, we must send Avaloch to hunt today, said Morgaine, and stopped Meline on the stairs as she carried up her husband's morning drink of hot wine. Meline said, I saw you talking with Avaloch. What did he have to say to you? She frowned a little, and Morgaine, reading her thoughts as it was easy to do with a woman as stupid as Meline, realised that her daughter-in-law feared and resented her, thought it unfair that Morgaine should still be slim-bodied and hard when she, Meline, was heavy and worn with childbearing, that Morgaine should have glossy, dark hair when Meline herself, busied with babies, never had time to comb and plait her own and make it shine. Morgaine said truthfully, but also with a wish to spare her daughter-in-law's feelings. We spoke of Acalon and of Uwain, but the storerooms are nearly empty and Avaloch must go hunting for boar. And then what she must do flashed full-blown into her head, and for a moment she stood frozen, hearing Ninian say in mind and memory, Acalon must succeed his father, and her own voice replying, Meline was staring at her, waiting for her to finish what she was saying, and Morgaine quickly collected herself. Tell him that he must go out after boar. Today, if he can, tomorrow at the latest, or we shall be eating the last of the flour too soon. Certainly I will tell him, mother, said Meline. He will be glad to have an excuse to be away. And through Meline's complaining voice... Morgaine knew that the younger woman was relieved that it had been nothing worse. Poor woman, married to that pig. She remembered, troubled, exactly what Avaloch had said. On the day I am made king in this land, there will be no more grace extended to those who have lived on because my father cannot forget that once he wore the serpents. This, then, was her task to make certain that Acalon should succeed his father. If I had half an hour to tell Acalon all, he would go with Avaloch hunting, and I doubt not that would solve all. And she thought, with cold calculation, 
Shall I keep my hands clean of this and leave it to Acalon? Eurion's was old, but he might live another year or another five years. Now that Avaloch knew all, he would work with Father Eyn to undermine any influence Acalon and Morgaine might have, and all that she had done would be undone again. If Acalon wants this kingdom, perhaps it is he who should make certain of it. If Avaloch dies of poison, it is I who will die for a sorceress. Yet if she left it to Acalon, then would it be all too much like that old ballad, the one which began, Two brothers went a hunting. Shall I tell Acalon and let him act in his rage? Troubled, still not certain what she would do, she went up to find Acalon in his father's room, and as she came in, she heard him say, Today Avaloch goes to hunt boar. The storeroom is near too empty. And I will ride with him. It is all too long since I have hunted in my own hills. No, Morgaine said sharply. Stay with your father today. He will need you. And Avaloch has all his huntsmen to help him. She thought, somehow I must tell him what I mean to do. And then she stopped herself. If he knew what she planned, though she wasn't yet sure herself what form her necessity would take, he would never accede to it, except perhaps in his first anger at hearing what Avaloch had said to her. And if he did, she thought, though I thought I knew him better than that, still my own hunger for his body might have deceived me, and he may be less honourable than I think him. If he were such a one as would consent to be party to this, then he would be kinslayer, and under that curse, and not such a one as I could trust for what lies before us. Avaloch is kin to me by marriage alone. There is no blood tie to dishonour. Only if I had borne Urien's a son would there be blood guilt on me. Now she was glad she had given Urien's no son. Acalon said, Let Uwain stay with father. If his cheek wound is being poulticed still, it is he that should stay indoors and keep to the fireside. How can I make him understand? His hands must be clean. He must be here when the news comes. What can I say to him to make him understand that this is important? Perhaps the most important thing I shall ever ask of him. Urgency and the impossibility of voicing her inner thoughts made her voice sharp. Will you do as I ask you without argument, Acalon? If I am to tend Uwain's wound too, I shall have no leisure to tend your father as well, and he has been left to serving folk all too often of late. And your father, if the goddess is with me, shall have more need of you at his side than ever before this day is ended. She slurred her words, hoping Urians wouldn't understand what she was saying. As your mother, I ask it, she said. But what she was saying to Acalon with all the force of her thoughts was, From the mother I command it. Obey me, she said. And, turning a little away from Urian so that Acalon alone could see, she touched the faded blue crescent on her forehead. Acalon looked at her, puzzled, questioning, but she turned away, shaking her head slightly, hoping that at least he would understand why she couldn't speak more freely. He said, frowning, Certainly, if you wish it so much. It is no hardship to stay with my father. Morgaine saw Avalok ride out at mid-morning with four huntsmen, and while Maylene was in the lower hall, she slipped into their bedchamber searching through the untidy room and through the discarded baby clothes and still unwatched napkins of the youngest. At last she found a small bronze arm ring she had seen Avaloch wear. There were some gold things too in Meline's chest, but she didn't dare to take anything of value which might be missed when Meline's servant came to sort out the room. As it was, the serving woman found her there and asked, "'What did you want, lady?' Morgaine feigned anger. I will not live in a house that is kept like a pig's byre. Look at all these unwashed napkins. They stink of baby shit. 
Take them down now and give them to the washwoman, and then sweep and air this room. Must I put on a clout and do all the sweeping myself? No, madam, said the servant, cringing, and took the fouled cloths that Morgane heaped in her arms. Morgane tucked the bronze ring inside her bodice and went down to have the cook heat water for Uwain's wound. That must be done first. And somehow she must order things in this house so that she would be idle and alone this afternoon. She sent for the best surgeon to bring his tools, and made Uwain sit down and open his mouth so that she could help to find the broken root of his tooth. He endured the probing and pulling stoically, though the tooth broke off in his jaw and again had to be dug for. Fortunately, it was numb and swollen. And finally, when all the tooth was out, she dropped some of her strongest numbing medicine into the wound and poulticed the sore, swollen cheek again. Finally, it was done, and Uwain sent to bed with a strong dram of liquor inside him. He protested, arguing that he had ridden and even fought when he was in worse case than this but she firmly ordered him to go to his bed and let her medicines take their full effect. So Wayne, too, was safely out of the way and beyond suspicion. And since she had sent the servants to do washing, there were none of these either, so that Maylene began to complain, If we are to have new gowns for Pentecost, and if Avalok is to have his cloak finished, you do not like to spin, mother, but I must weave at Avalok's cloak. And all the women are heating kettles of water for the washing and getting out their beating paddles. Oh dear, I had forgotten that, said Morgane. Well, there is no help for it. I must spin then. Unless you would have me do the weaving. Better, she thought, even than the arm ring, a cloak made to his measure by his wife. Would you do that then, mother? But you have the king's new cloak set up on the other loom. Urien's doesn't need it so much as Avaloch, Morgane said. I will weave at Avaloch's cloak. And when I am done, she thought, a shudder running through her heart, he will never need a cloak any more. Then I will spin, said Meline, and I will be grateful to you, mother. You weave better than I. She came and pressed her cheek to her mother-in-law's. You are always kind to me, Lady Morgan. But you do not know what I shall be weaving today, child. Maylene sat down and picked up the distaff. She paused for a moment, pressing her hands to her back. Are you not well, daughter-in-law? Maylene said, It is nothing. My courses are four days late. I'm afraid I've gotten with child again, and I had hoped I could nurse the baby another year. She sighed. Avaloch has women enough in the village, but I think he never loses hope I will give him another son to take Con's place. He doesn't care anything for the girls. He didn't even weep when Mava died last year, just before I was brought to bed with the baby. And when she was another girl, he was really angry with me, Morgane. If you truly know any charms, could you give me a charm so that I would bear a son next time I'm brought to bed? Morgane smiled, putting the shuttle to the threads. She said, Father Ian will not like it if you ask me for charms. He would tell you to pray to the Virgin Mother for a son. Well... Her son was a miracle, and I am beginning to think that if I ever have another son, it would be another miracle, said Maylene. But perhaps it is only this dismal, chilly weather. I will make you some tea for that, said Morgane. If you are truly with child, I swear it will not disturb you. But if it is only delay from a chill, it will bring on your courses. Is this one of your magical spells from Avalon, mother? Morgane shook her head. It's her blore no more, she said, and went to the kitchen and made up the brew over the fire. She brought it to Maylene and said, Drink it as hot as you can, and wrap up in your shawl while you spin. Try to keep warm. 
Maylene drank up the brew, emptying the little pottery cup, and grimaced at the taste. Oh, foul! Morgan said, smiling, "I should have put honey in it, as I do with the brews I make for the children when they have fever." Maylene sighed, taking up the spindle and distaff again. She said, "Gwyneth is old enough to spin. I could spin when I was five years old. So could I," said Morgan. "But I beg you, defer the lesson another day, for if I am to weave in here, I do not want noise and confusion." Well then, I will tell the nurse to keep all the children out in the gallery," said Maylene, and Morgan dismissed her from her mind, beginning to run the shuttle slowly through the cloth, and making sure of the pattern. It was a pattern of green and brown checkered cloth, not very demanding for a good weaver. So long as she counted the threads automatically, she need not keep her mind on it very long. Spinning would have been better, but she had made her distaste for spinning so well known that if she volunteered to spin this day, it would be remembered. The shuttle slid through the cloth, green, brown, green, brown, picking up the other shuttle every tenth row, changing the colour. She had taught Maylene to dye this green colour, which she had learned in Avalon, green of the new leaves coming into the spring. Brown of the earth and of the fallen leaves where the boar rooted in the forest for acorns. Shuttle sliding through the cloth, the comb to tighten each row of threads, her hands moving automatically in and out and across. Slide down the bar, pick up the shuttle from the other side. Would that Avalok's horse would slip and fall, and he would break his neck and save me from what I must do. She felt cold and shivered, and willed herself to ignore it, concentrating on the shuttle sliding in and out of the threads, in and out, letting images rise and go at will, seeing Acolon in Urien's chamber playing with his father at draughts, Uwain asleep, tossing and turning with the pain in his cheek wound, even through his slumber, but now it would heal cleanly. Would that a wild boar would fight back, and Avalok's huntsman be too slow to come to his aid. I said to Ninian that I would not kill. Never name that well from which you will not drink. An image rose in her mind of the holy well of Avalon, the water rising from the spring, flooding into the fountain. The shuttle flickered in and out, green and brown, green and brown. Like the sunlight falling through the green leaves onto the brown earth, where the spring tides rising within the forest ran with life, sap running in the brown wood, the shuttle flashing now, faster and faster, the world beginning to blur before her eyes. Goddess, where you run in the forest with the running life of the deer, all men are in your hands, and all the beasts. Years ago, she had been the virgin huntress, blessing the horned one and sending him forth to run with the deer and to conquer or die as the goddess might decree. He had come back to her. Now she was no longer that virgin, holding all the power of the huntress. As the mother, with all the power of fertility, she had woven spells to bring Lancelot to Elaine's bed. But motherhood, for her, had ended in the blood of Gwydion's birth. Now she sat here with her shuttle in her hand and wove death, like the shadow of the old death crone. All men are in your hands to live or die, mother. The shuttle flickered, flashed in and out of her sight, green, brown, green like leaves and forest intertwined. Where they ran, the beasts. The wild boar, snuffling and grunting and rooting with his long tusks. The sow with the piglets bounding behind her, in and out of a copse. The shuttle raced in her hands, and she saw nothing, only the snorting snuffle of the swine in the forest. Keridwen, goddess, mother, death crone, great raven, lady of death and life, 
great sow eater of your young. I call you, I summon you. If this is truly what you have decreed, it is for you to accomplish it. Time slid and shifted around her. She lay in the glade with the sun burning her back while she ran with the king's stag. She moved through the forest softly, snuffling. She sensed the life, the hunters trampling and shouting, Mother, great sow. Morgane knew in a random corner of her mind that her hands continued to move steadily, green and brown, brown and green. But beneath her lowered eyelids she saw nothing of the room or the threads, but only the new green springing beneath the trees, the mud and dead leaves brown from the winter, trampling. It was as if she rooted on all fours in the fragrant mud. Life of the mother there beneath the trees. Behind her the little gruntings and squealings of the piglets, tusks tearing up the ground for hidden roots and acorns, brown and green, green and brown. Like a shock to her nerves, as if it ripped through her body, she felt the sound of the trampling in the forest, the distant cries. Her body sat motionless before the loom, weaving brown threads and changing for green, shuttle after shuttle, only her fingers alive. But with the starting thrill of terror and rush of rage, she charged, letting the life of the swine rush through her. Goddess, let not the innocent suffer. The huntsmen are nothing to you. She could do nothing. She watched in dread, trembling, shuddering with the smell of blood, the smell of her mate's blood. Blood spilled from the great boar. But this was nothing to her. Like the king stag, he must die. When his time was come, then must his blood be shed on the earth. Behind her she heard the squeals of frenzied piglings, and suddenly the life of the great goddess rushed through her. Not knowing whether she was Morgane or the great sow, heard her own high frenzied grunting, as when in Avalon she had raised her hands and brought down on her the mists of the goddess, so she flung her head back, shivering, grunting, hearing the terror of her piglings, making short little rushes, flinging up her head, rushing in circles, green and brown under her eyes, an irrelevant shuttle in automatic fingers, unnoticed. Then, maddened by the alien smells, blood, iron, strangeness, the enemy rising on two legs, steel and blood and death, she felt herself charge, heard cries, felt the hot stab of metal and red blurring her eyes through the brown and green of the forest, felt her tusks tearing, felt hot blood burst forth and gush as the life went out of her in searing pain, and she fell and knew no more. And the shuttle went on, leaden, weaving brown and green and brown over the agony in her belly and the red bursting through her eyes and her pounding heart the screams still in her ears in the silent room, where there was no sound but the whisper of shuttle and warp and spindle and distaff. She swung silent in her trance, exhausted, slumped forward at the loom and lay there motionless. After a time she heard Maylene speak, but she neither moved nor answered. Oh, Gwyneth, Morag, mother, are you ill? Oh, heaven, she will weave, and always it brings these fits upon her. Owain, Akalon, come, mother has fallen at her loom. She felt the woman restlessly chafing her hands, calling her name, heard Akalon's voice, felt him lift and carry her. She did not, could not move or speak. She let them lay her on her bed, bring wine to revive her, felt it trickle down her neck, and wanted to say, I am all right, let be. But she heard herself make a frightened little grunting sound, and was still, agony ripping her, knowing that in death the great sow would release her, but first she must suffer the death throes. And even as she lay there, blind, tranced, agonized. She heard the hunting horn sound and knew that they were bringing Avaloch home, dead on his horse. 
slain by the sow which had attacked him within moments after he had killed the boar. And he in turn had slain the sow, death and blood and rebirth, and the flow of life in and out of the forest, like the winding in and out of the shuttle. It was hours later. She still couldn't move a muscle without griping, terrifying pain. Almost she welcomed it. I should not go wholly free of this death, but Acalon's hands are clean. She looked up into his eyes. He was bending over her with concern and dread, and they were alone for a moment. Are you able to speak now, my love? he whispered. What happened? She shook her head and couldn't speak, but his hands on her were tender, welcome. Do you know what I have done for you, dear love? He bent and kissed her. He would never know how close they had come to being exposed and defeated. I must go back to father, he said, gently, troubled. He weeps and says, if I had gone, my brother wouldn't have died. He will blame me always. His dark eyes rested on her, a shadow of disquiet in them. It was you who commanded me not to go, he said. Did you know this with your magic, beloved? She found a shred of voice through the soreness in her throat. It was the will of the goddess, she said, that Avaloch should not destroy what we have done here. She managed with great pain to move her finger, tracing out the line of the tattooed serpent on the hand that touched her face. His expression changed, grew suddenly fearful. Morgane, had you any part in this? Ah, I should have known how he would look at me if he knew. Can you ask? she whispered. I was weaving in the hall all this day in clear sight of Maylene and the servants and the children. It was her will and her doing, not mine. But you knew. You knew. Slowly, her eyes filling with tears, she nodded, and he bent and kissed her lips. Be it so. It was the will of the goddess, he said, and he went away. Chapter 3 there was a place in the woods where a rushing stream broadened out between rocks into a deep pool. Morgane sat there on a flat rock overlooking the water and made Acalon sit beside her. They would be unseen here, except by the little ancient folk, and they would never betray their queen. My dear, all these years we have worked together. Tell me, Acalon, what is it you think we are doing? Lady, I have been content to know you had a purpose, he said, and not to ask questions of you. If you had sought only for a lover, he raised his eyes to her and reached for her hands. There would have been others than I for that, better suited to such games. I love you well, Morgane, and I have been glad and honoured that you turned to me, even for companionship and the touch of tenderness. But it wasn't that which called me to you, priest to priestess. He hesitated, and sat stirring the sand at his feet with a booted foot. Finally, he said, It has come to me, too, that there was more of a purpose in this than the wish of a priestess to restore the rights in this country, or your need to draw down upon us the moon tides. Glad I have been to aid you in this, and share the worship with you, lady. Lady of this land you have been indeed, especially to the ancient folk who see in you the face of the goddess. For a time, I thought it was only that we had been called to restore the old worship here. But now it comes to me, I know not why, he touched the serpents which twined about his wrists, that by these I am bound to this land to suffer and perhaps to die if need be. I have used him, Morgane thought, 
as ruthlessly as ever Vivian did me. He said, I know it well. Not once in a hundred years now is that old sacrifice exacted. Yet when these... Again he touched with a brown fingertip the serpents encircling his wrist. Were set here. It came to me that perhaps I should indeed be the one called by the lady for that ancient sacrifice. In the years between I had come to think of this as no more than a green boy's fancy. But if I am to die... And his voice faded like the ripples in the dying pool. It was very still. They could hear some insect making a small dry noise in the grass. Morgaine spoke no word, though she could feel his fear. He must pass the barriers of fear unaided, even as had she, or Arthur, or the Merlin, or any other facing that last testing. And if he was to face the final test, he must go to it consenting. At last he asked, Is it exacted of me then, lady, that I must die? I had thought, if blood sacrifice is demanded, then when Avaloch fell prey to her, and she saw the muscles in his face move, he tightened his jaw and swallowed hard. Still she said nothing, though her heart ached in pity. For some reason she heard Vivian's voice in her mind. A time will come when you will hate me as much as you love me now and felt again the surge of love and pain. Still she hardened her heart. Acalon was older than Arthur had been when he faced his king-making. And while Avaloch had indeed been blood sacrifice, spilled to the goddess, still another's blood could not redeem any other, nor could Avaloch's death free his brother of the obligation to face his own. At last his breath went out in a harsh sigh. So be it. I have faced death in battle often enough. I swore unto her, even to death, and I shall not be forsworn. Tell me her will, lady. Then at last she stretched out her hand and clasped his. I do not think it is death that will be demanded of you. And certainly not the altar of sacrifice. Still, testing is needed, and death lies always near to the doors of such testing. Would it reassure you to know that I too have faced death this way? Yet I am here at your side. Tell me, are you sworn, man to man, to Arthur? I am not one of his companions, Acolon said. Owain, you have seen sworn to him, but not I, though I have fought willingly enough among his men. Morgaine was glad, though she knew that she would even have used the oath of a companion against Arthur now. Listen to me, my dear, she said. Arthur has twice betrayed Avalon, and only from Avalon can a king reign over all this land. I have sought again and again to call to Arthur's mind that oath he gave, but he will not hear me, and he holds still in his pride the holy sword Excalibur, the sword of the sacred regalia, and with it the magical scabbard I fashioned for him. She saw his face turn pale. You mean it truly, that you will bring Arthur down? Not so, not unless he refuses still to bring his oath to completion, Morgaine said. I shall give him still every opportunity to become what he has sworn to be. And Arthur's son is not yet ripe to the challenge. You are no boy, Acalon, and you are trained to kingcraft, not druidcraft, in spite of these. And she laid a slender fingertip on the serpents encircling his wrist. Say then... Acalon of Wales, if all other shifts fail, will you be champion of Avalon and challenge the betrayer for that sword he holds by betrayal? Acalon drew a long breath. To challenge Arthur? Fitly did you ask, Morgaine, if I am ready to die, 
he said. And you speak to me in riddles. I knew not that Arthur had a son. His son is son to Avalon and to the spring fires, said Morgan. She thought she had long outgrown shame for this. I am priestess. I need make no accounting to any man for what I must do. But she couldn't force herself to meet Acalon's eyes. Listen, and I will tell you all. He sat silent as she told him of the kingmaking on Dragon Island and what had befallen after. But when she told how she had fled from Avalon and of Gwydion's birth, he put out his hand and encircled her small fingers in his own. He has passed his own testing, said Morgan, but he is young and untried. None thought that Arthur would betray his oath. Arthur was young too, but he came to his king-making when Uther was old and dying, and men were seeking everywhere for a king of the Avalon line. Now Arthur's star is high and his renown great, and even with all the powers of Avalon at his back, Gwydion could never challenge Arthur for his throne. How is it that you think I can challenge Arthur and get the sword Excalibur from him and not be slain at once by his men, said Acalon. There is nowhere in this world that I can challenge him where he goes not so guarded. That is true, Morgan said, but you needn't challenge him in this world. There are other realms which are not within this world at all, and within one of these realms you may get from him the sword Excalibur to which he has forfeited all shadow of right, and the magical scabbard which protects him from all harm. Once disarmed, he is no more than any other man. I have seen his companions, Lancelot, Gawain, Gareth, disarm him in play in their mock battles. Without his sword, Arthur is easy prey. He is not the greatest of warriors, nor with that sword and scabbard did he ever need to be. And Arthur, once dead. She had to stop and steady her voice, knowing she incurred the curse of Kinslayer, that same curse she had hesitated to bring on Acalon when Avaloch died. Arthur, once dead, she repeated firmly at last. I am nearest his throne and his sister. I shall rule as Lady of Avalon and you as my consort and duke of war. True, in your time you too will be challenged and brought down as King Stag. But before that day comes, you shall have your day as king at my side. Acalon sighed. I never thought to be king. But if you bid me, lady, I must do her will, and yours. Yet to challenge Arthur for his sword. I did not mean that you shall do so without all the help I can give. For what else have I been schooled all these weary years in magic? And for what have I made you my priest? And there is one greater than I who shall help us both to your testing. Speak you of those magical realms? Acalon asked her almost in a whisper. I do not understand you. This ends Disc 1. The Prisoner in the Oak, Disc 2. That surprises me not. I know not myself what I mean to do, nor what I say, Morgan thought. But she recognized the strange dimness rising in her mind, clouding thoughts as that state in which powerful magic was made. I must trust to the goddess now, and let her lead me. Not I alone, but he who stands at my side, who will take up the sword from Arthur's hand. Trust me, and obey. She rose, moving through the woods on silent feet, looking for... What was she looking for? She asked and heard her voice distant and strange. Does Hazelwood grow within this forest, Acalon? He nodded, and she followed him to the grove of trees, at this season just bursting into leaf and flower. 
The wild pigs who roamed here had eaten the last of the nuts. Fragments of nut hulls lay scattered on the thick leaf mould of the forest floors. Yet new shoots were springing too, toward the light, where new trees would rise, so that the life of the forest would never die. Flower and fruits and seed, and all things return and grow and come to light, and at the last give up their bodies into the keeping of the lady again. But she who works silently and alone at the heart of nature cannot work her magic without the strength of him who runs with the deer and with the summer sun draws forth the richness of her womb. Beneath the hazel tree she looked across at Acalon, and while part of her mind was aware that this man was her lover, her chosen priest, she knew that now he had consented to a testing beyond what she alone could confer. Before ever the Romans had come to these hills seeking for tin and lead, the hazel grove had been a sacred place. At the edge of the grove there was a pool standing beneath three of the sacred trees, hazel and willow and alder, a magic older than the magic of the oak. The surface of the pool was somewhat obscured with dry sticks and leaves, but the water was clear and dark, brown with the clear brown of the forest, and she saw her own face reflected as she bent and dipped up the water in her hand, touching it to brow and lips. Before her eyes, the reflected face shifted and changed, and she saw the strange deep eyes of the woman from that older world than this and something in her crawled in terror at what she saw in those eyes. The world had shifted subtly round them. She had believed this strange, ancient land lay at the borders of Avalon, not here in the remote fastnesses of North Wales. Yet, a voice said silently in her mind, I am everywhere, and where the hazel reflects in the sacred pool, there am I. She heard Acalon draw in a breath of wonder and awe, and turned to see that the lady of the fairy kingdom was with them, standing straight and silent in her shimmering garment, the crown of bare wicker withies above her brow. Was it she who spoke, or the lady? There is other testing than the running of the deer. And suddenly it was as if a horn rang out far and eerie through the hazel grove. Or was it the hazel grove? And then the leaves lifted and stirred, and there was the rushing of sudden winds making the branches creak and sway, and a chill of fear rippled through Morgane's body and blood. He is coming. Slowly, reluctant, she turned and saw that they weren't alone in the grove. There, at the edge between the worlds, he was standing. Never did she ask Acalon what it was that he saw. She saw only the shadow of the antler crown, the bright leaves of gold and crimson, where they stood in a wood gilded with the first buds of spring, the dark eyes. Once she had lain with him on a forest floor like this, but he hadn't come for her this time and she knew it. Now she, and even the lady, must step aside. His step, light on the leaves, still somehow raised the wind that kept thrusting floods of air through the grove so that her hair blew about on her forehead and she felt her cloak flapping with it. He was tall and dark, and he seemed at once to be clothed in the richest garments and in leaves and at the same time she would have taken oath that his flesh gleamed smooth and naked before them. He gestured, raising one slender hand, and as if compelled, Acalon moved slowly forward, step by step. And at the same time it was Acalon that she could see crowned and robed with leaves and antlers, glimmering in the strange motionless light of fairy. Morgane felt herself buffeted, struck and battered by the wind. In the grove she knew were forms and faces she couldn't clearly see. This testing wasn't for her, but for the man at her side. It seemed that there were cries and horn calls. Were there riders within the air, 
or did the beating of their hooves drum on the forest floor with this great noise that drowned out thought? She knew Acalon was no longer at her side. She stood clasping the bark of the hazel tree, her face hidden. She didn't know. She would never know. It was not for her to know what form Acalon's kingmaking should take. That wasn't in her power to give or to know. She had invoked the powers of the Horned One through the Lady, and he had gone where she couldn't follow. She never knew how long she stood there, clutching at the hazel bark, her brow pressed painfully against the bowl of the tree. And then the wind died, and Acheron was with her. They stood together, alone in the hazel grove, hearing only the beat of thunder from a dark and cloudless sky where the sun's rim glared like hot metal behind the moon's dark eclipse disk, and the stars burned against the unfallen night. Acheron's arm was around her. He whispered, What is it? What is it? It is the eclipse. Her voice was steadier than she could have believed. She felt her heart beat quieting to normal at the touch of his arms, warm and alive, holding her. The ground was quite steady under her feet again, the solid earth of the hazel grove, and when she looked down into the pool she saw fragments of broken boughs from the uncanny wind that had ravaged the grove. Somewhere a bird complained at the sudden dark, and at their feet a small pink piglet rooted in the dead leaf mould. Then the light began to steal so brightly that she saw the shadow passing away from the sun. She saw Acheron staring at the brightness and said sharply, Turn away your eyes. You can be blinded now the darkness is gone. He swallowed and lowered his face to hers. His hair was awry with a wind that wasn't of this world, and clinging to his hair was a crimson leaf, which made Morgane shiver as they stood beneath the just unfolding buds of the hazel. He said in a whisper, He is gone. And she, or was it you, Morgane? Did it happen? Was any of it real? Morgane, looking into his dazzled face, saw something in his eyes, something that had never been there before, the touch of the non-human. She reached out and plucked the crimson leaf from his hair, holding it out to him. You, who bear the serpents, need you question. Ah! She saw the shudder run right through him, he struck the crimson leaf from her hand with a savage gesture, letting it fall silent to the forest floor, and said, with a gasp, It seemed that I rode high above the world, and saw such things as come never to mortal man. And then he reached for her with blind urgency, tearing at her dress and pulling her down to the ground. She let him do as he would, and lay stunned on the damp ground as he thrust blindly into her, driven by a force he hardly understood. It seemed to her, as she lay silent beneath that driving strength, that his face was shadowed again with antlers, or with crimson leaves. She had no part in this. She was only the passive earth beneath rain and wind, thunder and lightning bolt and it was as if the lightning struck through her into the earth beneath. Then the darkness receded, and the strange stars shining forth by day were all gone, and Acheron's hands, tender and apologetic, were helping her to rise to arrange her disordered dress. He bent to kiss her, to stammer some half-explanation, some word of excuse. But she smiled and laid her hand across his lips. No, no, it is enough. The grove was silent again, and around them were only the normal sounds of the quiet day. She said calmly, We must go back, my love. We will be missed, and everyone will be shouting and crying out about the eclipse, as if it were some strange marvel of nature, and smiled faintly. She had seen something far stranger than an eclipse this day. 
Acalon's hand was cold and solid in hers. He whispered as they walked, I never knew that you... You look like her, Morgane. But I am she. However, Morgane didn't speak the words aloud. He was an initiate. He should have been better prepared, perhaps, for this testing. Yet he had faced it as he must, and he had been accepted by something beyond her own small powers. Then cold struck at her heart, and she turned to look at his smiling, beloved face. He had been accepted, but that didn't mean he would triumph. It meant only that he might attempt the final testing for which this was only the beginning. I felt not like this when a spring maiden I sent Arthur, whom I knew not to be Arthur, forth for his testing. Ah, goddess, how young I was then, how young we both were, mercifully young, for we knew not what we did. And now I am old enough to know what it is that I do. How shall I have courage to send him forth to face death? Chapter 4 On the eve of Pentecost, Arthur and his queen had bidden those guests with family ties to the throne to dine with them privately. Tomorrow would be the usual great banquet for all of Arthur's subject kings and his companions. But Guinevere, dressing herself carefully, felt that this would be the greater ordeal. She had long accepted the inevitable. Her husband and lord would, by his act tomorrow, make public and irrevocable what had long been known. Tomorrow Galahad would be made knight and companion of the round table. Oh, she had known it for years, yes. But then Galahad had been only a fair-haired little boy growing up somewhere in King Pellinore's lands. When she had thought of it, she'd even been pleased. Lancelot's son, by her own cousin Elaine now dead in childbed, was reasonable heir for the king. But now she felt him a living reproach to an ageing queen whose life had been without fruit. "'You are distressed,' said Arthur, watching her face as she set the coronet about her hair. "'I'm sorry, Guinevere. I thought it would be the way to get to know the lad, as I must if he is to have my throne. Shall I tell him that you are ill? You need not appear. You can meet him at some other time.' Guinevere tightened her mouth. "'As well now as later?' He took her hand. "'I do not see Lancelot very often any more. It will be good to speak with him again.' Her mouth moved in something she knew wasn't the smile she had intended. "'I wonder you will have it so. Do you not hate him?' Arthur smiled uneasily. We were all so much younger then. It seems as if it was all in another world, and Lance no more than my dearest and oldest friend, almost my brother, as much as Kai. Kai is your brother too, said Guinevere, and his son Arthur is one of your most loyal knights. It seems to me that he would make a better heir than Galahad. Young Arthur is a good man and a trusty companion, but Kai's blood isn't royal. God knows, in all these years, I've wished often enough that Ectorius had in truth been my own father. But he was not, and there's an end of it, Gwen. After a moment, hesitant, he had never spoken of this, not since that other dreadful Pentecost, he said, I have heard that the other lad, Morgane's son, is in Avalon. Guinevere put out a hand as if to avoid a blow. No. I will arrange it so that you need never meet him, he said, not looking at her. But royal blood is royal blood, and something must be done for him. He cannot have my throne. The priests wouldn't have it. Oh, said Guinevere. And if the priests would have it, I suppose you would proclaim Morgane's son your heir. There will be those who wonder that he is not, said Arthur. Would you have me try to explain it to them? Then you should keep him far from the court, said Guinevere, thinking, 
I didn't know my voice was so harsh when I was angry. What place at this court has one who has been reared in Avalon as a druid? He said dryly, "The Merlin of Britain is one of my counselors and has always been so, Gwen. Those who look to Avalon are always my subjects too. It is written, 'Other sheep have I which are not of this fold.'" A blasphemous jest, Guinevere observed, making her voice gentler. And hardly suitable for the eve of Pentecost. Arthur said, "Before Pentecost, there was always Midsummer, my love. At least now there are no Midsummer fires lighted, not even on Dragon Island, or so far as I know, anywhere within three days' ride of Camelot, except on Avalon itself." The priests have set wards on Glastonbury Island, I'm sure," said Guinevere. So that there shall be no coming and going from that land. It would be a sad day if it should be lost for ever, Arthur said, as it is sad for the peasant folk to lose their own festivals. Town folk perhaps have no need of the old rites. Oh yes, I know there is only one name under heaven by which we may be saved, but perhaps those who live in such close kinship with the earth need something more than salvation. Guinevere started to speak, then held her peace. Kevin was no more than a misshapen old cripple and a druid, and the day of the druids now seemed to her as far away as the time of the Romans. And even Kevin was less known at court as the Merlin of Britain than as a superb harper. The priests didn't hold him in reverence as a good and kindly man, as once with Taliesin. Kevin's tongue was quick and ungentle in debate. Yet Kevin's knowledge of all the old ways and the common law was greater even than Arthur's, and Arthur had come into the way of turning to him when it was a question of old law and custom which couldn't be set aside. If this were not so strictly a family party, I would command that the Merlin perform for us tonight. Arthur smiled and said. I can send to ask of him if you will, but such music as his is not to be commanded, even by a king. I can bid him dine at our table and beg him to honour us with a song. She smiled back and said, "So the king begs of a subject rather than the other way around. There must be balance in all things," he said. "It is one of the things I have learned in my rule." In some matters, a king cannot command, but must sue. Perhaps that was why the Caesars fell, because they fell into what my tutor used to call hubris, thinking they could command outside the legitimate sphere of a king. Well, my lady, our guests are waiting. Are you sufficiently beautiful? She said, "You're making fun of me again. You know how old I am." You are scarcely older than I," said Arthur, "and my chamberlain tells me I am a handsome man still. Oh, but that is different. Men do not age as women do. She looked at his face, which was only faintly lined with the years. A man in the prime of his life. He said, taking her hand. It would little beseem me to have a maiden at my side for my queen. You are suited to me. They moved toward the door. The chamberlain approached and spoke in a low voice. And Arthur turned to Guinevere. There will be other guests at our table. Gawain sent word that his mother has come, and so we cannot but invite Lamarack as well, since he is her consort and travelling companion," said Arthur. "I haven't seen more Gauls in many years, God knows, but she is my kinswoman too." And King Urians and Morgain with their sons, then it will be a family party indeed. Yes, with Gareth and Gawain, Gaheris is in Cornwall, and Agravain couldn't leave Lothian," said Arthur. And Guinevere felt pricked with an old grievance. A lot of Lothian had so many sons. Well, my dear, our guests are assembled in the little hall. Shall we go down to them? The great hall of the Round Table was Arthur's domain, 
a man's place where warriors and kings met. But the little hall, with the hanging she had ordered from Gaul, and the trestle tables and benches, that was where Guinevere felt most a queen. She was growing daily more short-sighted. At first, though there was still plenty of light, she saw only stripes of colour from the ladies' gowns and the brilliant indoor robes worn by the men. That huge figure there, well over six feet with a great shock of sandy hair, that was Gawain. He came to bow before the king, and then, rising, to embrace his cousin in a great bear hug. Gareth followed him more modestly, and Kai came to clap Gareth on the shoulder to call him handsome in the old way, and to ask after his brood of children, still too young to come to court. The Lady Leonor's was, he said, still abed after their latest, and had stayed in their castle northward by the Roman War. Was that eight now, or nine? Guinevere had seen the Lady Leonor's only twice, because always, according to Gareth, she was breeding or lying in or still suckling her latest. Gareth was no longer pretty-faced, but good-looking as ever, and as Arthur and Gawain and Gareth grew older, the resemblance between them all grew ever stronger. Now Gareth was being embraced by a slender man with dark curling hair streaked with grey, and Guinevere bit her lip. Lancelot changed not at all with the years, save to grow yet more handsome. Urians had none of that magical immunity to time. He looked at last really old, though he was still upright and strong. His hair was all white, and she heard him explaining to Arthur that he had but recently recovered from the lung fever, and had that spring buried his oldest son, savaged by a wild pig. Arthur said, So you'll be king of North Wales one day, Sir Acalon. Well... So it shall be. God giveth and taketh, so it says in holy writ. Urians would have bent to kiss Guinevere's hand, but she leaned instead to kiss the old man on the cheek. He was foppishly dressed in green, with a handsome cloak of green and brown. Our queen grows ever younger, he said, smiling with good humour. One would think you had dwelled in the fairy country, kinswoman. Guinevere laughed. Perhaps I should paint lines in my face then, lest the bishops and priests think I have learned spells unseemly for a Christian woman. But such jesting is uncanny on the eve of a holy day. Well, Morgane, for once she could greet her sister-in-law with a jest, you seem younger than I, and I know you are older. What is your magic? No magic, said Morgane in her rich low voice. It is only that there is so little to occupy my mind, in that country at the end of the world, that it seems to me that time doesn't pass there, and so, perhaps, that is why I grow no older. Now she looked closer, Guinevere could indeed see the small traces of time in Morgane's face. Her skin was still smooth and unmarred, but there were tiny creases around her eyes, and the eyelids drooped a little. The hand she gave Guinevere was thin and bony, so that her rings hung loose. Guinevere thought, Morgane is at least five years older than I. And suddenly it seemed to her that they weren't women in middle life, but those two young girls who had met in Avalon. Lancelot had come first to greet Morgane. Guinevere wouldn't have believed that she could still be torn with this raging passion of jealousy. Now Elaine is gone, and Morgane's husband is so old he surely cannot look to see another Christmas. She heard Lancelot speak some laughing compliment, heard Morgane's low, sweet laughter. But she doesn't look at Lancelot like a lover. Her eyes turn to Prince Acalon. He is a goodly man, too. Well, her husband is more than twice her age and Guinevere felt a stab of self-righteous disapproval. "'We should go to table,' she said, beckoning to Kai. "'Galahad must go at midnight to watch by his arms, 
and perhaps, like many young men, he would like to rest a little beforehand so he will not be sleepy. I shall not be sleepy, lady, the young man said, and Guinevere felt again the pain. She would so gladly have had this fair young man as her son. He was tall now, broad shouldered, and big as Lancelot had never been. His face seemed to shine with scrubbing and with a calm happiness. This is all so new to me. Camelot is such a beautiful city. I can hardly believe it is real. And I rode here with my father. All my life, my mother spoke of him as if he were a king or a saint quite beyond mortal men. Morgane said, Oh, Lancelot is mortal enough, Galahad, and if you come to know him well enough, you will know it too. Galahad bowed politely to Morgane. He said, I remember you. You came and took Nimue from us. And my mother wept. Is my sister well, lady? I haven't seen her for some years, Morgane said. But if it was not well with her, I would have heard. I remember only that I was angry with you for telling me that I was wrong about everything. You seemed very certain, and my mother... No doubt your mother told you I am an evil sorceress. She smiled. Smug as a cat, Guinevere thought, at the transparent blush that covered Galahad's face. Well, Galahad, you are not the first to think me so. She smiled to Acalon, too, who returned the smile so openly that Guinevere was shocked. Galahad said bluntly, And are you a sorceress then, lady? Well said Morgane with that cat-claw smile again. No doubt your mother had reason to think me so. Since now she is gone, I may tell you all. Lancelot, did Elaine never tell you how she begged and besought me for a charm that would turn your eyes on her? Lancelot turned to Morgane, and it seemed to Guinevere that his face was stricken, tight with pain. Why make jests about days that are long gone, kinswoman? Oh, but I jest not, said Morgane, and for a moment she raised her eyes to meet Guinevere's. I thought it time you stopped breaking hearts all through the kingdoms of Britain and Gaul. So I made that marriage, and I do not regret it, for now you have a fine son who is heir to my brother's kingdom. If I hadn't meddled, you would have remained unwed, and still be breaking all our hearts. Would he not, Gwen? She added audaciously. I knew it, but I didn't know Morgane would confess it so openly. But Guinevere took a queen's privilege to change the subject. How does my namesake, your little Guinevere? She is pledged in marriage to Lionel's son, Lancelot said, and will be queen of less Britain one day. The priest said the kinship was over close, but a dispensation could be had. I paid a great fee to the church for that to be set aside, and Lionel paid one too. The girl is but nine, and the wedding will not be for six years. And your elder daughter? asked Arthur. Sire, she is in a nunnery, Lancelot said. Is that what Elaine told you? Morgane asked. And again there was the flash of malice in her eyes. She is in your own mother's place in Avalon, Lancelot. Did you not know? He said peacefully, It is all one. The priestesses of the House of Maidens are much like to the nuns of Holy Church, living lives of chastity and prayer, and serving God in their own way. He turned quickly to Queen Morgals, who was approaching them. Well, aunt, I cannot say you are unchanged by time. "'but the years have treated you kindly indeed. "'She looks so like Igraine. "'I have heard only the jests and have laughed at her, "'but now I can well believe that young Lamorak "'is beglamoured by her for love and not ambition. "'Morgors was a big woman and tall. "'Her hair was still rich and red, "'flowing in loose braids over her green gown.' 
a vast expanse of brocaded silk embroidered with pearls and golden threads. A narrow coronet set with shining topaz twinkled in her hair. Guinevere held out her arms and embraced her kinswoman, saying, "You look much like Igrain, Queen Morgors. I loved her well, and still I think often of her." When I was younger, that statement would have had me frantic with jealousy, Guinevere. I was maddened that my sister Igraine was more beautiful than I, and had so many kings and lords at her feet. Now I remember only that she was beautiful and kind, and I'm glad to know I resemble her still. She turned to embrace Morgaine, and Guinevere saw that Morgaine was lost in the bigger woman's embrace, that Morgaus towered over her. Why did I ever fear Morgaine? She is just a little thing, after all, and the queen of an unregarded kingdom. Morgaine's dress was a simple dark wool, and she wore no ornament but a silver tork about her throat, and some kind of silver bracelet about her arms. Her hair, dark and rich as ever, was simply braided and wound around her head. Arthur had come up to embrace his sister and his aunt. Guinevere took Galahad's hand in hers. "You shall sit by me, kinsman." Ah,、oh, yes, this was a son I should have borne to Lancelot, or to Arthur. She said as they sat down. And now you have come to know your father. Have you discovered, as Morgan said, that he is no saint, but merely a very lovable man? Ah, but what else is a saint? Asked Galahad. His eyes shining, I cannot think of him as only a man, lady. He is surely more than that. He is the son of a king too, and I am sure that if they chose the best rather than the eldest son, he would reign in less Britain. I think that man is happy whose father is also his hero, he said. I have had some time to speak with Gawain. He despised his father and thought little of him. But no man has ever spoken of my father save with admiration. I hope then that you see him always as a hero untarnished," said Guinevere. She had placed Galahad between herself and Arthur as befitted the adopted heir to the kingdom. Arthur had chosen to seat Queen Morgaus next to him, with Gawain beyond, and next to him Uwain, who was Gawain's friend and protege. As Gareth had been Lancelot's when they were younger. At the table next to them were Morgaine and her husband and other guests. They were all kin, but she couldn't see their faces clearly. She craned her neck and squinted to see, reproving herself. Squinting would make her ugly, and rubbed at the tight wrinkle beneath her brows. She wondered suddenly, whereby her old fear of open spaces when she was a girl. Had simply come from being so short-sighted. Had she feared what the world was like only because she couldn't really see? She asked Arthur across Galahad, who was eating with the hearty appetite of a healthy boy still growing, "Did you bid Kevin dine with us?" "Aye, but he sent a message that he couldn't come. Since he could not be in Avalon, perhaps he keeps the holy day in his own fashion." I bid Bishop Patricius as well, but he keeps the vigil of Pentecost in the church. He will see you there at midnight, Galahad. I think that being made a king must be a little like being made a priest," said Galahad clearly. There was a lull in the conversation that made his young voice audible from one end of the table to another. They are both sworn to serve man and God and to do what is right. Gareth said, "I felt something like that, lad. God grant you see it always so. I have always wanted my companions to be men dedicated to the right," said Arthur. "I do not demand that they be godly men, Galahad, but I have hoped they would be good men." Lancelot said to Arthur, "Perhaps these youngsters may live in a world where it is easier to be good." And it seemed to Guinevere that he sounded sad. But you are good, father," said Galahad. 
all up and down this land, it is told that you are King Arthur's greatest knight. Lancelot chuckled, embarrassed. Aye, like that Saxon hero who tore the arm from the lake monster. My works and deeds have been made into song, because the true tale isn't exciting enough to tell by the fireside in winter. But you did slay a dragon, did you not? Galahad said. Oh, yes. And it was a fearful beast enough, I suppose. But your grandsire did as much as I in killing it, said Lancelot. Guinevere, my lady, we die never so well as at your table. Too well, said Arthur, cheerfully patting his middle. If feasts like this came often, I would be as fat as one of those beer-guzzling Saxon kings. And tomorrow is Pentecost, and another feast for even more folk. I do not know how my lady does it. Guinevere felt a small glow of pride. This feast is mine. That of tomorrow is Sir Kai's pride. For that one the beeves are already roasting in their pit. My lord Urians, you are eating no meat. Urians shook his head. A wing of one of those birds, perhaps? Since my son was slain, I have vowed never again to eat the flesh of swine. And your queen shares your vow, said Arthur. As always, Morgaine is all but fasting. No wonder you are so small and spare, my sister. It is no hardship for me not to eat swine's flesh. Is your voice sweet as ever, my sister? Since Kevin couldn't join us, perhaps you would sing or play. If you had told me you wished it, I wouldn't have eaten so well. I cannot sing now. Later, perhaps. Then you, Lancelot. Arthur said. Lancelot shrugged and gestured to a servant to bring the harp. Kevin will sing this tomorrow. I'm no match for him. I made the words from a Saxon poet. I said once I could live with the Saxons, but not with what they called music. Then, when I dwelt among them last year, I heard this song and wept when I heard it, and tried in my poor way to put it into our tongue. He left his seat to take the small harp. It is for you, my king, he said, for it speaks of what sorrow I knew when I dwelt far from court and from my lord. But the music is Saxon. I had thought before this that all their songs were of war and battle and fighting. He began to play a soft, sorrowful melody. His fingers were not as skillful as those of Kevin, but the sad song had a power of its own, which gradually quieted them. He sang in the husky voice of an untrained singer. What sorrow is like to the sorrow of one who is alone? Once I dwelt in the company of the king I loved well, and my arm was heavy with the weight of the rings he gave, and my heart weighed down with the gold of his love. The face of the king is like the sun to those who surround him. But now my heart is empty, and I wander alone throughout the world. The groves take on their blossoms, the trees and meadows grow fair. But the cuckoo, saddest of singers, cries forth the lonely sorrow of the exile. And now my heart goes wandering in search of what I shall never see more. All faces are alike to me if I cannot see the face of my king. And all countries are alike to me when I cannot see the fair fields and meadows of my home. So I shall arise and follow my heart in its wandering, for what is the fair meadow of home to me when I cannot see the face of my king? And the weight on my arm is but a band of gold when the heart is empty of the weight of love. And so... I shall go roaming over the fish's road and the road of the great whale and beyond the country of the wave with none to bear me company but the memory of those I loved and the songs I sang out of a full heart and the cuckoo's cry in memory. Guinevere bent her head to hide tears. Arthur's head was lowered, his eyes covered by his hand. 
Morgaine was staring straight ahead, and Guinevere could see the stripes of tears making wet streaks down her face. Arthur rose and came around the table. He put his arms round Lancelot and said in a voice that wasn't steady, "But you are again with your king and your friend Galahad." The old bitterness stabbed at Guinevere's heart. He sang of his king, not of his queen and his love. His love for me was never more than a part of his love for Arthur. She closed her eyes, unwilling to see them embrace. That was beautiful," said Morgaul softly. "Who would ever think that a Saxon brute could write music like that? It must have been Lancelot after all." Lancelot shook his head. The music is theirs, and the words only a poor echo of their own. A voice that was like an echo of Lancelot said gently. But there are poets and musicians among the Saxons as well as warriors, my lady. And Guinevere turned toward the voice. A young man in dark clothing, slender, dark-haired, a blur beyond her sight, but the voice, accented softly with the tones of the North Country, still sounded like Lancelot's, the very pitch and timbre of his. Arthur beckoned him forward. There sits one at my table. I do not know, and at a family party, that isn't right. Queen Morgaws. She stood up in her place. I had meant to present him to you before we went to table, but you were busy talking with old friends, my king. This is Morgaine's son, who was fostered at my court, Gwydion. The youth came forward and bowed. King Arthur, he said. In the warm voice, it was like an echo of Lancelot's. For a moment, a dizzy joy struck through Guinevere. This was Lancelot's son, surely, not Arthur's. And then she recalled that Morgaine's aunt, Vivian, was Lancelot's mother too. Arthur embraced the youth. He said in a voice too shaken to be audible, three yards distant. The son of my dearly beloved sister shall be received as a son at my own court, Gwydion. Come and sit beside me, lad. Guinevere looked at Morgaine. She had spots of crimson on her cheek, as bright as if they were painted, and she was worrying her lower lip between her small, sharp teeth. Had Morgaul's not prepared her then to see her son presented to his father? No, to the king. Guinevere reminded herself sharply, "There was no reason to think the boy had any idea who his father was. Though, if he had ever looked in a mirror, no doubt he would come to believe whatever anyone might say, that he was Lancelot's son. Not a boy, after all. He must be near enough to five and twenty. He was a man. Your cousin Galahad," Arthur said. And Galahad impulsively put out his hand. "You are closer kin to the king than I, cousin. You have a better right than I to be where I am now," he said with boyish spontaneity. "I wonder you don't hate me." Gwydion smiled and said, "How do you know I don't, cousin?" And for a moment, Guinevere was jolted until she saw the smile. Yes, he was Morgaine's son. He had the cat smile she could show sometimes. Galahad blinked, then decided the words were meant as a jest. Guinevere could follow Galahad's transparent thoughts. Is this my father's son? Is Gwydion my bastard brother by Queen Morgaine? He looked hurt too, like a puppy whose playful proffer of friendship has been rebuffed. No, cousin. Guinevere said, "What you are thinking isn't true." Guinevere thought, her breath catching in her throat, that he even had Lancelot's sudden, breathtaking smile that transformed a rather dark and sombre face into an overwhelming brilliance, as if a ray of sun had come out and transformed it. Galahad said defensively, "I wasn't. I didn't." 
No, said Gwydion kindly. You didn't say anything. But it is all too obvious what you were thinking, and what everyone in this room must be thinking. He raised his voice just a little, that voice so like Lancelot's, although overlaid with a soft North Country accent. In Avalon, cousin, we take our lineage from the line of the mother. I'm of the old royal line of Avalon. That is quite enough for me. It would be arrogance for any man to claim to be the father to the child of a high priestess of Avalon. But of course, like most men, I would like to know who fathered me. And what you thought has been said before, that I am the son of Lancelot. That likeness has been remarked upon before this, especially among the Saxons, where I spent three years learning to be a warrior, he added. Your reputation among them, Lord Lancelot, is still much remembered there. I couldn't count how many men said to me that it was no disgrace to be the bastard son of a man like you, sir. His low chuckle was like an eerie echo of the man he faced, and Lancelot looked uneasy too. But in the end I always had to tell them that what they thought wasn't true. Of all the men in this kingdom who could have fathered me, one I know is not my father, and so I must inform them that it is only a family likeness, no more. I am your cousin, Galahad, not your brother. He leaned lazily back in his chair. Will it embarrass you too much that everyone who sees us will think so? After all, we cannot go around telling everyone the truth. Galahad looked confused. I wouldn't have minded if you were truly my brother, Gwydion. But then I should have been your father's son, and perhaps the king's heir, too, Gwydion said, and smiled. And it struck Guinevere suddenly that he actually took pleasure in the discomfort of the people around the table, that he was Morgane's son, if only in that touch of malice. Morgane said in that low voice which carried so clearly without being loud. It wouldn't have been displeasing to me either if Lancelot had fathered you, Gwydion. No, I suppose not, lady, Gwydion said. Forgive me, Lady Morgane. Always I've called Queen Morgors my mother. Morgane laughed. If I seem an unlikely mother to you, Gwydion, you seem just as unlikely a son to me. I'm grateful for this family party, Guinevere, she said. I might have been confronted with my son tomorrow at the great feast without warning. Urien said, I think any woman would be proud of such a son. And as to your father, whoever he may have been, young Guidian, it is his own loss that he didn't claim you for his own. Oh, I don't think so, Guidian said. And Guinevere thought, watching the small flicker of his eyes toward Arthur, he may say for some reason that he doesn't know who is his father, but he is lying. Somehow that made her uncomfortable. Yet how much more uncomfortable it would be if he were to face Arthur and demand to know why he, the son, wasn't also the heir. Avalon, that accursed place... She wished it would sink into the sea like the lost land of East in the old tale and never be heard of again. But this is Galahad's special knight, Gwydion said, and I'm taking attention away from him. Are you to watch by your arms this night, cousin? Galahad nodded. It is the custom for Arthur's companions. I was the first, Gareth said, and it's a good custom. I suppose it is the nearest a layman can come to being a priest, to take vows that he will always serve his king and his land and his god with his arms. He laughed and said, What a fool of a boy I was. My Lord Arthur, have you ever forgiven me that I refused your offer to knight me with your own hands and instead asked that Lancelot might do so? Forgiven you, lad. I envied you, Arthur said, smiling. Do you think I didn't know Lancelot was the greatest warrior of us two? Kai spoke for the first time, 
his somber, scarred face twisting in a smile. I told the lad then that he was a good fighter and would make a good knight, but he was certainly no courtier. And so much the better, said Arthur heartily. God knows I had enough of those. He added, leaning forward, speaking directly to Galahad. Would you prefer that your father should knight you, Galahad? He has knighted enough of my companions. The boy bowed his head. Sir, it is for my king to say. But it seems to me that this knighthood comes from God, and it doesn't matter who bestows it. I, I do not mean that quite as it sounds, sir. I mean the vow is made to you, but mostly to God. Arthur nodded slowly. I know what you mean, my boy. It is much the same with a king. He vows to rule over his people, but the vow is given not to the people, but to God. Or, said Morgaine, to the goddess in her name, as token of the land the king shall rule. She looked directly at Arthur as she spoke, and he shifted his eyes, and Guinevere bit her lip. Morgaine, reminding Arthur again that his allegiance had been given to Avalon. Damn her! But that was past, and Arthur was a Christian king, under no authority but that of God. We will all be praying for you, Galahad, that you make a good knight, and that one day you will make a good king, said Guinevere. So, as you make your vows, Galahad, said Gwynion, you are making, in some form, the same kind of sacred marriage to the land that the king used to make in the old days. But you will not, perhaps, be so hard-tested. The colour rose in the younger boy's face. My Lord Arthur came to the throne proved in battle, cousin. There is no way I can now be so tested. I could think of a way, said Morgaine softly. And if you are to rule over Avalon as well as the Christian lands, one day you must come to that too, Galahad. He set his mouth firmly. May that time be far. Surely, my lord, you will live many, many years. By then all those old folk who still believe they must give allegiance to the pagan ways will have gone. I trust not, said Acalon, speaking up for the first time in that company. The sacred groves still stand, and in them the old ways are done as they have been done from the beginning of the world. We do not anger the goddess by denying her worship, lest she turn upon her people and blight the harvests, and darken the very sun that gives us life. Galahad was startled. But this is a Christian land. Have no priests come to you, to show you that the evil old gods among whom the devil had sway have no more power now? Bishop Patricius has told me that all the sacred groves have been cut down. Not so, said Acalon. Nor will be while my father lives, or I after him. Morgaine opened her mouth to speak, but Guinevere saw Acalon lay his hand on her wrist. She smiled at him and said nothing. It was Gwydion who said, Nor yet in Avalon, while the goddess lives. Kings come and kings go, but the goddess shall endure for ever. What a pity, Guinevere thought, that this handsome young man should be a pagan. Well, Galahad is a good and pious Christian knight who will make a Christian king. But as she reassured herself with that thought, a faint shiver went through her. As if Guinevere's thoughts disturbed him, Arthur leaned forward to Gwydion, and his face was troubled. Have you come to court to be one of my companions, Gwydion? I need not tell you that the son of my sister is welcome among my knights. I admit I brought him here for that, said Morgors, but I didn't know that this was Galahad's great ceremonial. I wouldn't steal the luster from this occasion. Surely another time will do as well for that. Galahad said ingenuously, I wouldn't mind sharing my vigil and vows with my cousin. Gwydion laughed. You are too generous, kinsman, he said. 
but you know little of kingcraft. The king's heir must be proclaimed without any to share that moment. If Arthur should knight us both at the same time, and I am so much the older, and resemble Lancelot so much more, well, there is gossip enough about my parentage. It shouldn't shadow your knighthood as well. Nor, he added laughing, my own. Morgain shrugged. They will gossip about the king's kin, whether or no, Gwydion. Let them have some morsel to chew on. Yet another thing, Gwydion said lightly. I have no intent ever to watch by my arms in any Christian church. I am of Avalon. If Arthur will admit me among his companions for what I am, that will be well. And if not, that too will be well. Urians raised his knotty old arms so that the faded serpents could be seen. I sit at the round table with no such Christian vow, stepson. Nor I, said Gawain. We won our knighthoods, all of us who fought in those days, and needed no such ceremonial. Some of us would have been hard put to it had knighthood been fenced about by such courtly vows as now. Even I... Lancelot said, would be somewhat reluctant to take such vows, such a sinful man as I am. But I am Arthur's man for life or death, and he knows it. God forbid I should ever doubt it, said Arthur, smiling with deep affection at his old friend. You and Gawain are the very pillars of my kingdom. If I should ever lose either of you, I think my throne would split and fall from the very top of Camelot. He raised his head as a door opened at the far end of the hall, and a priest in white robes with two young men dressed in white came in. Galahad rose eagerly. By your leave, my lord. Arthur rose too and embraced his heir. Bless you, Galahad. Go to keep your vigil. The boy bowed and turned to embrace his father. Guinevere couldn't hear what Lancelot said to him. She reached out her hand and Galahad bent to kiss it. Give me your blessing, lady. Always, Galahad, Guinevere said, and Arthur added, We will see you to the church. You must keep your vigil alone, but we will come a little way with you. You do me too much honour, my king. Did you not keep vigil when you were crowned? He did indeed, said Morgaine, smiling. But it was far other than this. As the whole party moved toward the church, Gwydion dropped back until he was walking at Morgaine's side. She looked up at her son. He was not as tall as Arthur, who had the height of the Pendragons, but at her side he seemed tall. I hadn't expected to see you here, Gwydion. I hadn't expected to be here, madam. I heard that you had been fighting in this war among Arthur's Saxon allies. I knew not that you were a warrior. He shrugged. You have had little opportunity to know much of me, lady. Abruptly, not knowing what she was going to say until she heard herself saying it, she asked, Do you hate me that I abandoned you, my son? He hesitated. Perhaps... For a time when I was young, he said at last, but I am a child of the goddess, and this forced me to be so in truth, that I could look to no earthly parents. I bear you no grudge now, Lady of the Lake, he said. For a moment the path blurred around her. It was as if the young Lancelot stood at her side. Her son steadied her gently with his arm. Take care. The path here isn't smooth. She asked, How is it with all in Avalon? Ninian is well, he said. I have few ties with any other there. Not now. Have you seen Galahad's sister there, the maiden called Nimue? She frowned, trying to remember how old Nimue would be now. Galahad was sixteen... Nimue would be at least fourteen, 
almost groan. I know her not, said Gwydion. The old priestess of the oracles, Raven, is it, has taken her into the silence and into seclusion. No man may look upon her face. I wonder why Raven did that. A sudden shudder went through her, but she said only, How does Raven, then? Is she well? I haven't heard that she was otherwise, said Gwydion, though when I last saw her at the right, she seemed older than the very oaks. Still, her voice was sweet and young, but I have never had private speech from her. Morgane said, Nor has any man living, Gwydion, and few women. Twelve years I spent there as a maiden, and I heard her voice but half a dozen times. She didn't wish to speak or to think of Avalon, and said, trying to keep her voice commonplace, So you have had battle experience with the Saxons? True, and in Brittany. I spent some time at Lionel's court. Lionel thought me Lancelot's son, and would have me call him uncle, and I told him nothing contrary. It will do Lancelot no harm to be thought capable of fathering a bastard or so. And even as with the good Lancelot, the Saxons around Shardy gave me a name. Elfaro, they call him. Any man who accomplishes anything gets a name from those folk. Mordred, they called me. It means in our tongue something like to deadly counsel or even evil counsel and I think not that they meant it as a compliment. It takes not much craft in counsel to be wilier than a Saxon, she said. But tell me then, what prompted you to come here before the time I had chosen? Widian shrugged. I felt I might well see my rival. Morgane glanced fearfully around her. Say that not aloud. I have no reason to fear Galahad, he said quietly. He looks not to me like one who will live long enough to rule. Is that the sight? I need not the sight to tell me it would take one stronger than Galahad to sit on the throne of the Pendragon, Gwydion said. But if it will ease your mind, lady, I will swear to you by the sacred well Galahad will not die by my hand, nor, he added after a moment, seeing her shiver, by yours. If the goddess doesn't want him on the throne of the new Avalon, I think we may leave it to her. He laid his hand for a moment on Morgane's. Gentle as the touch was, she shivered again. Come, he said. And it seemed to Morgane that his voice was as compassionate as a priest's giving absolution. Let us go and see my cousin to his arms. It isn't right that anything should spoil this great moment of his life. He may not have many more. Chapter 5 As often as Morgors of Lothian had come to Camelot, she never tired of the pageantry. Now, conscious that as one of Arthur's subject queens and the mother of three of his earliest companions... She would have a favoured place at the mock games which marked this day. She sat beside Morgane in church. At the end of the service, Galahad would be knighted, and he knelt now beside Arthur and Guinevere, pale and serious and shining with excitement. Bishop Patricius himself had come from Glastonbury to celebrate the Pentecost Mass here in Camelot. He stood now before them in his white robes, intoning... Unto thee have we offered this bread, the body of the only begotten. Morgors put a plump hand over her mouth, smothering a yawn. However often she attended Christian ceremonies, she never thought about them. They weren't even as interesting as the rites at Avalon, where she had spent her childhood. But she had thought, since she was fourteen or so, that all gods and all religions were games which men and women played with their minds. None of them had anything to do with real life. Nevertheless, when she was at Pentecost, she dutifully attended Mass to please Guinevere. The woman was her hostess, and the High Queen, after all, and a close relative. And now, 
With the rest of the royal family, she went forward to receive the holy bread. Morgaine, attentive at her side, was the only one in the king's household who did not approach the communion table. Morgaine thought lazily that Morgaine was a very great fool. Not only did she alienate the common people, but the more pious among the king's household called Morgaine witch and sorceress, and worse things among themselves. And after all, what difference did it make? One religious lie was as good as another, was it not? King Urien's now. He had more sense of what was expedient. More Gauls didn't think Urien's had any more religion than Guinevere's pet house cat. She had seen the serpents of Avalon around his arms, yet, like his son Acolon, he went forward to take part. But when the final prayer came. Including one for the dead, she discovered that she had tears in her eyes. She missed Lot, his cynical cheerfulness, his steadfast loyalty to her, and he had, after all, given her four fine sons. Gawain and Gareth knelt near her, among Arthur's own household. Gawain, as always, close to Arthur. Gareth side by side with his young friend Uwain, Morgaine's stepson. She had heard Uwain call Morgaine mother, heard a genuine maternal note in Morgaine's voice when she spoke to him, something she had never thought Morgaine capable of. With a rustle of gowns and the small chink of scabbarded swords and such gear, Arthur's household arose and moved to the church porch. Guinevere, though a little haggard, was still beautiful with the long, bright golden braids over her shoulder. And her fine gown belted in with a brilliant golden girdle, Arthur looked splendid too. Excalibur hung in its scabbard at Arthur's side, the same old red velvet scabbard he had worn for more than twenty years now. She supposed that Guinevere could have embroidered him a handsomer one at any time in the past ten years. Galahad knelt before the king. Arthur took from Gawain a handsome sword and said. For you, my dear kinsman and adopted son, this. He gestured to Gawain, who belted it around the boy's slender waist. Galahad looked up with his boyish smile and said clearly, "I thank you, my king. May I bear it only and always in your service." Arthur laid his hands on Galahad's head. He said, "I gladly receive you among the company of my companions, Galahad." And confer on you the order of knighthood. Be always faithful and just, and serve the throne and the righteous cause always. He raised the youngster, embraced him, and kissed him. Guinevere kissed him too, and the royal company went out toward the huge field. The others behind him. Morgaus found herself walking between Morgaine and Gwydion. With Urians, Acolon, and Uwain just behind them, the field had been decorated with green staves wound with ribbons and pennants, and the marshals of the games were pacing off the fighting areas. She saw Lancelot with Galahad embracing him and giving him a plain white shield. Morgaus said, "Will Lancelot fight today?" Acolon said, "I think not. I heard he is to be master of the lists." He has won the field too many times. Between ourselves, he is no longer so young, and it would hardly suit the dignity of the queen's champion to be unseated from his horse by some youth hardly made knight. I've heard that he's been beaten by Gareth more than once, and once by Lamarack. Morgaus said, smiling, "I think well of Lamarack that he forbore to boast of that conquest." Few men could resist bragging that they had overcome Lancelot, even in a mock battle. No," said Morgaine quietly. "I think most young knights would be unhappy at the thought that Lancelot was no longer king of the field. He is their hero." Gwydion chuckled. "Do you mean that the young stags forbear to challenge the knight who is king stag among them?" I think none of the older knights would do so," said Acolon. "And of the young knights, there are few with enough strength or experience to challenge him. If they did, 
he would show them a trick or two still. I would not, said Owain quietly. I think there is no knight at this court who does not love Lancelot. Gareth could overthrow him any time now, but he will not shame him at Pentecost, and he and Gawain have always been evenly matched. Once, at a Pentecost like this, they fought for more than an hour, and once Gawain knocked his sword from his hand. I do not know if I could best him in single combat, but he may stay champion while he lives, for all I will ever do to challenge it. Challenge him some day, Acalon said laughing. I did so, and he took all the conceit out of me in five minutes. He may be old, but he has all his skill and strength. He handed Morgaine and his father into the seats reserved for them. By your leave, I will go and enter the lists before it is too late. And I, said Uwain, bending to kiss his father's hand. He turned to Morgaine. I have no lady mother. Will you give me a token to bear into the lists? Morgaine smiled indulgently and gave him a ribbon from her sleeve, which he tied about his arm, saying, I've arranged to challenge Gawain to a trial of strength. Gwydion said with his charming smile, Why, lady, you had better take back your favour. Would you have your honour so easily disposed of as that? Morgaine laughed up at Acalon. And Morgors, watching her face come alight, thought, Owain is her son, far more than Gwydion. But Acalon, it is plain to see, is more than that. I wonder if the old king knows, or cares. Lamorak was approaching them, and Morgors felt warmed and complimented. There were many pretty ladies on the field. He could have a favour from any of them. Yet, before them all, before all Camelot, her dear young man would come and bow before her. My lady, may I wear a token into battle? With pleasure, my dear. Morgors gave him the rose from the nosegay she wore at her bosom. He kissed the flower. She gave him her hand, pleasantly conscious that her young knight was one of the handsomest men there. Lamorak seems enchanted by you, said Morgaine and although she had given her favour to him before the whole court, Morgors felt herself blush at Morgaine's detached voice. Do you think I have need of charms or spells, kinswoman? Morgaine laughed. I should have used another word. Young men seem mostly to want a fair face and little more. This ends Disc 2. The Prisoner in the Oak Disc 3 Well, Morgaine, Acalon is younger than you, and you have certainly captivated him to the point where he has no desire for a younger woman, or a fairer one. I am not the one to reproach you, my dear. You were married against your will, and your husband could be your grandsire. Morgaine shrugged. Sometimes I think Urien's knows. Perhaps he is glad that I have a lover who will not tempt me to leave him. A little hesitantly, she had never asked Morgaine any personal questions since Gwydion's birth, Morgors said, You and Urien's are at odds then? Morgaine gave again that indifferent shrug. I think Urien's cares not enough for me to be at odds one way or the other. How like you, Gwydion? Morgors asked. He frightens me, said Morgaine. Yet it would be hard not to be charmed by him. What do you expect? He has Lancelot's beauty and your powers of mind. And he is ambitious as well. How strange that you should know my son better than I do, Morgaine said. And there was so much bitterness in the words that Morgaus, whose first instinct was to rap out a sharp reply... Morgaine had deserted her son, why should it surprise her? Patted the younger woman's hand and said, not unkindly, Oh, my dear, once a son is grown out of your lap, I think anyone knows him better than his mother. I'm sure that Arthur and his companions, and even your Uwain, all know Gawain better than I do. And he's not even a hard man to understand. He's a perfectly simple man. If you had reared him from a babe, you still wouldn't understand Gwydion. 
I freely confess that I do not. Morgane's only answer was an uneasy smile. She turned to look at the lists where the first events were starting. Arthur's fools and clowns were dancing about in ridiculous mock battles, flapping pig's bladders for weapons and cloth banners garishly painted in the place of shields until the watchers were guffawing at their capers. They bowed at last, and Guinevere, in an exaggerated parody of the gesture with which she would later bestow prizes to the real winners, flung them handfuls of sweets and cakes. They scrambled for them to more laughter and applause, then capered away to the good dinner waiting for them in the kitchens. One of the criers called out that the first match would be a trial combat between the Queen's champion, Sir Lancelot of the Lake, and the Kings. Sir Gawain of Lothian and the Isles. There was a tumult of applause as they came onto the field. Lancelot, slender, dark, and still so handsome, despite the lines in his face and the grey in his hair, that Morgain felt her breath catch. Yes, thought Morgors, watching her younger kinswoman's face. She loves him still, despite the years. Perhaps she doesn't know it herself. But there it is. The combat was like an elaborately choreographed dance. The two moving round one another, their swords and shields ringing loud. Morgors couldn't see that either of them had the slightest advantage, and when at last they lowered their swords, bowed to the king, and embraced each other, they were cheered impartially and applauded without the slightest favoritism. Then came the horse games. Demonstrations of fancy riding, a man riding an unbroken horse to master it. Morgors faintly remembered a time when Lancelot had done some such thing, perhaps at Arthur's wedding. It seemed very long ago. After that, there were individual duels on horseback with blunted spears, which could nevertheless unhorse a rider and give him a nasty spill into the field. One young rider fell twisted on his leg and was carried away screaming. The leg sticking out at an improbable angle. This was the only serious injury, but there were bruises, smashed fingers, men flung senseless to the ground, and one who barely escaped being kicked by a badly trained horse. Guinevere gave prizes at the end of all this, and Morgain too was called by Arthur and asked to distribute several prizes. Acheron had won one of the prizes for riding. And as he came to kneel and accept the prize from Morgane's hands, Morgors was astonished to hear a low but perceptible hiss of disapproval somewhere in the stands. Someone softly but audibly whispered, "Which, harlot?" Morgane coloured, but her hands didn't falter as she handed Acheron the cup. Arthur said in a low voice to one of his stewards, "Find out who that was." And the man slipped away, but Morgors was sure that in such a crowd the voice would never be recognised. When Morgane came back to her seat at the start of the second half of the entertainment, she looked pale and angry. Her hands, Morgors noted, were shaking, and her breath coming fast in her throat. "My dear, don't worry about it," said Morgors. "What do you think they call me?" When it's a year of poor crops, or when someone has had justice done to him and would rather have gotten away with his villainy, do you think I care what that rabble think of me? Morgane said scornfully, but Morgors knew her indifference was pretended. I am loved well enough in my own country. The second half of the games began with some Saxon churls demonstrating the art of wrestling. They were huge, hairy men, hair not only on their faces but all over their near naked bodies. They grunted and strained and heaved with hoarse cries, grappling and wrenching with bone-cracking strength. Morgors leaned forward, shamelessly enjoying the sight of their male strength, but Morgane turned her eyes away in squeamish distaste. Oh, come, Morgane! You are growing as prudish as the Queen. What a face! Morgor shaded her eyes with her hand and glanced down to the field. I 
think the mock battle is about to begin. Look, is that Gwydion? What can he be doing? Gwydion had leapt into the field, and waving away the crier who hurried to him, called out in a strong, clear voice which could be heard clearly from one end of the field to another, King Arthur! Morgor saw that Morgaine had sunk back white as death and was clutching the rails with both hands. What was the lad about? Was he going to make a scene here before half of Arthur's people, demanding the acknowledgement that was his? Arthur rose, and Morgor thought that he too looked uneasy, but his voice was ringing clear. Yes, nephew. I have heard that it is customary at these games to allow a challenge if the king is willing. I ask now if Sir Lancelot will meet me for a challenge fight. Lancelot had once said, Morgors remembered this, that such challenges were the bane of his existence. Every young knight wanted to master the queen's champion. Arthur's voice was grave. It is customary, but I cannot speak for Lancelot. If he agrees to this match, I cannot refuse him. But you must challenge him directly and abide by his answer. Morgor said, Oh, damn the boy! I had no idea this was what he had in mind. But Morgaine somehow felt she was not so displeased after all. A wind had come up, and dust from the field was blowing, blurring the summer glare of the dry white clay of the field. Gwydion walked through the dust to the end of the lists, where Lancelot was sitting on a bench. Morgors couldn't hear what either of them said. But Gwydion turned angrily and shouted, My lords, I heard always that a champion's duty is to meet with all comers. Sir, I demand that Lancelot now meet my challenge or yield up his high office to me. Does he hold his post because of his skill at arms? Or for some other reason, my lord Arthur? I wish, said Morgors, that your son were still young enough to have his breeches well dusted, Morgaine. Why blame him? asked Morgaine. Why not blame Guinevere for making her husband so vulnerable? Everyone in this kingdom knows she favours Lancelot, yet no one cries out witch or harlot when she comes before the people. But Lancelot, below them, had risen and strode to Gwydion. He brought back his gloved hand and struck the younger man smartly across the mouth. Now, indeed, you have given me cause to chastise your ungentle tongue, young Gwydion. We will see who refuses combat now. I came here for that, said Gwydion, unmoved by blow or words, though there was a small trickle of blood on his face. I will even grant you first blood, Sir Lancelot. It is fitting that a man of your year should have some advantage. Lancelot spoke to one of his marshals who came to take his place as master of the lists. There was a considerable murmuring in the stands as Lancelot and Gwydion took swords and faced the king for the ritual bow which began the contest. Morgors thought... If there is a man in that crowd who doesn't believe that they are father and son, he must have poor eyesight. The two men raised swords to each other, their faces now hidden by helmets. They were within an inch of the same height. The only difference between them was between Lancelot's battered old breastplate and armour and Gwydion's newer unstained gear. They circled one another slowly, then rushed in and for a moment Morgors lost track of the separate strokes, which were nearly too fast for the eye to follow. She could see that Lancelot was taking the younger man's measure, and after a moment he pressed hard and struck a mighty blow. Gwydion caught it on the side of his shield, but the force behind it was so enormous that he reeled, lost his balance, and measured his length on the field. He began to scramble up. Lancelot put his sword aside and went to help the young man to his feet. Morgors couldn't hear what he said, but the gesture was good-natured, something like, had enough, youngster. Gwydion pointed to the trickle of blood down Lancelot's wrist from a small cut he had managed to inflict. 
His voice was clearly audible. You drew first blood, sir, and I second. Shall we decide it with one more fall? There was a small storm of hissing and disapproval. First blood in these demonstration matches, since the contestants fought with sharp weapons, was supposed to end the fight. King Arthur rose in his place. This is a festival, and a courtesy challenge, not a duel. I will have no settling of grudges here, unless you fight with fists or cudgels. Continue if you will, but I warn you, if there is a serious wounding, you will both be under my gravest displeasure. They bowed and moved apart, circling for their advantage. Then they rushed together, and Morgors gasped, watching the fierceness of it. It seemed that at any moment one or the other might rush in under the shield and inflict a mortal wound. One of them had gone to his knees, a rain of blows on the shield. The swords locked together in a deadlock, and one was borne closer and closer to the ground. Guinevere rose and cried out, I will have this go no further. Arthur cast his baton into the lists. By custom, a fight was instantly stopped when that happened, but neither man saw, and the marshals had to pull them apart. Gwydion stood fresh and erect, smiling as he pulled off his helmet. Lancelot's squire had to help the older man to his feet. He was breathing hard, sweat and blood pouring down his face. There was a perfect storm of hissing, even from the other knights on the field. Gwydion had added nothing to his popularity by shaming the hero of the people. But he bowed to the older knight. I am honoured, Sir Lancelot. I came to this court a stranger, not even one of Arthur's companions. And I am grateful to you for a lesson in sword play. His smile was the very reflection of Lancelot's own. Thank you, sir. Lancelot managed to summon from somewhere his old smile. It exaggerated the resemblance between them almost to the point of caricature. You bore yourself most bravely, Gwydion. Then, said Gwydion, kneeling before him in the dust of the field, I beg of you, sir, grant to me the order of knighthood. Morgors caught her breath. Morgaine sat as if she'd been turned to stone. But from where the Saxons sat, there was a burst of cheering. Crafty counsel indeed. Clever. Clever. How can they refuse you now, lad, when you have stood up well to combat with their own champion? Lancelot glanced at Arthur. The king sat paralyzed, seeming frozen. But after a moment, he nodded. Lancelot gestured to his squire, who brought a sword. Lancelot took it and belted it around Gwydion's waist. Bear this always in the service of your king and of the righteous cause, said the old knight. He was deadly serious now. All the mockery and defiance had gone from Gwydion's face. He looked grave and sweet, his eyes raised to Lancelot and Morgors saw that his lips were trembling. Sudden sympathy for him rose in Morgors. Bastard, not even an acknowledged one. He was even more of an outsider than Lancelot had been. Who could blame Gwydion for the ruse by which he had forced his kinsman to notice him? She thought, we should have taken him long since to Arthur's court, had him privately acknowledged, even if Arthur couldn't do so publicly. A king's son shouldn't have to do this. Lancelot laid his hands on Gwydion's brow. I confer on you the honour of a companion of the round table, by permission of our king. Serve him always. And since you have won this honour by craft rather than brute strength, though indeed you have shown that too well enough, I name you among this company, not Gwydion but Mordred. Rise, Sir Mordred, and take your place among the companions of Arthur. Gwydion? No, Mordred, Morgors remembered. For the naming of a companion was a rite not much less serious than baptism. 
rose, and heartily returned Lancelot's embrace. He seemed deeply moved, almost unhearing the cheers and applause. His voice broke as he said, "Now I have won the prize of the day. Whoever is judged winner in these games, my lord Lancelot." No," Morgain said quietly at Morgaw's side. "I do not understand him. That is the last thing I would have expected." There was a long pause before the companions ranged themselves for the final mock battle. Some went to drink water or swallow a hasty bite of bread. Some gathered in little knots, arguing about which side they should take in the final games. Others went to see to their horses. More Gauls went down to the field where a few of the young men lingered. Gareth among them, he towered over the others by half a head, making him easy to pick out. She thought he was talking to Lancelot, but when she came closer, she discovered her sight had deceived her. He was facing Gwydion, and his voice sounded angry. She caught only the last few words. What harm has he ever done you? To make a fool of him before the whole field. Gwydion laughed and said, "If our cousin needs protection before a whole field of his friends, God help Lancelot when he falls among the Saxons or the Northmen. Come, foster brother, I doubt not he can protect his own reputation. Is that all you have to say to me after all these years, brother, to chide me that I've distressed someone you love so well?" Gareth laughed, and caught Gwydion into a great hug. He said, "Same reckless young one, you are. What put it into your head to do that? Arthur would have made you knight if you'd asked him." Morgaws remembered. Gareth didn't know all the truth about Gwydion's parentage. No doubt he meant only because you are his sister's son. Gwydion said. I'm sure of it. He is always kind to his kinsmen. He would have made you knight, Gareth, for Gawain's sake, but you took not that road either, foster brother. He chuckled, and I think Lancelot owes me something for all those years I have walked about wearing his face. Gareth shrugged ruefully. Well, it seems he bears you no grudge, so I suppose I too must forgive you. Now you too have seen how great-hearted he is. I," said Gwydion softly. "He is so." Then raised his head and saw more gores. Mother, what do you hear? How may I serve you? I came only to greet Gareth, who has not spoken with me this day," said more gores, and the big man bent to kiss his mother's hand. She asked him. How will you fight in the mock battle? As always," said Gareth. "I fight at Gawain's side in the king's men. You have a horse for fighting, do you not, Gwydion? Will you fight with the king's side then? We can make a place for you." Gwydion said with his dark, enigmatic smile, "Since Lancelot made me knight, I suppose I should fight with the army of Sir Lancelot of the Lake and at Acheron's side for Avalon." But I will not take the field at all today, Gareth. Why not? Gareth asked, and laid his hand on the younger man's shoulder, looking down at him as he had always done. Morgaw's thought of a younger Gareth smiling down at his little brother. It is expected of those who have been made knight. Galahad will fight among us, you know. And which side will he take? Gwydion asked. His father Lancelot's, or that of the king who has made him heir to his kingdom, is that not a cruel test of his loyalties? Gareth looked exasperated. How then would you divide the armies for the mock battle, saved by the two greatest knights among us? Do you think either Lancelot or Arthur believes it a test of loyalties? Arthur will not take the field himself, just so that no man will have to make the choice whether to strike at his king. But Gawain has been his champion since he was crowned. Are you going to rake up the old scandal? You. Gwydion shrugged. 
since I'm not intending to join either force. But what will they think of you? That you are cowardly, that you shrink from combat? I have fought enough in Arthur's armies that I care not what they say, said Gwydion. But if you wish, you may tell them that my horse has gone lame, and I have no wish to risk more injury to him. That is an honourable excuse. I would lend you a horse of Gawain, Gareth said, puzzled. But if you wish for an honourable excuse, do what you will. But why, Gwydion? Or must I now call you Mordred? You shall call me always what you will, foster brother. But will you not tell me why you shirk the fight, Gwydion? None other but you could speak that word unchallenged, said Gwydion. But since you ask me, I will tell you. It is for your sake, brother. Gareth scowled at him. What in God's name do you mean? I know little of God, or care to, said Gwydion, and stared down at his feet. Since you will know, brother, you know from old, I have the sight. Aye, and what of it? asked Gareth impatiently. Have you had some ill dream that I will fall before your lance? No. Make not a jest of it, said Gwydion, and Morgors felt ice go through her veins as he turned up his face to Gareth. It seemed to me... He swallowed as if his throat closed against the words he would speak. It seemed to me that you lay dying, and I knelt at your side... And you would not speak to me. And I knew it was my doing you lay without the spark of life. Gareth pursed his lips and whistled soundlessly. But then he clapped his foster brother on the shoulder. Nay, but I put small faith in dreams and visions, youngster. And fate no man can escape. Did they not teach you that in Avalon? Aye. Gwydion said softly. And if you fell, even at my hand, in battle, fate, then it would be. But I will not tempt that fate in play, my brother. Some ill chance may guide my hand to strike a miss. Let it be, Gareth. I will not take the field this day. Let them say what they will. Gareth still looked distressed. Well... Do as you will, lad. Stay beside our mother, then, since Lamarack will take the field beside Lancelot. He bent to kiss his mother's hand and went. Morgors, frowning, started to ask Gwydion what he had seen, but he was scowling, staring at the ground, and she forbore, saying only, Well, if I'm to have a young courtier to sit beside me, will you bring me a dipper of water before I go to my seat again? Certainly, mother, he said, and went off toward the water butts. To Morgors, the final scrimmage battle was always something of a blur. Her head had begun to ache with the sun, and she was eager for it to be over. She was hungry, too, and could smell from a distance the meat roasting in the pits. Gwydion sat beside her and explained it to her though she knew little of the fine points of fighting, nor cared to. But she did note that Galahad acquitted himself well, unseating two riders. She was a little surprised. He seemed so gentle a boy. But then Gareth, too, had seemed a gentle child to her, and he was the most fearsome of fighters. At the end he took the prize on the king's side, where Gawain was at the head of the fighting. To no one's surprise... Galahad won the prize on Lancelot's side. This was customary for a young man who had been knighted that day, and she said so. You could have had a prize too, Gwydion, she said. But he laughed and shook his head. I need it not, mother. I spoil this day for my cousin. And Galahad fought well. No one begrudges him the prize. There were many smaller prizes, and when they were all given, the knights went to be sluiced with buckets of water from head to toe by their squires, and to put on fresh clothing. 
Morgors went with the ladies of the king's household to a room put at their disposal where they could arrange their gowns and hair and wash off the dust and sweat of the stands. How do you think, Morgors asked, has Lancelot made himself an enemy? Morgane said, I think not. Did you see them embrace? They looked like father and son, said Morgors. Would that they were. But Morgane's face was like stone. It is many years too late to speak of that, aunt. Morgors reflected. Perhaps she has forgotten that I know whose son he really is. But before Morgane's frozen calm, she could only say, Would you like me to help with your braids at the back? And took up the comb as Morgane turned. Mordred, she said as she worked. Well, he showed crafty counsel here, God knows. Now he has won himself a place by valour and impudence, so he need not demand one from Arthur on the grounds of his parentage. The Saxons named him well, but I knew not he was so much of a fighter. He has certainly managed to carry away the luster of the day. Even though Galahad won the prize, no one will talk about anything but Mordred's daring gesture. One of the Queen's ladies came up to them. Lady Morgane, is Sir Mordred your son? I never knew you had a son. Morgane said steadily, I was very young when he was born, and Morgors fostered him. I had come near to forgetting it myself. How proud you must be of him! And isn't he handsome? As good looking as Lancelot himself, the woman said, and her eyes glistened. He is, isn't he? agreed Morgane, her tone so courteous that only Morgors, who knew her well, knew that she was angry. It has been an embarrassment to them both, I dare say. But Lancelot and I are first cousins, and when I was a little girl, I was more like him than like my own brother. Our mother was tall and red haired like Queen Morgors here, but Lady Vivian was of the old folk of Avalon. Who is his father then? asked the woman, and Morgors saw Morgane's hands clench at her sides. But she said with a pleasant smile, He is a Beltane child, and the god claims all children gotten in the groves. No doubt you remember that as a young girl I was one of the damsels of the Lady of the Lake. Trying to be polite, the woman murmured, I had forgotten. They still kept the old rites there then? As they do now, said Morgane quietly, and the goddess grant they shall do so till the world end. As she had intended, that silenced the woman, and Morgane turned away, saying to Morgors, Are you ready, kinswoman? Let us go down to the hall. As they left the room, she drew a long breath of mingled exasperation and relief. Chattering fools! Listen to them! Have they nothing better to do than gossip? Probably not, said Morgors. Their most Christian husbands and fathers make sure they shall have nothing else to occupy their minds. The doors to the great chamber of the round table where the Pentecost feast would be held were shut, so that they might all enter at once. Arthur every year gives us more pageantry, said Morgors. Now a grand procession and entrance, I suppose. What do you expect? Morgane asked. Now there are no wars, he must touch the imagination of his people somehow. And he is clever enough to do it by making great display for them. I have heard it was the Merlin who counselled him so. The common folk? Yes, and the nobles too. Like a fine show. And the Druids have known that since they lit the first Beltane fires. Guinevere has spent many years making this the greatest holiday anywhere in any Christian land. She gave the first real smile Morgors had seen on her face this day. Even Arthur knows he cannot hold his people with a mass and a feast alone, if there is no great marvel to see. I doubt not Arthur and the Merlin will somehow arrange one. What a pity they couldn't arrange to hold the eclipse today. Did you watch the eclipse in Wales? 
My folk were frightened, Morgors said. And no doubt those fools of Guinevere's lady shrieked and shouted as if the world were coming to an end. Guinevere has a passion for fools among her ladies, Morgane said. Yet she herself is not really a fool, though she likes to seem so. I wonder how she can tolerate it. You should show more patience with them, Morgors warned, and Morgane shrugged. I care not what fools think of me. I cannot imagine how you have dwelt in Urien's kingdom as his queen so long, and not learned more of queencraft, said Morgors. Whatever she is thought by men, a woman must depend on the goodwill of other women. What else did you learn at Avalon? Morgane said, her voice hard. The women in Avalon are not such fools. But Morgors knew her well enough to know that her angry tone concealed loneliness and suffering. Morgane, why do you not return to Avalon? Morgane bent her head, knowing that if Morgors spoke kindly again to her, she would break and weep. My time hasn't yet come. I have been ordered to stay with Urians. And Acalon. Oh, I, with Acalon, said Morgane. I might have known you would reproach me with that. I am the last to speak, said Morgors. But Urians will not live long. Morgane said, her face as frozen as her voice. So I believed on that day years ago when we were wedded. He is like to live as long as Taliesin himself, and Taliesin was past ninety when he died. Arthur and Guinevere had arrived and were slowly making their way to the head of the line. Arthur resplendently clad in white robes, Guinevere beside him exquisite in white silk and jewels. The great doors were flung open and they passed within. Then Morgane is the king's sister with her husband and his sons, Acalon and Uwain, and then Morgors with her household as the king's aunt, then Lancelot and his household, and then the other knights, one by one, proceeding around the round table to take their seats. A few years back, some craftsman had wrought in gold paint and crimson the name of every companion over his customary chair. Now, as they entered... Morgors noticed that the seat nearest the king, reserved all these years for his heir, had been painted with the name Galahad. But she saw it only in the flicker of her eye. For at the great thrones where Arthur and Guinevere were to sit, two white banners, like the garish banners with which the battles of the clowns had been fought, had been draped, and across them were scrawled paintings, ugly caricatures. On one throne was a banner portraying a knight standing on the heads of two crowned figures bearing a devilish likeness to Arthur and Guinevere. And across the other was a lewd painting which made even Morgors, who was by no means prudish, blush. For it depicted a small dark-haired woman stark naked in the embrace of a huge horned devil and all about her, accepting certain strange and disgusting sexual ministrations, were scrawled a group of naked men. Guinevere cried out in a shrill scream, God and Mary defend us! Arthur stopped dead, turned on the servants in a voice of thunder. How came this... this... Words failed him, and he waved his hand at the drawings. This here! Sir, the Chamberlain stammered, it wasn't here when we finished decking the hall. All was orderly, even to the flowers before the Queen's seat. Who was last in this hall? Arthur demanded. Kai limped forward. My lord and my brother, it was I. I came to be certain all was in good order. And I swear, as God sees us all, everything was ready at that time to honour my king and his lady. And if ever I find the foul dog who sneaked in to put this thing here, I will have his head like this. And he gestured as if he were wringing a chicken's neck. Look to your lady, said Arthur sharply. 
The women were twittering and chattering as Guinevere began to sink down in a faint. Morgaine held her up, saying in a sharp, low voice, Gwen, don't give them this satisfaction. You are a queen. What do you care what some fool scrawls on a banner? Control yourself. Guinevere was crying. How can they? How could they? How could anyone hate me so? There is no one alive who can live without offending some idiot or other, said Morgaine, and helped her toward her seat. But the more crudely sexual of the banners was still draped over it, and Guinevere shrank back as if she touched something filthy. Morgaine threw it on the floor. There were wine cups set. Morgaine gestured to one of Guinevere's waiting women to fill one and give it to the queen. Don't let it trouble you, Gwen. I imagine that one is meant for me, she said. It is whispered indeed that I take devils to my bed. And what do I care? Arthur said, Get this foulness out of here and burn it and bring scented woods and incense to take away the stink of evil. Lackey scurried to obey him, and Kai said, We will find out who did this. No doubt it is some servant I dismissed, coming back to embarrass me because I had shown some pride in the decoration of the hall this year. Men, bring the wine round and the ale, and we will have our first round of drinking shame and confusion to that stinking louse who tried to spoil our feast. Will we let him? Come. Drink to King Arthur and his lady. A thin cheer went up, which grew to a genuine cry of appreciation as Arthur and Guinevere bowed to them all. The feasters seated themselves, and Arthur said, Now bring before me any petitioners. Morgors watched as they brought up some man with a complaint which seemed stupid about a boundary. Then came an overlord who complained that his vassal had taken a deer on his lands. Morgors was near Guinevere. She leaned over and murmured to the queen, Why does Arthur hear these cases himself? Any of his bailiffs could handle this and not waste his time. Guinevere murmured, So I once thought, but he hears a case or two like this every year at Pentecost, so that the common folk may not think he cares only for the great nobles or his own companions. Well, Morgors thought, that was wise enough. There were two or three more small petitions. Then, as the meat was brought round, jugglers and acrobats entertained the company, and a man did some conjuring trick of bringing small birds and eggs from the most unlikely places. Morgors thought that Guinevere seemed calm now, and wondered if they would ever catch the author of the drawings. One portrayed Morgaine as a harlot, and that was bad enough. But the other, it seemed, was more serious, showing Lancelot trampling on both king and queen. Something had happened today beyond a public humiliation for the queen's champion, Morgors reflected. That could have been dispelled by the graciousness he had shown to young Gwydion. No, Mordred and the obvious lack of any grudge between them after. But despite Lancelot's popularity with king and companions, there were, no doubt, some who detested Guinevere's obvious partiality to her champion. What's happening now? she asked Guinevere. The queen smiled. Whatever it was, as the horns blew outside the hall, it was something which pleased her. The doors were flung open. Horns blared again, the crude horns of the Saxons. Then three great Saxons, wearing gold torques and bracelets about their arms, clad in garments of fur and leather, bearing great swords and their horned helmets, and with circlets of gold about their heads, strode into the hall of the round table, each with his retinue. "'My Lord Arthur!' called out one of them. I am Adelric, Lord of Kent and Anglia, and these are my brother kings. We have come to ask that we may give tribute to you, most Christian of kings, and make permanent treaty with you and your court for ever. Lot would be turning in his grave, remarked Morgors, but Vivian would be pleased at this day. 
but Morgaine didn't answer. Bishop Patricius rose and came toward the Saxon kings, welcoming them. He said to Arthur, My lord, after the long wars, this gives me great joy. I urge you to welcome these men as your subject kings, and take their oath, in token that all Christian kings should be brothers. Morgaine was deathly white. She started to rise and speak, but Urians looked at her with a stern frown, and she sank back at his side. Morgors said good-naturedly, I remember when the bishops refused even to send anyone to Christianize these barbarians. Lot told me they had vowed they wouldn't meet with the Saxons in fellowship, even in heaven, and that they wouldn't send missions to them. They felt it right that the Saxons should all end up in hell. But, well, that is thirty years gone. Arthur said, Since I came to my throne, I have longed for an end to the wars which have ravaged this land. We have dwelt in peace for many years, Lord Bishop, and now I welcome you, good sirs, to my court and to my company. It is our custom, said one of the Saxons, not Adelric, Morgors noticed, for this one was wearing some kind of blue cloak, and Adelric's had been brown, to take oath on steel. May we take oath on the cross of your sword, Lord Arthur, in token that we meet as Christian kings under one God who rules us all. Be it so, said Arthur quietly, and came down from the dais to stand before them. In the light of the many torches and lamps, Excalibur flashed like lightning as he drew it. He set it upright before him, and a great wavering shadow, the shadow of a cross, fell all the length of the hall as the kings knelt. Guinevere looked pleased. Galahad was flushed with joy. But Morgaine was white with rage, and Morgors heard her whisper to Urien's, He has dared to put the sacred sword of Avalon to such uses. I will not, as priestess of Avalon, sit and witness it in silence. She began to rise, but Urien's gripped her wrist. She struggled silently, but old as Urien's was... He was a warrior, and Morgaine a little woman. For a moment, Morgors thought he would break the small bones of Morgaine's wrist, but she didn't cry out or whimper. She set her teeth and managed to wrench her wrist away. She said, loud enough that Guinevere could certainly hear, Vivian died with her work unfinished, and I have sat idle while children unconceived grew to manhood and were knighted and Arthur fell into the hands of the priests. Lady, said Acolon, leaning over her chair, even you cannot disrupt this holy day, or they will serve you as the Romans served the Druids. Speak in private with Arthur. Remonstrate with him there if you must. I'm sure the Merlin will help you. Morgaine lowered her eyes. Her teeth bit into her lip. Arthur embraced the Saxon kings one by one, welcoming them and leading them to seats near his throne. Your sons, if they show themselves worthy, will be welcome among my companions, he said, and had his servants bring gifts, swords and fine daggers, a rich cloak for Adelric. Morgors took up a cake sticky with honey and put it between Morgaine's clenched lips. You are too fond of fasting, Morgaine, she said. Eat this. You are pale. You will swoon where you sit. It isn't hunger that makes me pale, said Morgaine. But she took the cake in her mouth. She drank a little wine, too, and Morgors could see that her hands were shaking. On one wrist there were dark bruises left by Urien's fingers. Then Morgaine rose. She said quietly to Urien's, do not worry, my most beloved husband. I will say nothing to offend you or our king. Then, turning to Arthur, she said loudly, My lord and brother, may I ask a favour of you? My sister and the wife of my loyal subject, King Urians, may ask what she will, said Arthur genially. The least of your subjects, sir, may ask for audience. 
I ask that you will grant me such an audience, she said. Arthur raised his eyebrows, but took his formal tone from her. Tonight, before I sleep, if you will, I will receive you in my own room, with your husband, if you wish. I wish, thought Morgors, that I could be a fly on the wall at that audience. Chapter 6 In the chamber Guinevere had assigned King Urians and his family, Morgaine combed her hair again with leaden fingers and had her waiting woman lace her into a fresh gown. Urians was complaining that he had eaten and drunk too well and wasn't looking forward to the audience. Go to bed then, she said. It is I who has a thing to say to him. It has nothing to do with you. Not so, said Urians. I too was lessened in Avalon. Do you think I take pleasure in seeing the holy things put to the service of the Christian God, who would strip all other knowledge from the world? No, Morgaine. It is not you alone as priestess of Avalon who should show your outrage at this. It is the kingdom of North Wales. I myself as ruler, and Acalon, who is pledged to rule when I am gone. Father is right, madam. Acalon met her eyes as he said, Our people trust us that we will not betray them, nor let church bells ring in their holy groves. And for a moment, it seemed, though she knew that neither she nor Acalon had moved, that they were standing together in one of the magical groves, joined before the goddess. Urians, of course, had seen nothing. He urged, let Arthur know, Morgaine, that the kingdom of North Wales will not fall meekly under the rule of the Christians. Morgaine shrugged. As you wish. I was a fool, she thought. I was priestess at his king-making. I bore Arthur a son. I should have used that hold I had on the king's conscience, made myself, not Guinevere, the ruler behind the throne. While I hid like an animal, licking wounds, I lost my hold on Arthur. Where at one time I could have commanded, now I must beg, without even the power of the lady. She had already turned toward the door when there was a knocking. A servant went to open it, and Gwydion came in. He was still wearing the Saxon sword that Lancelot had given him at his knighting, but he had taken off his armour, and wore a rich gown of scarlet. She hadn't known he could look so fine. He saw her eyes light on him. Lancelot gave it me. We were drinking in the hall, and word came from Arthur that the king wished to see me in his chambers. I said that my only tunic was bedraggled and blood-soaked, and he said we were of a size, and he would lend me a gown. When I had it on, he said it became me better than it did him, and I should keep it, that I had had few enough gifts at my knighting, while the king had given Galahad many rich presents. Does he know Arthur is my father, that he said that? Urians blinked and looked surprised, but said nothing. Acolon shook his head. No, stepbrother. Lancelot is the most generous of men, that is all. When Gareth came first to court, unknown to his own kinsmen, Lancelot gave him clothes and weapons, so that Gareth should be dressed according to his station. And if you should ask if Lancelot likes it over much, seeing his gifts on the bodies of handsome young men, well, that has been said too before now, though I know of no man at this court, young or old, who has ever had a word from Lancelot beyond knightly courtesy. Is it so? Gwydion asked. And Morgaine could see him taking this piece of information and putting it away like gold in a miser's chest. Now I recall, he said slowly, a tale that went about of some feast at Lot's court when Lancelot was no more than a youth. Something of a ballad made when they thrust a harp into his hand and bade him play, and he sang some lay of Rome or the days of Alexander. I know not what of the love of knightly companions, and they jeered at him for it. 
Since then, his songs are all of the beauty of our queen, or knightly tales of adventure and dragons. Morgaine felt she couldn't bear the scorn in his voice. She said, If you came to claim a gift for your knighting, I will speak with you when I have seen Arthur, but not now. Gwydion looked down at his shoes. It was the first time she had ever seen him less than self-assured and confident. Mother, the king has sent for me too. May I go in your company? She liked him a little better, that he should confess his own vulnerability this way. Arthur means you no harm, my son, but if it will please you to go with us before him, he can do no worse than send you away and say he would rather speak to you separately. Come then, step-brother, said Acolon, taking Gwydion's arm in such a way that the younger man could see the serpents tattooed on Acolon's wrists. The king shall go first with his lady, and you and I will follow. Morgaine, at Urien's side, thought that she liked it well that Acolon should befriend her son and acknowledge him brother. At the same time she felt herself shiver, and Urien's took her hand. Are you cold, Morgaine? Take your cloak. In the king's apartments a fire burned, and Morgaine heard the sound of a harp. Arthur sat in a wooden chair heaped with cushions. Guinevere was setting stitches in a narrow band which twinkled with gilt thread. The servant announced ceremoniously, The king and queen of North Wales and their son Acolon and Sir Lancelot. Guinevere looked up at Lancelot's name, then laughed and said, No, though he is very like. Sir Mordred, is it not, that we saw knighted this day? Gwydion bowed to the queen, but didn't speak. But in this family gathering, Arthur was not one to stand upon ceremony. Sit down, all of you. Let me send for wine. Urien said, I have had enough wine this day, Arthur, to float a ship down to the shore. None for me, thank you. Perhaps the young men have better heads for it. Guinevere moved toward Morgaine, and Morgaine knew that if she didn't speak now, Arthur would begin his parley with the men, and she would be expected to sit in a corner with the queen and keep silence, or talk in whispers of women's things, embroidery, servants, who at the court was breeding. She gestured to the servant with the wine. I will have a cup, she said, remembering, like a pain within her, when, as priestess of Avalon, she had been proud to drink only of the holy well. She sipped and said, I am deeply distressed at the welcome of the Saxon envoys, Arthur. No, she silenced him as he would have spoken. I do not speak as a woman meddling in affairs of state. I am Queen of North Wales and Duchess of Cornwall, and what concerns the realm touches me too. Then you should be glad for peace, Arthur said. I have worked all my lifetime, it seems, since I was old enough to hold a sword to end the wars with the Saxons. At that time I believed the war would be ended by driving them back over the seas whence they came. But peace is peace, and if it comes by making treaty with them, let it be so. There are more ways to deal with a bull than roasting him for dinner. It is equally effective to geld him and make him pull your plough. Or save him to serve your cows at stud? Will you ask your subject kings to marry their daughters to Saxons, Arthur? That too, perhaps, said Arthur. Saxons are no more than men. Do you call to mind that song Lancelot sang? They have the same longings for peace. They too have lived on lands ravaged and burned again and again. Will you say I should have fought on till the last of them was dead or driven out? I thought women longed for peace. I too long for peace and welcome it, even with Saxons, Morgaine said. But have you made them give up their gods too, and accept your own that you made them swear to you on the cross? Guinevere had been listening intently. There are no other gods, Morgaine. 
They have agreed to put aside the devils they worshipped and called gods. That is all. Now they worship the one true God and the Christ sent in His name to save mankind. Gwydion said, "If you truly believe that, my lady and queen, then for you it is truth. All the gods are one god, and all the goddesses one goddess." But would you presume to declare one truth for all of mankind throughout the world? Call you that presumption? It is the one truth, Guinevere said, and a day must come when all men everywhere will acknowledge it. I tremble for my people that you say so," said King Uriens. "I have pledged myself to protect the sacred groves and my son after me. Why?" I thought you a Christian, my lord of North Wales, and so I am," said Urians. "But I will not speak ill of another's god." But there are no such gods," Guinevere began. Morgaine opened her mouth to speak, but Arthur said, "Enough of this! Enough! I did not bid you here to discuss theology. If you have the stomach for that, there are priests enough who will listen and argue." Go you and convert them if you must. What did you come here to say, Morgaine? Only that you are weary of the good faith of the Saxons, oaths on the cross, or no? No, Morgaine said. And as she spoke, she noted that Kevin was in the room, sitting in the shadows with his harp. Good, the Merlin of Britain could witness his protest in the name of Avalon. I call the Merlin to witness. You had them swear an oath on the cross, and you transformed the holy sword of Avalon, Excalibur, the very sword of the Holy Regalia, into your cross for the oath. Lord Merlin, is this not blasphemy? Arthur said quickly, "It was only a gesture to catch the imagination of every one more gain, such as the gesture Vivian made when she bade me fight for peace in the name of Avalon with that self-same sword." The Merlin said in his rich, low voice, "Morgaine, my dear, the cross is a symbol older than Christ and venerated before ever there were followers of the Nazarene. In Avalon, there are priests brought here by the patriarch Joseph of Arimathea, who worship at the side of the Druids. But they were priests who didn't try to say that their God is the only God," Morgaine said angrily. And I doubt not that Bishop Patricius would silence them if he could, and preach only his own brand of bigotry. Bishop Patricius and his beliefs are not at issue here, Morgain," said Kevin. "Let the uninitiated think that the Saxons swore on the cross of Christ's sacrifice and death. We too have a sacrificed God, whether we see him in the cross or in the sheaf of barley, which must die to the earth and be raised again from the dead." Guinevere said, "Your sacrificed gods, Lord Merlin, were sent only that mankind might be ready when the Christ came to die for man's sins." Arthur moved his hand impatiently. "Be quiet, all of you. The Saxons swore to peace on a symbol meaningful to them." But Morgaine interrupted him. "It was from Avalon you received the sacred sword." And to Avalon, that you swore an oath to preserve and guard the holy mysteries. And now you would make the sword of the mysteries into the cross of death, the gallows for the dead. When Vivian came to court, she came to demand of you that you fulfil your oaths to Avalon. Then she was struck down. Now I am come to finish that work she left undone. And to demand from you that holy sword of Excalibur, which you have presumed to twist into the service of your Christ. Guinevere said, "A day will come when all false gods shall vanish, and all pagan symbols shall be put to the service of the one true God and His Christ." I did not speak to you, you canting fool," said Morgaine furiously, "and that day will come over my corpse." You Christians have saints and martyrs. Do you think Avalon will have none? And as she spoke, she shuddered, 
knowing that unaware she had spoken through the sight, and there was the body of a knight draped in black with a cross banner over his body. She wanted to turn, as she couldn't do here in this company, and throw herself into Acolon's arms. How you exaggerate all things, Morgaine, said Arthur with an uneasy laugh. And that laugh maddened her, driving away both the fear and the sight. She drew herself up to her full height, and knew that for the first time in many years she spoke mantled in all the power and authority of a priestess of Avalon. Hear me, Arthur of Britain, as the force and power of Avalon set you on the throne, so the force and power of Avalon can bring you down into ruin. Think well how you desecrate the holy regalia. Think never to put it to the service of your Christian God, for everything of power carries its own curse. Enough! Arthur had risen from his chair, and his frown was like a storm. Sister or no, do not presume to give orders to the king of all Britain. I do not speak to my brother, she retorted, but to the king. Avalon set you on the throne, Arthur. Avalon gave you that sword you have misused. And in the name of Avalon I now call on you to render it back again to the holy regalia. If you wish to treat it only as a sword, then call your smiths to make you another. There was a dreadful silence, and it seemed to her for a moment that her words were falling into the great echoing empty spaces between the worlds, that far away in Avalon the druids must wake, that even Raven must stir and cry out against Arthur's betrayal. But the first sound she heard was nervous laughter. What nonsense you are talking, Morgaine! It was Guinevere who spoke. You know Arthur cannot do that. Do not interfere, Guinevere, Morgaine said with deadly menace. It has nothing to do with you, except that if it was you who bade Arthur break oath to Avalon, beware. Urians, said Guinevere, will you stand idle and let your unruly wife speak so to the High King? Urians coughed. His voice, when he spoke, sounded as nervous as Guinevere's. Morgaine, perhaps you are being unreasonable? Arthur made a dramatic gesture for political reasons, to catch the imagination of the crowd. If he did so with a sword of power, well, so much the better. The gods can take care of their own worship, my dear. Do you think the goddess needs your help to protect her own? At that moment, if Morgaine had had a weapon, she would have struck Urians down. He had come to support her, and now he deserted her this way? Arthur said, Morgaine, since you are so troubled, let me say this for your ears alone. I intended no desecration. If the sword of Avalon also serves as a cross for an oath, does it not mean that Avalon's powers are joined in the service of this land? So Kevin advised me. Oh, aye. I knew him, traitor, when he had Vivian buried outside the Holy Isle, Morgaine began. Be it so, or otherwise, said Arthur. I gave the Saxon kings the gesture they wanted, to swear on my sword. But it is not your sword, Morgaine retorted at white heat. It is the sword of Avalon, and if you bear it not as you have sworn, then shall it be given into the hands of one who will be true to his oath. Sword of Avalon, it may have been a generation ago, said Arthur, who was now as angry as Morgaine. He clenched his hand over the hilt of Excalibur, as if someone would take it from him in that very moment. A sword is his who uses it and I have won the right to call it mine by driving forth all enemies from this land. I bore it in battle, and I won this land at Mount Baden. And you have tried to subject it to the service of the Christian God, Morgaine retorted. Now, in the name of the goddess, I demand of you that it be returned to the shrine of the lake. 
Arthur drew a long breath, and he said in a voice of studied calm, "I refuse. If the goddess wants this sword returned, then she herself will have to take it from my hands." Then his voice softened. My dear sister, I beg of you, do not quarrel with me about the name by which we call our gods. You yourself have said to me that all the gods are the one god. And he will never see why what he has said is wrong, Morgan thought in despair. Yet he has called on the goddess, if she wants his sword, to come and take it. Be it so, then, lady. May I be your hand? She bowed her head for a moment and said, "To the goddess, then, I leave the disposal of her sword. And when she has done with you, Arthur, you will wish you had chosen to deal with me instead." And she went to sit beside Guinevere. Arthur beckoned to Gwydion. "Sir Mordred," he said, "I would have made you one of my companions at any time you asked it of me." I would have done so for Morgane's sake and for my own. You needed not to force knighthood from me by a trick. I thought if you made me knight without some good excuse such as this, Gwydion said, there might be talk of a kind you didn't wish. Will you forgive me the trick then, sir? If Lancelot has forgiven you, I have no reason to bear you any grudge, said Arthur. And since he has gifted you richly. It would seem he cherishes no wrath. I wish it lay in my power to acknowledge you, my son, Mordred. Until a few years ago, I knew not that you existed. Morgain told me not what came of that kingmaking. You do know, I suppose, that to the priests and bishops, your very existence is sign of something unholy. Do you believe that, sir? Arthur looked his son directly in the eye. Oh, times I believe one thing, times another, like all men. It doesn't matter what I believe. The facts are thus: I cannot acknowledge you before all men, though you are such a son as any man, let alone a childless king, would be glad and proud to own. Galahad must inherit my throne. If he lives," said Gwydion. And at Arthur's shocked look, added quietly, "No, sir, I am not making a threat to his life. I will swear any oath you will, by cross or oak, by the sacred well, or by these serpents I bear." He thrust out his wrists, which you bore before me. May the goddess send living serpents like these to take my life if ever I raise a hand against my cousin Galahad. But I have seen it. He will die, honorably, for the cross he worships. God save us from evil! cried out Guinevere. Indeed, lady. But if he doesn't live to ascend your throne, my father and my king, he is a warrior and a knight, and no more than mortal, and you may live to be older than King Urien's. What then? Should Galahad die before he comes to my throne? God stand between him and harm," said Arthur. "I will have no choice. Royal blood is royal blood, and yours is royal from the Pendragon and from Avalon. Should such an evil day come, I suppose even the bishops would rather see you on the throne than leave this land to such chaos as they feared when Uther died." He rose and stood with his two hands on his son's shoulders. Looking into his eyes, would I could say more, my son. But done is done. I will say only that I wish with all my heart that you had been the son of my queen. And so do I," said Guinevere, rising to embrace him. Still, I will not treat you as a base-born churl," said Arthur. You are Morgane's son, Mordred, Duke of Cornwall, companion of the Round Table. You shall go to be the voice of the Round Table among the Saxon kings. You shall have the right to do the king's justice, 
and to collect my taxes and revenues, keeping a suitable portion to maintain such a household as the king's chancellor should have. And, if you wish it, I give you permission to marry the daughter of one of the Saxon kings, which will give you a throne of your own, even if you come never to mine. Gwydion bowed and said, You are generous, sir. Yes, Morgaine thought, and this would keep Gwydion well out of the way until, and unless, there was need of him. Arthur was skilled at kingcraft. She raised her head and said, You have been so generous to my son, Arthur. May I trespass again on your kindness? Arthur looked wary, but he said, Ask me something I can grant, my sister, and it will be my pleasure to give it. You have made my son Duke of Cornwall, but he knows little of Cornwall's land as yet. I have heard that Duke Marcus now claims all that country. Will you come with me to Tintagel and investigate this matter and this claim? Arthur's face relaxed. Had he been braced for her to raise the matter of the sword Excalibur again? No, my brother, not ever again before this court. When again I stretch forth my hand for Excalibur, it will be in my own country and in the place of the goddess. This ends Disc 3. The Prisoner in the Oak, Disc 4. I haven't been in Cornwall for more years than I can reckon, Arthur said, and I cannot leave Camelot until midsummer is past, but remain here in Camelot as my guest, and then we will go together to Tintagel and see if Duke Marcus, or any other man God ever made, will dispute the claim of Arthur and of Morgaine, Duchess of Cornwall. He turned to Kevin. And now, enough of high matters. My Lord Merlin, I wouldn't command you to sing for me before my entire court, but in private, within my own chambers, and in the company of my family alone, may I entreat you for a song? It will be my pleasure, said Kevin. If the Lady Guinevere does not object. He glanced at the Queen, but she was silent, and so he set his harp to his shoulder and began to play. Morgaine sat quietly beside Urien's, listening to the music. A royal gift indeed, Arthur had commanded for his family. Kevin's music. Gwydion listened, his hands clasped about his knees, silent and spellbound. She thought, in that at least he is my son. Eurians listened with polite attention. Morgaine looked up for a moment, meeting Acolon's eyes, and thought, somehow this night we must manage to meet, even if I must give Eurians a sleeping potion. There is much I must say to him. And then she cast down her eyes. She was no better than Guinevere. Eurians was holding her hand, fondling her fingers and wrists. She felt him touch the bruises he had made that day, and through the pain she felt revulsion. She must go to his bed if he desired it. Here, in this Christian court, she was his property. Like a horse or dog, he could fondle or beat at his own will. Arthur had betrayed both her and Avalon. Eurians had played her false as well. Kevin, too, had betrayed her. But Acolon would not fail her. Acolon should rule for Avalon. The king Vivian had foreseen would come. And after Acolon, Gwydion, Druid king, king of Avalon and all Britain. And behind the king, the queen, ruling for the goddess, as in the days of old. Kevin raised his head and met her eyes and Morgaine shivered, knowing she must conceal her thoughts. He has the sight, and he is Arthur's man. He is the Merlin of Britain, and nevertheless he is my enemy. But Kevin said mildly, Since this is a family party, and I too would wish to hear music made, may I ask as my fee 
that the Lady Morgaine will sing. And Morgaine went to take his place, feeling the power of the harp in her hands. I must charm them, she thought, so they think no harm, and set her hands to the strings. Chapter 7 Urien said, when they were alone in their chamber, I knew not that your claim to Tintagel was being disputed again. The things you do not know, my husband, are as many as acorns in a pig meadow, she said impatiently. How had she ever thought she could suffer this fool? Kind, yes. He had never been unkind to her, but his stupidity grated on her like a rasp. She wanted to be alone, to consider her plans, to confer with Acolon, and instead she must placate this old idiot. I should know what you are planning, Urien's voice was sullen. I'm angry that you didn't consult with me if you were displeased at what was happening in Tintagel. I am your husband, and you should have told me rather than appealing to Arthur. The sulkiness in his voice held a hint of jealousy too, and she remembered now, stricken, that it had been brought out what she had concealed all these years. Who had fathered her son? But could Urians really think that after a quarter of a century she still held power of that sort over her brother, because of something only fools and Christians would think a sin? Well, if he has not wit enough to see what is happening before his eyes, why should I explain it to him word by word like a child's lesson? She said, still impatient, Arthur is displeased with me because he thinks a woman should not contend with him this way. Therefore I asked his help, so that he will not believe I am in rebellion against him. She said no more. She was priestess of Avalon. She would not lie, but there was no need to speak more truth than she wished. Let Urians think, if he would, that she only wished to make up her quarrel with Arthur. How clever you are, Morgaine, he said, patting her wrist. She thought, flinching, that already he had forgotten that it was he who had inflicted the injury. She felt her lips trembling as if she were a child, thinking, I want Acolon. I want to lie in his arms and be cherished and comforted. But in this place, how can we contrive even to meet and speak in secret? She blinked away angry tears. Strength was her only safety now. Strength and concealment. Urians had gone out to relieve himself and came back yawning. I heard the watchman cry midnight, he said. We must to bed, lady. He began to take off his festal robe. Are you very weary, dear one? She didn't answer, knowing that if she did, she would weep. He took her silence for consent and drew her close, nuzzling at her throat, then pulled her toward the bed. She endured him, wondering if she could remember some charm or herb to put an end to the old man's too enduring virility. Damn him! He should be long past this by his age. No one would even think it the result of sorcery. She lay wondering afterward why she couldn't simply turn to him with indifference. Let him have her without even thinking, as she had done so often in these long years. What did it matter? Why should she notice him any more than a stray animal sniffing round her skirts? She slept fitfully, dreaming of a child she had found somewhere and must suckle, though her breasts were dry and ached terribly. She woke with the pain still in them. Urians had gone to hunt with some of Arthur's men. It had been arranged days ago. She felt sick and queasy. I ate more, she thought, than I usually do in three days. No wonder I am sick. But when she went to fasten her gown, her breasts were still sore and aching. It seemed to her that the nipples, brown and small, looked pink and swollen. She let herself collapse on the bed as if her knees had been broken. She was barren. She knew she was barren. They had told her after Gwydion's birth that she would probably never bear a child again. And in all the years since, never once from any man had she gotten with child. 
More than that, she was near to nine and forty, long past the childbearing years. But for all that, she was certainly pregnant now. She had thought herself long past the possibility. Her courses had grown irregular and were absent for months at a time. She had thought herself coming to the end of them. Her first reaction was fear. She had come so near to death when Gwydion was born. Urians would certainly be delighted at this supposed proof of his manhood. But when this child was conceived, Urians had been ill with the lung fever. There was small likelihood, after all, that it was Urian's child. Had it been fathered by Acolon on the day of the eclipse? Why then? It was child to the god as he had come to them in the hazel grove. What would I do with a babe, old woman that I am? But perhaps it will be a priestess for Avalon, one to rule after me when the traitor has been tumbled from the throne where Vivian set him. It was grey and dismal outside, drizzling rain. The games field of yesterday was trampled and muddy. With scattered banners and ribbons trodden into the mud, one or two of the subject kings were making ready to ride out, and a few kitchen women, their gowns tucked up to their bare thighs, carrying washing paddles and sacks of clothing, were trudging down toward the shores of the lake. There was a knock at the door. The servant's voice was soft and respectful. Queen Morgain. The High Queen has asked that you and the Queen of Lothian should come to break your fast with her, and the Merlin of Britain has asked that you will receive him here at noon. I will go to the Queen," said Morgaine. "Tell the Merlin I will receive him." She shrank from both confrontations, but she dared not deny herself to either, especially now. Guinevere would never be anything but her enemy. It was her doing that Arthur had fallen into the hands of the priests and betrayed Avalon. Perhaps, Morgaine thought, I am plotting the downfall of the wrong person. If I could somehow manage it that Guinevere left court even to run away with Lancelot to his own castle, now that he is widowed and can lawfully take her, but she dismissed that idea. Probably Arthur has asked her to make up the quarrel with me," she thought cynically. "He knows too that he cannot afford to quarrel with subject kings, and if Guinevere and I are at odds, more gores, as ever, will take my part. Too strong a family quarrel, and he would lose Urian's and more gores's sons too. He cannot afford to lose Gawain, Gareth, the Northmen." Morgaws was in the queen's room already. The smell of food made Morgaine sick again, but she controlled it with iron will. It was well known that she never ate much, and it wouldn't be particularly noticed. Guinevere came and kissed her, and for a moment Morgaine's real tenderness for this woman returned. Why should we be enemies? We were friends once, so long ago. It wasn't Guinevere herself that she hated; it was the priests who had so much influence over her. She came to the table, accepting but not eating a piece of new bread and honey. Guinevere's ladies were the kind of pious idiots with whom Guinevere always surrounded herself. They welcomed Morgaine with curious looks and a great outward display of cordiality and pleasure. Your son, Sir Mordred, what a fine lad he is! How proud you must be of him," one of them said. And Morgaine, breaking the bread and crumbling it, remarked with composure that she had hardly seen him since he was weaned. It is Owain, my husband's son, who is more truly my own son, and it is in his knightly accomplishments that I take pride," Morgaine said, "for I reared him from a little child." But you are proud of Mordred as your own son, are you not, Morgaws? But Urien's son is not your own child," someone else asked. "No," she said patiently. "He was nine years old when I married my lord of North Wales." One of the girls giggled that if she were Morgaine, she would pay more heed to that other handsome stepson of hers, Acolon, was it not? Morgaine. 
clenching her teeth, thought, Shall I kill this fool? But no, the ladies of Guinevere's court had nothing to do but spend their time in mindless jests and gossip. Now, tell me, Elias, who had been waiting woman when Morgane was also at Guinevere's court, and whose bride woman Morgane had been when the girl was married, giggled. Isn't he Lancelot's son, really? Morgane raised her eyebrows and said, Who? Bacalon? King Urien's late wife would hardly thank you for that imputation, lady. You know what I mean, Elias snickered. Lancelot was the son of Vivian, and you were raised by her. And who could blame you? Tell me the truth now, Morgane. Who was that handsome lad's father? There is no one else it could have been, is there? Morgors laughed and said, trying to break the tension, Well, we are all in love with Lancelot, of course. Poor Lancelot, what a burden to bear. But you are eating nothing, Morgane, said Guinevere. Can I send to the kitchens, if this is not to your liking, a slice of ham, some better wine than this? Morgane shook her head and put a piece of bread into her mouth. Hadn't this all happened before? Or perhaps she had dreamed it. She felt a sick dizziness before her eyes, grey spots dancing. It would indeed give them gossip to enliven many a boring day if the old Queen of North Wales swooned away like a breeding woman. Her fingernails cut into her hands, and somehow she managed to make the dizziness recede a little. I drank too much at the feast yesterday. You have known for twenty years that I have no head for drinking wine, Guinevere. Ah, and it was good wine, too, said Morgors, with a greedy smack of her lips. And Guinevere replied courteously that she would send a barrel of it to Lothian with Morgors when she left. But Morgane, mercifully forgotten, the blinding headache clamping down over her brow like a torturer's band, felt Morgors's questioning eyes on hers. Pregnancy was one thing that couldn't be hidden. No. And why should it be hidden? She was lawfully wedded. People might laugh if the old King of North Wales and his middle-aged Queen became parents at their advanced ages. But the laughter would be good-natured. Yet Morgane felt that she would explode from the sheer force of the anger in her. She felt like one of the fire mountains of which Gawain had told her, far in the countries to the north. When the ladies had all gone away, and she was alone with Guinevere, the queen took her hand and said in apology, I'm sorry, Morgane, you do look ill. Perhaps you should return to your bed. Perhaps I shall, Morgane said, thinking, Guinevere would never guess what was wrong with me. Guinevere, should this happen to her, would welcome it even now. The queen reddened under Morgane's angry stare. I'm sorry. I didn't mean for my women to tease you like that. I should have stopped them, my dear. Do you think I care what they say? They are like sparrows chirping and have as much sense about them, Morgane said with contempt as blinding as the pain in her head. But how many of your women really know who fathered my son? You made Arthur confess it. Did you confide it to all your women as well? Guinevere looked frightened. I do not think there are many who know. Those who were there last night when Arthur acknowledged him, certainly. And Bishop Patricius. She looked up at Morgane, and Morgane thought, blinking, how kindly the years have treated her. She grows even more lovely, and I wither like an ancient briar. You look so tired, Morgane, said Guinevere. And it struck Morgane that in spite of all old enmities, there was love too. Go and rest, dear sister. Or is it only that there are so few of us now who are young together? The Merlin had aged too. And the years hadn't been so kind to him as to Guinevere. He was more stooped. He dragged his leg now with a walking stick 
and his arms and wrists with their great ropey muscles looked like branches of an ancient and twisted oak. He might indeed have been one of the dwarf folk of which tales told that they dwelt beneath the mountains. Only the movements of his hands were still precise and lovely, despite the twisted and swollen fingers, his graceful gestures making her think of the old days and her long study of the harp and of the language of gesture and hand speech. He was blunt, waving away her offer of wine or refreshment, dropping on a seat without her leave by old habit. I think you are wrong, Morgan, to harry Arthur about Excalibur. She knew her own voice sounded hard and shrewish. I didn't expect you to approve, Kevin. No doubt you feel that whatever use he makes of the holy regalia is good. I cannot see that it is wrong, Kevin said. All gods are one, as even Taliesin would have said. And if we join in the service of the one, but it is that with which I quarrel, Morgaine said. Their god would be the one, and the only, and drive out all mention of the goddess whom we serve. Kevin, listen to me. Can you not see how this narrows the world, if there is one rather than many? I think it was wrong to make the Saxons into Christians. I think those old priests who dwelt on Glastonbury had the right idea. Why should we all meet in one afterlife? Why should there not be many paths? The Saxons to follow their own, we to follow ours, the followers of the Christ to worship him if they choose, without restraining the worship of others. Kevin shook his head. My dear, I do not know. There seems to be a deep change in the way men now look at the world, as if one truth should drive out another, as if whatever is not their truth must be falsehood. But life isn't as simple as that, Morgaine said. I know that, you know that. And in the fullness of time, Morgaine, even the priests will find it out. But if they have driven all other truths from the world, it will be too late, Morgaine said. Kevin sighed. There is a fate that no man and no woman may stop, Morgaine. And I think we are facing that day. He reached out one of his gnarled hands and took hers. She thought she had never heard him speak so gently. I am not your enemy, Morgaine. I have known you since you were a maiden. And after... He stopped, and she saw his throat twitch as he swallowed. I love you well, Morgaine. I wish you nothing but well. There was a time... Oh, yes, it was long ago... But I forget not how I loved you, and how privileged I felt that I could speak of love to you. No man can fight the tides or the fates. Perhaps if we had sent sooner to Christianize the Saxons, it would have been done by those same priests who built a chapel where they and Taliesin could worship side by side. Our own bigotry prevented that. So it was left to fanatics like Patricius who in their pride see the Creator only as the avenging father of soldiers, not also as the loving mother of the fields and the earth. I tell you, Morgaine, they are a tide that will sweep all men before them like straw. Done is done, Morgaine said. But what is the answer? Kevin bent his head and it struck Morgaine that what he really wanted was to lay that head down on her breast, not now as a man to a woman, but as if she were the mother goddess who could quiet his fear and despair. Maybe, he said, his voice stifled, maybe there is no answer at all. It may be there is no god and no goddess, and we are quarrelling over foolish words. I will not quarrel with you, Morgaine of Avalon, but neither will I sit idle and let you plunge this kingdom again into war and chaos, wreck this peace that Arthur has given us. Some knowledge and some song and some beauty must be kept for those days before the world again plunges into darkness. I tell you, Morgaine, I have seen the darkness closing. Perhaps in Avalon, 
we may keep the secret wisdom. But the time is past when we can spread it again into the world. Do you think I am afraid to die so that something of Avalon may survive among mankind? Morgaine, slowly, compelled, put out her hand to touch his face, to wipe away tears. But she jerked her hand back in sudden dread. Her eyes blurred. She had laid her hand on a weeping skull, and it seemed her own hand was the thin, winter-blighted hand of the death crone. He saw it too, and stared at her, appalled, for a single terrified moment. Then it was gone again, and Morgaine heard her voice harden. So, you would bring the holy things into the world, that the holy sword of Avalon may be the avenging sword of Christ. It is the sword of the gods, Kevin said, and all the gods are one. I would rather have Excalibur in the world where men may follow it than hidden away in Avalon. So long as they follow it, what difference does it make which gods they call on in doing so? Morgaine said steadily, It is that I will die to prevent. Beware, Merlin of Britain. You have made the great marriage and pledged yourself to die for the preservation of the mysteries. Beware, lest obeying that oath be claimed of you. His beautiful eyes looked straight into hers. Oh, my lady and my goddess, I beg you, take counsel of Avalon before you act. Indeed, I think the time has come for you to return to Avalon. Kevin laid his hand over hers. She didn't draw it away. Her voice caught and broke with the tears that had laid heavy on her all this day. I... I wish I might return. It is because I long so much for it that I dare not go thither, she said. I shall go there never, until I may leave it never more. You will return, for I have seen it, said Kevin wearily. But not I. I know not how, Morgaine, my love, but it comes to me that never again shall I drink of the holy well. She looked at the ugly, misshapen body, the fine hands, the beautiful eyes, and thought, Once I loved this man. Despite all, she loved him still. She would love him till both of them were dead. She had known him since the beginning of time, and together they had served their goddess. Time slid away, and it seemed that they stood outside time, that she gave him life, that she cut him down as a tree, that he sprang up again in the corn, that he died at her will, and she was taken in his arms and brought back to life. The ancient priest drama played out before Druid or Christian set foot upon the earth. And he would cast this away? If Arthur shall forswear his oath, shall I not require it at his hands? Kevin said, one day the goddess will deal with him in her own way. But Arthur is king of Britain by the will of the goddess. Morgaine of Avalon, I tell you, beware. Dare you set your face against the fates that rule this land? I do what the goddess has given me to do. The goddess? Or your own will and pride and ambition for those you love? Morgaine... Again, I say to you, beware, for it may well be that the day of Avalon is past, and your day with it. Then the fierce control she had clamped upon herself broke. And you dare call yourself the Merlin of Britain? She shrieked at him. Be gone, you damned traitor. She picked up her distaff and flung it at his head. Go out from my sight and damn you forever. Go from here. Chapter 8 Ten days later, King Arthur, Queen Morgaine, and her husband, Urians of Wales, set forth to ride to Tintagel. Morgaine had had time to decide what she must do, and had found a moment to speak alone with Acolon the day before. 
await me on the shores of the lake. Be certain that neither Arthur nor Uriens sees you. She reached her hand to him in farewell, but he caught her close and kissed her again and again. Lady, I cannot bear to let you go into danger this way. For a moment she leaned against him. She was so weary, so weary of being always strong, of making certain that all things went as they must. But he must never suspect her weakness. There is no help for it, my beloved. Otherwise there would be no answer but death. You cannot come to the throne with the blood of your father on your hands. And when you sit on Arthur's throne, with the power of Avalon behind you and Excalibur in your hand, then you can send Uriens back to his own land, there to rule as long as God wills. And Arthur? I mean Arthur no harm either, said Morgaine steadily. I would not have him killed. But he shall dwell for three nights and three days in the land of Fairy. And when he returns, five years or more will have passed, and Arthur and his throne will be a tale remembered by the older men, and the danger of a priest rule long past. But if he somehow finds his way out? Morgaine's voice had trembled. What of the king stag when the young stag is grown? It must be with Arthur as the fates decree, and you will have his sword. Treachery, she thought, and her heart pounded as they rode through the dismal grey morning. Thin fog was rising from the lake. I love Arthur. I would not betray him. But he first betrayed the oath he swore to Avalon. She still felt queasy, the motion of the horse making it worse. She couldn't remember that she had been as sick as this when she carried Gwydion. Mordred, she reminded herself. Yet it might be, when he came to the throne, that he would choose to rule in his own name, the name that had been Arthur's, and bore no taint of Christian rule. And when Kevin saw the thing already accomplished, no doubt he too would choose to support the new king of Avalon. The fog was thickening, making Morgaine's plan even simpler to follow. She shivered, pulling her cloak tight around her. It must be done now, or, as they skirted the lake, they would turn southward to Cornwall. The fog was so thick already that she could hardly make out the forms of the three men-at-arms who rode ahead of them. Twisting in her saddle, she saw that the three men behind were almost equally dim. But the ground, for a little way before and behind them, was clear, though overhead the fog was like a thick white curtain with no hint of sun or daylight. She stretched out her hands, raising herself high in her saddle, whispering the words of the spell she had never dared use before. She felt a moment of pure terror. She knew it was only the coldness that came from power draining out of her body, and Urien's, shivering, raised his head and said peevishly, Such a fog as this I have never seen. We will surely be lost and have to spend the night on the shores of the lake. Perhaps we should seek shelter at the Abbey in Glastonbury. We are not lost, said Morgaine, the fog so thick that she could barely see the ground under her horse's hooves. Oh, as a maiden in Avalon I was so proud that I spoke only truth. Is it Queencraft, then, to lie, that I may serve the goddess? I know every step of the way we are going. We can shelter this night in a place I know near the shores, and ride on in the morning. We cannot have come so far as that, said Arthur, for I heard the bells in Glastonbury ring the Angelus. Sounds carry a long way in the fog, Morgaine said, and in fog such as this they carry further still. Trust me, Arthur. He smiled lovingly at her. I have always trusted you, dear sister. Oh, yes, he had always trusted her, since that day when Igraine had placed him in Morgaine's arms. At first she had hated the squalling thing, and then she had come to know that Igraine had abandoned and betrayed them both, and she must care for him, and had wiped away his tears. 
impatient Morgaine hardened her heart. That had been a lifetime ago. Since then, Arthur had made the great marriage with the land and had betrayed it, giving the land he had sworn to protect into the hands of priests who would drive out the very gods that fed the land and made it fertile. Avalon had set him on his throne, through her hand as priestess, and now Avalon, through her hand, would bring him down. I will not hurt him, mother. Yes, I will take from him the sword of the holy regalia and give it into the hands of one who will bear it for the goddess. But I will never lay hand on him. But what of the king's stag when the young stag is grown? That was the way of nature and couldn't be amended for the sake of her sentiment. Arthur would meet his fate unprotected by the spells he bore, by the scabbard she herself had made for him after she had gone to him in the great marriage, when she bore, still not knowing it, his child within her body. She had often heard his knights speak of his charmed life, of how he could take the worst of wounds and not lose blood enough to kill. She would not lay a hand upon her mother's son and the father of her child, but the spell she had put upon him in the aftermath of her lost virginity, that she might withdraw from him, and then it must be with him as the goddess willed. The magical fog had thickened so much around them that Morgaine could hardly see Urien's horse. His face, angry and sullen, swam out of the mist. Are you sure you know where you are leading us, Morgaine? I have never been here before. I would swear to it. I know not the curve of that hill. I vow to you. I know every step of the way. Fog or no fog. At her feet... Morgaine could see the curious little cluster of bushes, unchanged from that day when she sought entry into Avalon, that day when she had feared to summon the boat. Goddess, she prayed to herself, not even a whisper, grant that the church bells ring not while I seek to enter, lest it vanish back into the fog, and we find never our way into that country. This way, she said, picking up her reins and digging her heels into her horse. Follow me, Arthur. She rode swiftly into the fog, knowing they couldn't follow her so fast in this absence of light. Behind her she heard Urien's cursing, his voice cross and muffled, heard Arthur speak reassuringly to his horse. Suddenly an image flashed into Morgaine's mind, of the skeleton of a horse bearing her own riding gear. Well... It must be as it must be. The fog had begun to thin, and suddenly they were riding in full daylight through the dappled trees. Clear green lights spilled down, though they could see no sun, and she heard Arthur's cry of surprise. Out of the forest came two men who cried out in their clear voices, Arthur, my lord, it is a pleasure to welcome you here. Arthur drew up his horse swiftly, lest he trample the men. "'Who are you, and how do you know my name?' he demanded. "'And what is this place?' "'Why, my lord, this is Castle Chariot, and our queen has long desired to receive you as her guest.' Arthur looked confused. "'I didn't know there was a castle in these parts. "'We must have ridden further than we thought in the fog.' Urians looked suspicious, but Morgaine could see the familiar spell of the fairy lands falling over Arthur, so that it never occurred to him to question. As in a dream, whatever happened simply happened, and there was no need to question. But she must keep her wits about her. Queen Morgaine, said one of the men, the dark, beautiful people who seemed like ancestors or dream versions of the little dark people of Avalon. Our queen awaits and will gladly receive you. And you, my lord Arthur, you shall be taken to feast with us. After all this riding in fog, a feast will be welcome, said Arthur good-naturedly, and let the man lead his horse into the woods. Do you know the queen of these lands, Morgaine? 
I have known her since I was a young girl. And she mocked me and offered to rear my babe in the fairy world. It's surprising that she came never to Camelot to offer allegiance, Arthur said, frowning. I cannot remember, but it seems to me that I heard something of the castle chariot a long, long time ago. But I cannot quite remember, he said, dismissing it. Well, in any case, these people seem to be friendly. Give my compliments to the Queen, Morgane, and no doubt I shall see her at this feast. No doubt, Morgane said, and watch the men lead him away. I must keep my wits about me. I will use the beat of my heart to count the time. I will not lose track, or I shall be carried away and entangled in my own spells. She braced herself to meet with the Queen. Unchanged she was, always the same, the tall woman who, nevertheless, had something of the look of Vivian about her, as if she and Morgane were blood kin, and she embraced and kissed her as such. What brings you of your free will to our shores, Morgane of the fairies? she asked. Your knight is here. One of my ladies found him. And she gestured, and Acolon was there. They found him wandering along the reeds of the lake, not knowing his way in the fog. Acolon gripped Morgane's hand. She felt it solid and real in hers. Yet she knew not even now whether they were within or out of doors, whether the glass throne of the queen was within a magnificent grove or within a great vaulted hall more magnificent than the hall of the round table at Camelot. Acolon knelt before the throne, and the queen pressed her hands on his head. She raised one of his wrists, and the serpent seemed to move and twine round his arms, crawling away, and sat there in the queen's palm, where she sat absently playing with them, petting their small blue darting heads. Morgane! Morgane, you have chosen well, she said. I think not that this one would ever betray me. Look, Arthur has feasted well, and there he lies. And she gestured to where a wall seemed to open wide, and by pale light Morgane saw Arthur, sleeping with one arm under his head, and the other across the body of a young girl with long dark hair, who seemed like a daughter of the queen, or like Morgane herself. He will, of course, think that it was you, and that it is a dream sent him by the evil one, said the queen, smiling. So far he has moved from us that he will think shame to be given his dearest wish. Did you not know that, my Morgane, my darling? And it seemed to Morgane that she heard Vivian's voice, dreamlike, caressing her. But it was the queen who said, so sleeps the king in the arms of one he will love until he dies. And what when he wakes? Will you take Excalibur and cast him out naked on the shores, seeking you always in the mists? Morgane remembered suddenly the skeleton of a horse lying beneath the fairy trees. Not that, she said, shivering. Then he shall remain here. But if he is truly as pious as you say, and thinks to say the prayers which will part him from illusion, it will vanish, and he will call out for his horse and for his sword. What then shall we do, lady? Acolon said grimly, I will have the sword, and if he can get it again from me, he is welcome to it. The dark-haired maiden came to them and in her hand she held Excalibur in its scabbard. I had it from him while he slept, she said, and with it he called me by your name. Morgane touched the jeweled hilt of the blade. Bethink you, child, said the queen, would it not be better to return the holy regalia at once to Avalon, and let Acolon make his way as king with only such a sword as he can get for himself? Morgane trembled. It seemed very dark in the hall, or grove, 
or whatever it was. And did Arthur lie sleeping at her feet, or was he far away? But it was Acolon who reached out and grasped the sword. I will have Excalibur and the scabbard, he said. And Morgay knelt at his feet and belted it round his waist. Be it so, beloved. Bear it more faithfully than he for whom I made this scabbard. The goddess forbid I should ever be false to you, though I die for it, he whispered, his voice shaking with emotion, and raised Morgaine to her feet and kissed her. It seemed that they clung together till the shadow of the night faded and the queen's sweet, mocking smile seemed to shimmer around them. When Arthur calls for a sword, he shall have one and something like to the scabbard, though it will not keep him from spilling a single drop of blood. Give it to my smiths, she said to the maiden, and Morgaine stared as if in a dream. Had it been in a dream that she had belted Excalibur round Acolon's waist? The queen was gone, and the damsel, and it seemed that she and Acolon lay alone in a great grove, and that it was the time of the Beltane fires and he took her into his arms, priest to priestess. And then they were no more than man and woman, and it seemed to her that time stopped, that her body melted into his, as if she were without nerve or bone or will, and his kiss was like fire and ice on her lips. The king's stag should challenge him, and I must make him ready. Why? How was it that she lay with him in the grove, signs painted on her naked body? How was it that her body was young and tender? How was it that when he bore his body down into hers, there was tearing pain, as if he took again the maidenhead she had laid down to the horned one half a lifetime gone, so that she came maiden to him, as if all her life had never been? Why did it seem that there was a shadow of the antlers over his brow? Who was this man in her arms, and what had time been between them? He lay heavy across her, spent, the sweetness of his breath like honey to her love. She caressed him and kissed him, and as he moved a little away from her, she hardly knew who he was, whether the hair that brushed her face was shining with gold or dark and it seemed that the little snakes crawled gently down her breasts, which were pink and tender, and almost childish, half-formed. The tiny blue serpents twined around her nipples, and she felt a thrill of exquisite pain and pleasure at the touch. And then she knew that, if indeed she wished it, time would return and twist upon itself, and she could go forth from that cave on that morning with Arthur, and use her power to bind him to her for ever, and none of it would ever have been. And then she heard Arthur calling out for his sword and crying out against these enchantments, very far away and small, as if she was seeing him from mid-air. She watched him waken, and she knew that her destiny, past and future, was in his hands. If he could face what had been between them, if he called her name and begged her to come to him, if he could admit to himself that it was only she that he had loved all these years, and that none other had ever come between them. Then should Lancelot have Guinevere, and then should I be queen in Avalon, but queen with a child for a consort, and he would fall in his turn to the king's stag. This time Arthur wouldn't turn from her in horror at what they had done, she wouldn't thrust him away with childish tears. It seemed for a moment that all the world waited, echoing for what Arthur would say. He spoke, and it seemed to ring like the knell of doom through all the world of fairy, as if the very fabric of time trembled and the weight of years fell. Jesus and Mary, defend me from all evil, he said. This is some wicked enchantment wrought by my sister and her witchcraft. He shuddered and called out, Bring me my sword. 
Morgaine felt it like a tearing pain in her heart. She reached out to Acolon, and again it seemed that there was the shadow of antlers above his brow. And once again Excalibur was belted about his waist. Had it always been there? And the serpents that had twined about her naked body were only fading blue stains about the man's wrists. She said steadily, Look, they are bringing him a sword which is like to Excalibur. The fairy smiths have made it this night. Let him go, if you can. But if you cannot, well, do what you must do, beloved. And the goddess be with you. I will await you in Camelot when you come thither in triumph. And she kissed him and sent him from her. Never till this moment had she faced it fully. One of them must die, brother or lover. The child she had held in her arms. The horned one who had been lover and priest and king. Whatever comes of this day, she thought, never again. Never again shall I know a moment's happiness, since one of those I love must die. Arthur and Acolon had gone where she couldn't follow. There were still Urians to be considered, and for a moment she considered abandoning him to the fairy realm. He would wander contentedly in the enchanted halls and woods till he died. No, there has been enough death, whatever happens. Morgaine thought, and turned her thoughts to watch Urien's where he lay dreaming. Now he sat up as she approached him, looking happily drunken and befuddled. The wine here is too strong for me, he said. Where have you been, my dear, and where is Arthur? Even now, she thought, the fairy maiden has brought Arthur the sword so like Excalibur that in enchantment he will believe it so. Ah, oh, goddess, I should have sent the sword back to Avalon. Why must anyone else die for it? But without Excalibur, there was no way Acolon could reign as the new king from Avalon. When I am queen, this land shall be at peace, and the minds of men free, with no priests to tell them what they must do and believe. Arthur has had to go on ahead of us, she said gently. Come, my dear husband. We must return to Camelot. Such was the enchantment of the fairy country, she realised, that he never questioned this. Horses were brought to them, and the tall, beautiful people escorted them to a place where one of them said, You can surely find your way from here. How quickly the sunlight has gone, Urians complained as a grey fog and rain seemed to condense suddenly and fall about them. More gain. How long were we in the Queen's country? I feel as if I'd been sick of a fever, or enchanted and wandering in a spell. She didn't answer him. He too, she thought, had had some sport with the fairy maidens. And why not? She cared not how he amused himself, so that he let her alone. A sharp twinge of sickness reminded her that never once in the fairy country had she thought of the pregnancy which burdened her. And now when all would be awaiting her word, when Gwydion took the throne and Acolon reigned. Now she would be heavy of foot and sick, grotesque. Certainly she was too old to bear a child without risk. Was it too late to find the herbs that would rid her of that unwanted burden? Yet, if she could bear Acolon a son at this time when the rain went into his hands, how much more would he value her as his queen? Could she sacrifice that hold over him? A child I could keep. A child I could hold in my own arms. A babe to love. She could still remember the sweetness of Arthur as a babe, his little arms around her neck. Gwydion had been taken from her. Uwain had been nine years old when he learned to call her mother. It was a sharp pain, and a sweetness beyond love tugging at her body the hunger to hold a child again. Yet reason told her that she couldn't, at her age, survive the bearing of another child. She rode at Urien's side as if in a dream. No, she couldn't survive the bearing of this child. 
and yet she felt she couldn't bear to take the irrevocable step that it should die unborn. My hands would already be stained with the blood of one I love. Oh, goddess, why do you try me thus? And it seemed that the goddess wavered before her eyes, now like the fairy queen, now like raven, solemn and compassionate, now like the great sow who had torn out Avaloch's life. And she will devour the child I bear. Morgaine knew that she was at the edges of delirium, of madness. Later. I will decide it later. Now my duty is to get Urians back to Camelot. She wondered how long she had been in the fairy world. Not, she supposed, more than a moon, or the child would make its presence more felt. She hoped it had been only a few days. Not too few, or Guinevere would wonder how they had come and gone so swiftly. Not too many, or it would be too late to do what she knew she must do. She could not bear this child and live. They arrived in Camelot at mid-morning. The journey was, in truth, not very long. Morgaine was grateful that Guinevere was nowhere to be seen. And when Kai asked after Arthur, she told him, lying this time without a moment's hesitation, that he had been delayed in Tintagel. If I can kill, lying is no sin so great, she thought, distracted. But somehow she felt contaminated by the lie. She was priestess of Avalon, and she valued the truth of her words. She took Urians to his room. The old man was looking weary now and confused. He is growing too old to reign. Avaloch's death was harder for him than I can know. But he too was reared to the truths of Avalon. What of the king stag when the young stag is grown? Lie down here, my husband, and rest, she said. But he was fractious. I should set out for Wales. Acolon is too young to reign alone, the young puppy. My people need me. They can spare you another day, she soothed him, and you will be stronger. I have been too long away already, he fretted. And why did we not go on to Tintagio? Morgaine, I cannot remember why we came away. Were we truly in a country where the sun shone always? She said, I think you must have dreamed it. Why do you not sleep a little? Shall I send for some food for you? I don't think you have eaten this morning. But when the food came, the sight and smell of it turned her queasy again. She turned sharply away, trying to conceal it, but Urians had seen. What is it, Morgaine? Nothing, she said angrily. Eat and rest. But he smiled at her, reaching out his hand to draw her to the bedside. He said, You forget. I have been married before this. I knew a breeding woman when I see one. Clearly he was delighted. After all these many years, again you are pregnant. But that is wonderful. One son is taken from me, but I have another. Shall we call this one Avaloch, if it is a son, my darling? Morgaine flinched. You forget how old I am, she said, and her face was like stone. It isn't likely I can carry this child long enough that it would live. Do not hope for a son of your old age. But we will take good care of you, said Urians. You must consult with one of the Queen's own midwives, and if the ride home would make you likely to miscarry, then you must stay here till the child is born. She wanted to lash out at him. What makes you think it would be your child, old man? This was Acalon's child, certainly. But she couldn't dismiss the sudden fear that this was indeed Urian's child. An old man's child, weakly, some monster like Kevin. No, she was surely mad. Kevin was no monster, but had suffered injuries. Fire, 
burns, maiming in childhood, so that his bones had grown awry. But Urien's child would surely be twisted, deformed, sickly. And Acalon's child would be healthy, strong. And she, she was old, almost past childbearing. Would her child be some monster? Sometimes when women bore babies in their old age, it was so. Was she mad to let these fantasies turn and sicken her brain like this? No, she didn't want to die, and there was no hope she could bear this child and live. Somehow she must come by the herbs. But how? She had no confidant at court. None of Guinevere's women could she trust enough to get her these things. And if it somehow became court gossip that old Queen Morgaine was pregnant by her still older husband, how they would laugh. There was Kevin, the Merlin, but she herself had turned him away, flung his love and loyalty back in his face. Well, there must be midwives at court, and perhaps she could bribe one of them well enough to stop her mouth. She would tell some pitiful tale of how hard Gwydion's birth had been, how she feared at her age to bear another. They were women. They would understand that well enough. And in her own bag of herbs she had one or two things. Mixed with a third, harmless in itself, they would have the effect she wanted. She wouldn't be the first woman, even at court, to rid herself of an unwanted child. But she must do it secretly, or Urians would never forgive her. In the name of the goddess, what did it matter? By the time it could come to light, she would be queen here at Arthur's... No at Acalon's side, and Urians would be in Wales, or dead, or in hell. She left Urians sleeping, and tiptoed from the room. She found one of the Queen's midwives, asked her for the third and harmless herb, and returning to her room, mixed the potion over her fire. She knew it would make her deathly ill, but there was no help for it. The herb mixture was bitter as gall. She drank it down, grimacing, washed the cup, and put it away. If only she could know what was happening in the fairy country. If only she could know how her lover fared with Excalibur. She felt nauseated, but she was too restless to lie down on her bed beside Urian's. She couldn't bear to be alone with a sleeping man nor could she bear to close her eyes for fear of the pictures of death and blood that would torment her. After a time, she took her distaff and spindle and went down into the Queen's Hall, where she knew the women, Queen Guinevere and her ladies, even more gauze of Lothian, would be at their eternal spinning and weaving. She had never lost her distaste for spinning, but she would keep her wits about her, and it was better than being alone. And if it opened her to the sight, well, at least she would be free of the torment of not knowing what befell the two she loved on the borders of the fairy country. Guinevere welcomed her with a chilly embrace and invited her to a seat near the fire and Guinevere's own chair. What are you working at? Morgaine asked, examining Guinevere's fine tapestry work. The queen proudly spread it out before her, it is a hanging for the altar of the church. See, here is the Virgin Mary, with the angel come to tell her she will bear the Son of God. And there stands Joseph, all in amazement. See, I have made him old, old with a long beard. If I were old as Joseph, and my promised wife told me, after being closeted with such a handsome young man as yonder angel, that she were with child... I would ask myself some questions about the angel, Morgaul said irreverently. For the first time, Morgaine wondered how miraculous had that virgin birth been after all. Who knew but the mother of Jesus had been ready to conceal her pregnancy with a clever tale of angels? But after all, in all religions but that one, for a maiden to be pregnant by a god was nothing so strange. I myself, she thought, at the edge of hysteria, 
taking a handful of carded wool and beginning to twirl the spindle. I myself gave up my maidenhood to the horned one and bore a son to the king's stag. Will Gwydion set me on a throne in heaven as mother of God? You are so irreverent, Morgors, Guinevere complained, and Morgaine quickly complimented Guinevere on the fineness of her stitches and asked who had drawn the pattern for the picture. I drew it myself, said Guinevere, surprising Morgaine. She had never believed Guinevere had talents of this sort. Father Patricius has promised, too, that he will teach me to copy letters in gold and crimson, the Queen said. He says I have a good hand at it for a woman. I never thought I could do so, Morgaine. And yet you made that fine scabbard Arthur wears. He told me that you broidered it for him with your own hands. It's very beautiful. Guinevere chattered on as artlessly as a girl half her age. I have offered to make him one many times. I was offended that a Christian king should bear the symbols of heathendom, but he said it was made for him by his own dear, beloved sister, and he would never lay it aside. And indeed, it is beautiful work. Did you have gold threads made for it in Avalon? Our smiths do beautiful work, said Morgaine, and their work in silver and gold cannot be bettered. The spindle's twirling made her sick. How long would it be before the wrenching sickness of the drug would seize on her? The room was close and seemed to smell of the stuffy, airless lives these women led, spinning and weaving and sewing, endless work, so that men might be clothed. One of Guinevere's ladies was heavily pregnant and sat sewing on infant swaddling cloths. Another stitched an embroidered border to a heavy cloak for father, or brother, or husband, or son. And there was Guinevere's fine stitchery for the altar, the diversion of a queen who could have other women to sew and spin and weave for her. Round and round went the spindle. The reel sank toward the floor, and she twisted the thread smoothly. When had she learned to do this work? She couldn't even remember a time when she couldn't spin a smooth thread. One of her earliest memories was of sitting on the castle wall at Tintagel, beside Morgors, spinning. And even then her thread had been more even than her aunt's, who was ten years her senior. She said so to Morgors, and the older woman laughed. You spun finer thread than I when you were seven years old. Round and round went the spindle, sinking slowly toward the stone floor. Then she wound the thread up on her distaff, and meanwhile twisted a fresh handful of wool. As she spun out the thread, so she spun the lives of men. Was it any wonder that one of the visions of the goddess was a woman spinning? From the time a man comes into the world, we spin his baby clothes, till we at last spin a shroud. Without us, the lives of men would be naked indeed. It seemed to her that as in the kingdom of fairy, she had looked through a great opening and seen Arthur asleep at the side of a maiden with her own face. So now a great space opened out as if it were before her, and as the reel sank to the floor and the thread twisted, it seemed to spin out Arthur's face as he wandered, sword in hand. And now he whirled, to see Acalon bearing Excalibur. Ah, they were fighting... She couldn't see their faces now, nor hear the words they flung at one another. How fiercely they fought, and it seemed strange to Morgaine, watching, dizzied, as the spindle sank, twirled, rose, that she couldn't hear the clashing of the great swords. Arthur brought down a great blow that would surely have killed Acalon had it struck him fair, but Acalon caught the blow on his shield and only took a wound in the leg and the wound sliced without blood, while Arthur, taking a glancing blow on the shoulder, began suddenly to bleed, crimson streaks flowing down his arm. And he looked startled, afraid, one hand going in a swift gesture of reassurance to his side where the scabbard hung. But it was the sham scabbard, wavering even now in Morgaine's sight. 
Now the two were mortally locked together, struggling. Their swords locked at the hilt as they grappled with their free hands for the advantage. Acolon twisted fiercely, and the sword in Arthur's hand, the false Excalibur made by fairy enchantments in a single night, broke off close below the hilt. She saw Arthur twist round in desperate avoidance of the killing blow and kick out violently. Acolon crumpled up in agony. And Arthur snatched the real Excalibur from his hand and flung it as far away as he could, then leapt on the fallen man and wrenched at the scabbard. As soon as he had it in his hand, the flow of blood from the great wound in his arm ceased to bleed, and in turn, blood gushed forth from the wound in Acolon's thigh. Excruciating pain stabbed through Morgane's whole body. She doubled up with the weight of it. Morgain," said Morgaw sharply, with a catch of breath. Then called out, "Queen Morgain is ill. Come, tend to her." Morgain," Guinevere cried out, "What is it?" The vision was gone. However, she tried. She couldn't see the two men, nor which had prevailed, whether one of them lay dead. It was as if a great dark curtain had closed over them. With the ringing of church bells. In the last instant of the vision, she had seen two litters carrying the wounded men into the abbey at Glastonbury, where she couldn't follow. She clung to the edges of her chair as Guinevere came with one of her ladies, who knelt to raise Morgaine's head. Oh, look! Your gown is soaked with blood. This is not any ordinary bleeding. Morgaine. Her mouth dry with the sickness, whispered, "No, I was with child, and I am miscarrying. Eurians will be angry with me." One of the women, a plump, jolly one about her own age, said, "For shame! So his lordship of Wales will be angry, will he? Well, well, well! And who chose him for God? You should have kept the old billy goat out of your bed, lady." It is dangerous for a woman to miscarry at your age. Shame on the old lecher to put you so at risk. So he will be angry, will he? Guinevere, her hostility forgotten, walked beside Morgaine as they carried her, rubbing her hands, all sympathy. Oh, poor Morgaine! What a sad thing! When you had hoped all over again. I know all too well how terrible it must be for you, my poor sister," she repeated, holding Morgaine's cold hands, cradling her shaking head when she vomited in the ghastly sickness that overcame her. I have sent for Broca; she is the most skilled of the court midwives. She will look after you, poor dear. It seemed that Guinevere's sympathy would choke her, racked by repeated agonizing pains. She felt as if a sword had thrust through her vitals, but even so, even so, it wasn't so bad as Gwydion's birth had been, and she had lived through that. Shaking, retching, she tried to cling to consciousness, to be aware of what was going on around her. Maybe she'd been ready to miscarry anyhow. It was surely too quick for the drug to have worked. Broca came, examined her. Smelled at the vomited stuff, and raised her eyebrows knowingly. She said in an undertone to Morgain, "Lady, you should have taken more care. Those drugs can poison you. I have a brew which would have done what you wanted more quickly and with less sickness. Don't worry, I won't speak to Urians. If he has no more sense than to let a woman of your years try to bear him a child." Then what he doesn't know will do him no harm. Morgaine let the sickness take her. She knew after a time that she was more gravely ill than they had thought. Guinevere was asking if at last she wanted to see a priest. She shook her head and closed her eyes, lying silent and rebellious, not caring now whether she lived or died. Since Acolon or Arthur must die. She too would go into that shadow. Why couldn't she see them where they lay within Glastonbury? Which of them would come forth? Surely the priests would tend Arthur, 
their own Christian king. But would they leave Acolon to die? If Acolon must go into the shades, let him go with the spirit of his son to attend him, she thought, and lay with tears sliding down her face, hearing in some distant place the voice of the old midwife broke her. Yes, it's over. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but you know as well as I that she is too old to bear children. Yes, my lord, come and see. The voice was harsh with asperity. Men never think of what they do, and all the bloody mess women have for men's pleasure. No, it was all too soon to tell whether it would have been a boy or not. But she had had one fine son. I don't know she would have borne you another, had she been strong enough and young enough to carry it. This ends Disc 4. The Prisoner in the Oak. Disc 5. Morgane, dearest, look at me, Urians pleaded. I'm so sorry, so sorry you are ill, but don't grieve, my darling. I still have two sons. I don't blame you. Oh, you don't, do you? said the old midwife, still truculent. You had better not speak one word of blame to her, Your Majesty. She's still very weak and sick. We will have another bed put in here so she may sleep in peace till she's quite well again. Here. And Morgane felt a comforting woman's arm under her head, something warm and comforting held to her lips. Come, dear, drink this now. It has honey in it and medicines to keep you from bleeding any more. I know you're sick, but try to drink it anyhow. There's a good girl. Morgane swallowed the bittersweet drink, tears blurring her vision. For a moment it seemed that she was a child, that Igrain held her and comforted her in some childish sickness. Mother, she said. And even as she spoke, knew it was delirium, that Igrain had been dead for half a lifetime, that she was no child or maiden, but old, old. Too old to lie here in this ugly way, and so near death. No, Your Majesty, she doesn't know what she's saying. There, there, dear, you just lie still and try to sleep. We've got hot bricks on your feet, and you'll be warm in a minute. Soothed, Morgane floated away into dream. Now it seemed that she was a child again in Avalon, in the House of Maidens, and that Vivian was speaking to her telling her something she couldn't quite remember, something of how the goddess spun the lives of men, and she handed Morgane a spindle and bade her spin, but the thread wouldn't come smooth, but tangled and knotted, and at last Vivian, angry with her, said, Here, give it to me. And she handed over the broken threads and the spindle. Only it wasn't Vivian either, but the face of the goddess, threatening, and she was very small, very small, spinning and spinning with fingers too small to hold the distaff, and the goddess bore the face of Igraine. She came to awareness a day or two later, cool-headed, but with a vast and empty ache in her body. She laid her hands over the soreness and thought grimly, I might have saved myself some pain. I should have known that I was ready to miscarry anyway. Well, done is done. And now I must ready myself to hear that Arthur is dead. I must think what I will do when Acolon returns. Guinevere shall go into a nunnery, or if she wishes to go beyond the seas to less Britain with Lancelot, I will not stop them. She rose and dressed herself, made herself beautiful. You should keep your bed, Morgane. You're still so pale, said Urians. No. There are strange tidings coming, my husband, and we must be ready for them, she said, and went on braiding her hair with scarlet ribbons and gems. Urian stood at the window and said, Look, her companions are practising their military games. Owain, I think, is the best rider. Come, my dear, does he not ride as well as Gawain? And that is Galahad at his side. 
Morgain, don't grieve for the child you lost. Uwain will always think of you as his mother. I told you when we were wedded, I would never reproach you for barrenness. I would have welcomed another child, but since it was not to be, well, we have nothing to grieve for. And, he said shyly, taking her hand, perhaps it is better so. I did not realize how near I had come to losing you. She stood at the window, his arm about her waist, feeling at one and the same time a feeling of revulsion and a gratitude for his kindness. He need never know, she thought, that it had been Acolon's son. Let him take pride that in his old age he could father a child. Look, said Uriens, craning his neck to see further. What is that coming through the gate? A rider, together with a monk in a dark habit on a mule, and a horse bearing a body. Come, she said, pulling at his hand. We must go down now. Pale and silent, she moved at his side into the courtyard, feeling herself tall and commanding as befitted a queen. It seemed that time stopped, as if they were again in the fairy country. Why was not Arthur with them if he had triumphed? But if this was Arthur's dead body, where was the ceremony and pomp on the death of a king? Uriens reached to support her with his arm, but she thrust it away, and stood clinging to the wood-framed door. The monk put back his hood and said, Are you Queen Morgane of Wales? I am, she said. I have then a message for you, he said. Your brother Arthur lies wounded in Glastonbury, nursed by the sisters there. But he will recover. He sends you this. He waved his hand at the shrouded figure on the pack horse. As a present, and he bid me say to you that he has his sword Excalibur and the scabbard. And as he spoke, he twitched away the pall covering the body, and Morgane, all the strength in her body running out of her like water, saw Acolon's sightless eyes staring at the sky. Urians cried out, a great cry like death. Uwain thrust his way through the crowd around the steps and as his father fell, stricken, across the body of his son, Owain caught and supported him. Father, dear father, ah, oh, dear God, Acolon, he said with a gasp, and stepped toward the horse where Acolon's body lay. Go in, my friend, give my father your arm. I must see to my mother, she is fainting. No, said Morgane. No. She heard her own voice like an echo, not even sure what she wanted to deny. She would have rushed to Acolon, flung herself on his body, shrieking in despair and grief. But Uwain held her tight. Guinevere appeared on the stairway. Someone explained the situation to her in a whisper. And Guinevere came down the steps, looking at Acolon. He died in rebellion against the High King, she said clearly. Let there be no Christian rites for him. Let his body be flung to the ravens, and his head hung on the wall as a traitor. No, oh no, cried out Urians, wailing. I beg of you, I beg, Queen Guinevere, you know me, one of your most loyal subjects, and my poor boy has paid for his crimes. I beg you, lady, Jesus too died a common criminal between thieves, and even for the thief on the cross at his side there was mercy. Show the mercy he would have shown. Guinevere seemed not to hear. How does my lord Arthur? He is recovering, lady, but he has lost much blood, said the strange monk. Yet he bade you have no fear. He will recover. Guinevere sighed. King Urians, she said. For the sake of our good knight, Uwain, I will do as you wish. Let the body of Acolon be borne to the chapel, and there laid in state. Morgane found her voice to protest. No, Guinevere. Lay him in earth decently, 
if you can find it in your heart to do so much. But he was no Christian. Do not give him Christian burial. Urien's is so filled with grief he knows not what he says. Be still, mother, said Uwain, gripping her shoulder hard. For my sake and my father's bring no scandal here. If Acolon served not the Christ, then has he all the more need of God's mercy against the traitor's death he should have had. Morgaine wanted to protest, but her voice wouldn't obey her. She let Owain guide her indoors, but once within the door she threw off his arm and walked alone. She felt frozen and lifeless. Only a few hours gone, it seemed to her, she had lain in Acolon's arms in the fairy country, had belted the sword Excalibur at his waist. Now she stood knee-deep in a relentless tide, watching it all swept away from her again, and the world was filled with the accusing eyes of Owain and his father. Aye, I know it was you who plotted this treachery, said Owain, but I have no pity for Acolon, who let himself be led astray by a woman. Have decency enough, mother, not to drag my father any further into your wicked schemes against our king. He glared at her, then turned to his father, who stood as if dazed, clutching at some piece of furniture. Owain put the old man into a chair, knelt, and kissed his hand. Father, dear, I am still at your side. Oh, my son, my son! Urians cried out, despairing. Rest here. Father, you must be strong, he said. But now, let me care for my mother. She is ill, too. Your mother, you call her? Urians cried out, starting upright and staring at Morgaine with implacable wrath. Never again let me hear you call that abominable woman mother. Do you think I know not that by her sorcery she led my good son into rebellion against his king? And now I think by her evil witchcraft she must also have contrived the death of Avaloch. Aye, and of that other son she should have borne to me. Three sons of mine has she sent down into death. Look out that she does not seduce you and betray you with her witchcraft into death and destruction. No, she is not your mother. Father, my lord, Uwain protested, and held out a hand to Morgaine. Forgive him, mother. He doesn't know what he's saying. You are beside yourselves with grief, both of you. I beg you in God's name to be calm. We have had enough grief this day. But Morgaine hardly heard him. This man... This husband she had never wanted. He was all that was left of the wreck of her plans. She should have left him to die in the fairy country, but now he was doddering around in the fullness of his useless old life, and Acolon was dead. Acolon, who sought to bring back all that his father had pledged and forsworn, all that Arthur had vowed to Avalon and forsaken, and nothing was left but this ancient dotard. She snatched the sickle knife of Avalon from her girdle and thrust away Uwain's restraining arms. Rushing forward, she raised the dagger high. She hardly knew what it was she meant to do as it flashed down. An iron grip caught her wrist, wrenching at the dagger. Uwain's hand came near to breaking her wrist as she struggled. No, let it go. Mother, he pleaded. Mother, is the devil in you? Mother, look, it is only father. Ah, oh, God, can you not show some pity for his grief? He does not mean to accuse you. He is so miserable, he doesn't know what he's saying. In his right mind, he will know that what he says is wild nonsense. I do not accuse you either. Mother, mother, listen to me. Give me the dagger. Dear mother. The repeated cries of, Mother, and the love and anguish in Uwain's voice, finally reached down through the mist that blurred Morgaine's eyes and mind. She let Uwain wrench away the little knife, noticing, as if from a thousand leagues away, 
that there was blood on her fingers where the razor edge of the sickle had cut her as they struggled. His hand was cut too, and he put his finger in his mouth and sucked at it as if he had been ten years old. Father dear, forgive her, Uwain begged, bending over Urians who lay white as death. She is distraught. She loved my brother too. And remember how ill she has been. She shouldn't have left her bed today at all. Mother, let me send for your women to take you back to bed. Here, you will want this, he said, pressing the sickle back into her hand. I know you had it from your own foster mother, the Lady of Avalon. You told me that when I was just a little boy. Ah, oh, poor little mother, he said, encircling her shoulders with his arms. She could remember when she had been taller than he, when he was a thin little boy with bones as small and green as a bird's. And now he towered over her, holding her gently against him. Mother dearest, my poor little mother, come now, come, don't cry. I know you loved Acalon just as you loved me. Poor mother. Morgaine wished that she could cry indeed, that she could let all this terrible grief and despair rush out of her with tears, as she felt Uwain's hot tears falling on her own forehead. Urian's too stood weeping, but she stood tearless and cold. The world seemed all grey, crumbling at the edges, and everything she looked on seemed to take on some giant menacing shape, and yet to be very small and far away, as if she could pick it up like a toy. She dared not move, lest it should fall to bits at her touch. She hardly knew it when her women came. They took her stiff and unresisting body and lifted her and carried her to bed. They took off the queenly crown and the gown she had put on for her triumph. And distantly she knew that her shift and underlinen were soaked again with blood, but it seemed not to matter. A long time after she came to herself and knew that she was washed and clean and dressed in a clean shift and lying in bed beside Urian's with one of her women drowsing on a stool at her side. She raised herself a little and looked down at the sleeping man, his face sunken and reddened with weeping, and it was as if she looked on a stranger. Yes, he had been good to her in his own way. But now that is all past, and my work in his land is done. I will never see his face again while I live, nor know where he lies in death. Acalon was dead, and her plans in ruins. Arthur still bore the sword Excalibur, and the enchanted scabbard which gave him a charmed life. And since the one to whom she had entrusted that task had failed her, escaping into death where she couldn't follow, then she herself must be the hand of Avalon to strike him down. Moving so silently that she wouldn't have wakened a sleeping bird, she put on her clothes and tied the dagger of Avalon at her waist. She left all the fine gowns and jewels that Urians had given her, wrapping herself in her plainest dark robe, not unlike the dress of a priestess. She found her little bag of herbs and medicines, and in the dark, by touch, she painted her brow with the dark moon. Then she took the plainest cloak she could find, not her own, embroidered with gold thread and precious stones, but a servant's rough hooded wrap, and stole noiselessly down the stairs. From the chapel she heard the sounds of chanting. Somehow Owain had arranged this over Acolon's body. Well, it didn't matter. Acolon was free. What did it matter what mummery the priests made with the tenantless clay? Nothing mattered now but reclaiming the sword of Avalon. She turned her back on the chapel. One day she would have leisure to mourn him. Now she must carry on where he had failed. She went silently into the stable and found her horse, managing to bind on the saddle with clumsy hands. She led the animal to the small side gate. She was almost too dizzy to climb into the saddle. 
and for a moment she sat swaying, wondering if she would fall. Should she wait, or try to summon Kevin to attend her? The Merlin of Britain was vowed to follow the will of the lady. But she couldn't trust Kevin either. He had betrayed Vivian into the hands of those priests who now chanted their hymns over Acolon's helpless body. She whispered to the horse, felt him break into a trot beneath her, and from the foot of the hill turned back to look her last on Camelot. I shall come here but once again in this life, and then there will no longer be a Camelot to which I might return. And even as she whispered the words, she wondered what they meant. As often as Morgaine had travelled to Avalon, she had only once set foot upon the Isle of the Priests. Glastonbury Abbey, where Vivian lay buried, Andy Green, too, had spent her last years, was a stranger journey to her than the crossing of the mists into the hidden lands. There was a ferry there, and she gave the ferryman a small coin to row her across the lake, wondering what the man would do if she suddenly rose as she would do with the Avalon barge and cast the spell that would lead it into the mists and bring it forth in Avalon. But she did not. Is it only that I cannot, she asked herself. The air was cool and fresh in the hour just before sunrise. Overhead, the sound of church bells was soft and clear, and Morgaine could see a long line of grey-robed forms pacing slowly toward the church. The brothers rose early to pray and chant their soft hymns, and for a moment Morgaine stood quiet, listening. Her mother and Arthur's lay buried there. Vivian, too, had been laid to rest within the sound of those hymns, the musician in Morgaine, always quickly moved, listened to the soft song borne on the early morning breeze, and for a moment she stood motionless, tears burning her eyes. Was she planning outrage on this holy soil? Let it go. Let there be peace among you, children. It seemed that it was Egraine's forgotten voice murmuring to her. Now all the grey forms were within the church. She had heard much of the abbey here. She knew there was a brotherhood of monks, and at some distance from them, a house of nuns where women dwelt, vowed to be virgins of the Christ till they died. Morgaine wrinkled her face in distaste. A god who chose to keep men and women with their thoughts on heaven rather than on this world, which had been given to them for learning and growing in spirit, seemed alien to her. And now that she actually saw men and women mingling this way in worship, with no thought of any other touch or communication, she felt sickened. Oh yes, there were holy virgins in Avalon. She herself had been secluded that way till the proper time, and Raven had given not only her body, but her very voice to the goddess for her use. There was her own foster daughter, Lancelot's daughter, Nimue, who had been selected by Raven to dwell unseen in solitude. But the goddess recognised that this was a rare choice, not one to be imposed on every woman who sought to serve her. Morgaine didn't believe what some of her companions in Avalon had said, that monks and nuns merely pretended holiness and chastity to impress the peasants with their purity, and behind the closed doors of their monasteries did whatever wantonness they would. Yes, she would have despised that. Those who had chosen to serve spirit rather than flesh should do so in truth. Hypocrisy was always disgusting. But the knowledge that they really lived that way, that any force calling itself divine could prefer barrenness to fruitfulness, that seemed to her a terrible betrayal of the very forces which gave life to the world. Fools and worse, narrowing their lives, and thus wishing to narrow all other lives to their own mean compass. But she mustn't linger here. She turned her back on the church bells and stole toward the guest house, her mind reaching out, calling on the sight to lead her to where Arthur lay. There were three women in the guest house, one dozing beside the door, another stirring a kettle of gruel in the kitchen at the back, 
and yet a third at the door of the room where, very dimly, she could feel Arthur's presence. He was deep in slumber. But the women in their sombre robes and veils stirred as she came. They were holy women in their own way, and they had something very like the sight. In her presence, they could sense something inimical to their lives. The touch, perhaps, of the strangeness of Avalon. One of them rose and confronted her, asking in a whisper, Who are you? And why have you come here at this hour? I am Queen Morgaine of North Wales and Cornwall, Morgaine said in her low, commanding voice, and I am here to see my brother. Will you dare to forbid me? She held the woman's gaze, then waved her hand in the simplest of the spells she had been taught to dominate and the woman sank back, unable to speak or forbid her. Later, she knew, the woman would tell a tale of enchantments and of fear. But in truth, it was no more than this, the simple domination of a powerful will over one which had been given up, deliberately, to submission. A soft light burned inside the room, and by its dimness Morgaine could see Arthur, unshaven, haggard, his fair hair darkened with sweat. The scabbard was lying on the foot of his bed. He must have anticipated some such action on her part. He wouldn't let it out of his reach. And in his hand he held the hilt of Excalibur. Somehow, somehow his mind gave him warning. Morgaine was filled with dismay. He had the sight too. Though he looked so fair and unlike the dark people of Britain, he too was of the ancient royal line of Avalon, and he could reach her thoughts. She knew that if she reached out to take Excalibur from his hand, he would sense her intent, would wake, and he would kill her. She had no illusions about that. He was a good Christian, or so he thought himself, but he had been set on the throne to kill his enemies, and in some mystical way Morgaine only half understood, the sword Excalibur had grown entangled with the very soul and spirit of Arthur's kingship. If it hadn't been so, if it had only been a sword, then would he have been willing to render it back to Avalon, and had another made for himself, a stronger sword, and a better? But Excalibur had become for him the visible and ultimate symbol of what he was as king. Or perhaps it is the sword itself which has entangled itself with Arthur's soul and kingship, and will kill me of its own will, should I seek to take it from him. And dare I set myself against the will of such a magical symbol? Morgaine started, and told herself not to be fanciful. She laid her hand on her dagger. It was razor sharp, and she could move, when she must, as swiftly as a striking snake. She could see the small vein in his throat, and knew that if she could cut swift and deep to where the great artery lay beneath it, he would be dead almost before he could cry out. She had killed before this. She had sent Avaloch without hesitation to his death, and not three days since she had slain the harmless child in her womb. He who lay sleeping before her was the greater traitor, surely. One stroke. Swift and quiet. Ah, but this was the child Egraine had placed in her arms, her first love, the father of her son, the horned god, the king. Strike, fool, for this you came here. No, there has been too much death. We were born from a single womb, and I couldn't face my mother in the country beyond death not with the blood of my brother on my hands. And for a moment, knowing she moved at the very edge of madness, she heard Egraine calling impatiently, Morgaine, I told you to take care of the baby. It seemed to her that he stirred in sleep, as if he too heard that voice. Morgaine slid the dagger back into its sheath, reached out her hand, and took the scabbard. This at least she had a right to take. With her own hand she had fashioned it. The spells she had woven into it were her own. She hid the scabbard under her cloak and went swiftly out through the thinning darkness to the ferry. 
as the ferryman rowed her across, she felt the prickling of her skin and seemed to see, like a shadow, the barge from Avalon. On the far shore they were all around her, the crew of the Avalon barge. Now, quickly, quickly, she must get back again to Avalon. But the sun was rising, and the shadow of the church lay across the water, and suddenly the sun flooded the landscape, and with the dawn a ringing of church bells was everywhere. Morgane stood as if paralysed. Through that sound she couldn't summon the mists, nor speak the spell. She said to one of the men, Can you take us to Avalon, quickly? He said, shivering, I cannot, lady. It grows harder without a priestess to speak the spell, and even so, at dawn and at noon and at sunset when they ring the bells for prayer, there is no way to cross the mists. Not now. The spell no longer opens the way at these times, although... If we wait till the bells are silent, it may be that we can manage to return. Why, Morgane wondered, should this be so? It had to do with the knowledge that the world was as it was because of what men believed it was. Year by year, these past three or four generations, the minds of men had been hardened to believing that there was one God, one world, one way of describing reality and that all things which intruded on the realm of that great oneness must be evil, and of the fiends, and that the sound of the bells and the shadow of their holy places would keep the evil afar. And as more and more people believed this, it was so, and Avalon no more than a dream adrift in an almost inaccessible other world. Oh yes, she could still call the mists, but not here not where the shadow of the church's spire lay across the water and the clamour of the bells struck terror into her heart. They were trapped on the shores of the lake. And now she was aware that a boat was pushing out from the shores of the priest's isle to cross the lake and find her here. Arthur had wakened and found her scabbard gone from him and now would pursue her. Well, let him follow her as he could. There were other ways into Avalon where the shadow of the church did not prevent her passage. She climbed quickly into her saddle and began to ride along the shores of the lake, circling. She would come at last to a place where, at least in summer, she could cross through the mists, the place where she and Lancelot had once found Guinevere strayed from the nunnery. It wasn't lake, but swampland, and they could get into Avalon by the back way, behind the tor. She knew that the little dark men were running behind her horse, that they could run for half a day at her horse's tail if they must. But now she heard hoofbeats. She was pursued. Arthur was hard on her heels, and there were armed knights with him. She dug her feet into the horse's side, but this was a lady's horse, not intended for the chase. She slid down her horse's side, the scabbard in her hand. Scatter, she whispered to the men, and one by one it was as if they melted into the trees and mists. They could move like shadows if they must, and no man alive could find them if they didn't want to be found. Morgane grasped the scabbard in her hand and began to run along the shores of the lake. In her mind she could hear Arthur's voice, feel his rage. He had Excalibur. She could feel it, like a great shining in her mind, the holy thing of Avalon. But the scabbard he should never bear again. She took it in both hands, whirled it over her head, and flung it with all her strength far out into the lake, where she saw it sink into the deep and fathomless waters. No human hand could ever reclaim it. There it would lie, till leather and velvet rotted, and the silver and gold threads tarnished and twisted, and at last the spells woven into them vanished utterly from the world. Arthur was riding in pursuit, Excalibur naked in his hand, but she and her escort were gone. Morgane drew herself into silence, a part of shadow and tree as if some essential part of herself had gone into fairy. While she stayed there, motionless, 
covered in the silence of a priestess. No one from the mortal world could see so much as her shadow. Arthur shouted her name. Morgaine! Morgaine! A third time he called, loud and angry, but the very shadows were still. And at last, confused from riding in circles, once he came so close that Morgaine could feel the breath of his horse, he wearied and called to his escort, and they came to find him swaying in his saddle, the bandages slowly soaking through with blood, and they led him away the way they had come. Then Morgaine raised her hand, and once again the normal sound of bird and wind and tree came back into the world. Morgaine speaks. In later years I heard the tale of how I took the scabbard by sorcery, and how Arthur rode after me with a hundred knights, and I too had a hundred fairy knights all round me, and when Arthur's pursuit grew near, I turned myself and my men into ringstones. Some day, no doubt, they will add that when I had done, I called for my chariot with the winged dragons and flew away into fairy. But it wasn't so. It was no more than this that the little people can hide in the forests and become one with tree and shadow. And that day I was one of them, as I had been taught in Avalon. And when Arthur had been taken away by his escort, near to fainting with the long pursuit and the cold in his wound, I said farewell to the men of Avalon and rode away to Tintagel. But when I came to Tintagel it mattered little to me what they did in Camelot. "'for I was sick even to death for a long time. "'I know not, even now, what ailed me. "'I know only that summer faded "'and the leaves began to fall while I lay in my bed, "'tended by the servants I had found there, "'neither knowing nor caring whether I would ever rise. "'I know I had a low fever, "'a weariness so great that I couldn't force myself to sit upright, "'or to eat.' a heaviness of mind so great that I cared not whether I would live or die. My servants, one or two of them I recalled from days when I lived there as a little child with Igraine, thought me enchanted, and it may even have been true. Marcus of Cornwall sent to me in homage, and I thought Arthur's star rides high, no doubt he believes that I have come here at Arthur's will, and he will not, now, challenge Arthur even for these lands he believes his own. A year ago I might have laughed at this, or even made common cause with Marcus, promising him lands here in return for leading a party of the disaffected against Arthur. And even now it crossed my mind. But with Acalon dead, it seemed to matter nothing. Arthur had Excalibur. If the goddess wished that it should be taken from him, she would have to come and take it herself, for I had failed. I was her priestess no more. I think it was that which hurt me worst, that I had failed, failed Avalon, that she hadn't put forth her hand to help me do her will. The strength of Arthur and the priests and of the traitor Kevin had been stronger than the magic of Avalon, and there was no one left. No one left. No one. I mourned without ceasing for Acolon, and for the child whose life had barely begun before it was ended, cast aside like offal. I mourned too for Arthur, lost to me now, and my enemy. And unbelievably, even for Urians, and for the wreck of my life in Wales, the only peace I had ever known. I had killed or thrust from me or lost to death everyone in this world I had ever loved. Egraine was gone, and Vivian lost to death, murdered and lying among the priests of their god of death and doom. Acalon was gone, the priest I had consecrated to do that last battle against the Christian priests. Arthur was my enemy, Lancelot had learned to hate and fear me, and I wasn't guiltless for that hate. Guinevere feared and loathed me. Even Elaine was gone now. And Uwain, who had been as my own son, 
hated me too. There was none to care whether I should live or die, so I didn't care either. The last of the leaves had gone. The fearful storms of winter had begun to beat over Tintagel when one day, one of my women came to me and said that a man had come to seek me. At this season, I looked out beyond the window where unceasing rain beat down from skies as grey and bleak as the inside of my own mind. What traveller would come through this bitter weather, struggling through storms and darkness? No, whoever he might be, I cared not. Say to him that the Duchess of Cornwall sees no man and send him away. Into the rain, and a night such as this will be, lady. I was startled that the woman should protest. Most of them feared me for a sorceress, and I was content to have it so. But the woman was right. Tintagel had never failed in hospitality when it was in the hands of my long dead father, or of Igrain. So be it. I said, "Give the traveller hospitality fitting his rank and food and bed, but tell him that I am ill and cannot receive him." She went away, and I lay watching the fierce rain and darkness, feeling its cold breath through the slit of the window. And trying to find my way back into the peaceful blankness where now I felt most like myself. But after a very little, the door opened again and the woman returned, and I started upright, shaking with anger, the first emotion I'd let myself feel in many weeks. I have not summoned you, and I did not bid you return. How dare you! I'm charged with a message for you, lady," she said. "A message I didn't dare say no to." Not when one of the high ones speaks," he said. "I speak not to the Duchess of Cornwall, but to the Lady of Avalon, and she cannot refuse the messenger of the gods when the Merlin seeks audience and counsel." The woman paused and said, "I hope I've got it right. He made me say it twice over to be sure I had it all." Now, against my will, I felt the stirrings of curiosity. The Merlin. But Kevin was Arthur's man. Surely he wouldn't have come like this to me. Had he not aligned himself firmly with Arthur and with the Christians, traitor to Avalon. But perhaps some other man now held that office, messenger of the gods, Merlin of Britain. And now I thought of my son Gwydion, or Mordred, as I supposed I must now think of him. Perhaps this was his office, for he alone would now think of me as Lady of Avalon. After a long silence, I said, "Tell him I will see him then." After a moment, I added, "But not like this. Send someone to dress me, for I knew I was too weak to put on my own clothes. But I wouldn't receive any man this way, weak and ill, and in my bedchamber. I." Who was priestess of Avalon would manage to stand on my feet before the Merlin, even if what he brought was sentence of death for all my failure. I am still more gain. I managed to rise, to have my dress put on and my shoes and my hair braided down my back and covered with the veil of a priestess. I even painted, after the woman's clumsy hands had twice botched it. The symbol of the moon on my forehead. My hands, I noted it incuriously, as if they belonged to someone else, were shaking, and I was weak enough that I let the woman give me her arm as I crawled down the steep stairs. But the Merlin shouldn't see my weakness. A fire had been built in the hall. The fire was smoking a little, as always here when it rained. And through the smoke, I could see only a man's figure seated by the fire, turned away from me, draped in a grey cloak. But at his side stood a tall harp. I couldn't mistake. From my lady, I knew the man. Kevin's hair was all grey now, but he dragged his stooped body upright as I came in. So, I said. You call yourself still Merlin of Britain when you serve only Arthur's will and defy that of Avalon. 
I know not what to call myself now, said Kevin quietly. Save perhaps servant of those who serve the gods, who are all one. Why have you come here then? Again, I know not, said the musical voice I had loved so well. Save perhaps in repayment of some debt laid down before these hills were raised, my dear. Then he raised his voice to the serving woman. Your lady is ill. Get her to a seat. My head was swimming, and a grey mist seemed to waver around me. The next thing I knew, I was seated by the fire across from Kevin, and the woman was gone. He said, Poor Morgane, poor girl. And for the first time since Acolon's death had turned me to stone, I felt that I could weep, and clenched my teeth against the weeping. For if I shed one tear, I knew that everything within me would melt, and I would cry and cry and cry, and never cease crying until I melted into a very lake of tears. I said tightly, clenched, I am no girl, Kevin Harper, and you have won your way to my presence falsely. Now, say what you will say. And go your way. Lady of Avalon, I am not, I said, and remembered that the last time I saw this man I had driven him from my presence, shrieked at him, called him traitor. It seemed not to matter. Perhaps it was fate that two traitors to Avalon should sit here before the fire, for I too had betrayed my oath to Avalon. How dared I judge Kevin? What then are you? he asked quietly. Raven is old and silent now for years. Ninian will never have the power to rule. You are needed. When last we spoke, I interrupted him. You said Avalon's day was done. Why then should there be any to sit in Vivian's place except a child half fitted for that high office? waiting for the day when Avalon fades forever into the mists. I felt a scalding bitterness in my throat. Since you have forsaken Avalon for the banner of Arthur, will it not make your task easier if none reigns in Avalon, save an ancient prophetess and a powerless priestess? Ninian is Gwydion's love and his creature, said Kevin. And it comes to me that your voice and your hands are needed there. Even if Avalon is fated to pass away into the mists, will you refuse to pass with it? I never thought you a coward, Morgane. And then he raised his eyes to mine and said, You will die here, Morgane, die of grief and exile. I turned my face away and said, For that I came here. And for the first time I knew indeed that I had come here to die. All I have tried to do is in ruin. I have failed. Failed. It should be your triumph, Merlin, that Arthur has won. He shook his head. Ah, no, my dear. No triumph, he said. I do what the gods have given me to do. No more. And you do the same. And indeed, if your doom shall be to see the end of the world we have known... Why then, my dearest love, let that doom find us each in our appointed place, serving what our God has given us to serve. It is laid on me to recall you to Avalon, Morgane. I know not why. My task would be simpler with only Ninian there. But, Morgane, your place is in Avalon, and mine where the gods shall decree. And in Avalon you can be healed. Healed? I said it in contempt. I didn't care. Kevin looked at me sadly. My dearest love, he had called me. It seemed to me now that he was the one person alive who knew me as I was. Before every other person alive, even Arthur, I had worn a different face, seeking always to appear older and better than I was, even to Vivian that she might find me more worthy to be a priestess. For Kevin, I was Morgane, thus, and no other. 
It came to me that even if I stretched forth my hand to him as the death crone, he would see nothing but my own face. Morgane. I had always felt that love was other than this, was that burning I had felt for Lancelot, for Acalon. For Kevin, I had felt little save for that detached compassion, friendship, kindness. What I had given him had meant but little to me, and yet... And yet he alone had taken thought to come to me, to care whether or no I died here of grief. But how dared he break in upon my peace when I had almost won through to that utter quiet which was beyond life? I turned away from him and said, No, I could not come back to life again, could not struggle and suffer and live with the hatred of those who had once loved me. If I lived, if I returned to Avalon, I must enter again into a death struggle with Arthur, whom I loved. I must see Lancelot still in Guinevere's prison of love. I had ceased to care. I could endure no further the pain that was in my heart. No, I was here in silence and peace. And before long, I knew it now, I would pass even further into peace. The dizziness that was near to death was drawing closer and ever closer, and this Kevin, this traitor, would bring me back. I said, No, again, and turned away, my hands covering my face. Leave me in peace, Kevin Harper. Hither I came to die. Leave me now. He didn't move, nor did he speak, and I sat very still, my veil over my face. After a little time, surely, now he would arise and leave me, for I hadn't the strength to go forth from him. And I? I would sit here until I was carried back to my bed by the women, and then I would never rise again. And then, into the silence... I heard the soft sound of the harp. Kevin played, and after a moment he sang. I had heard a part of this ballad, for he had sung it often at Arthur's court, of that bard in ancient times, Sir Orpheo, who made the trees to dance and the stones on the plain to stand in a ring and dance, and all the beasts of the wood to come and lay themselves at his feet when they should have rent him with their claws. But beyond that, today... He sang the other part of the song, which was a mystery, and which I had never heard before. He sang of how the initiate, Orpheo, had lost her that he loved, and had descended into the afterworld, and had spoken there before the lords of death, and pleaded for her, and was given permission to go into the dark lands and bring her forth, and then he had found her there on the undying plains. And then his voice spoke from the soul. And I heard what seemed my own voice pleading. Seek not to bring me forth when I am resigned to stay here in death. Here within these undying lands all is at rest, with neither pain nor struggle. Here can I forget both love and grief. The room faded away around me. No longer could I smell the smoke from the fireplace, the chill breath of rain beyond the window. I was no longer conscious of my own body, ill and dizzy where I sat. It seemed to me that I stood in a garden filled with scentless flowers and eternal peace, with only the distant voice of the harp breaking unwillingly through the silence. And that harp sang to me, undesired, it sang of the wind from Avalon, with the breath of apple blossom and the smell of ripened apples in their season. It brought to me the cool freshness of the mist over the lake, and the sounds of running deer deep in the forest where the little folk live still. And it brought me the sun-soaked summer where I lay in the sun beneath the ringstones, with Lancelot's arms round me, and the blood of life rising like sap within my veins for the first time. Then I felt again in my arms the heavy softness of my little son, 
his soft hair against my face, his milky breath sweet and soft. Or was it Arthur himself in my lap clinging to me, his little hands patting my cheek? Again Vivian's hands touched my brow in blessing, and I felt myself a bridge between earth and sky as I stretched my own hands forth in invocation. High winds swirled through the grove where I lay with the young stag in the darkness of the eclipse, and Acalon's voice spoke my name. And now it wasn't the harp alone, but the voices of the dead and the living crying out to me, Return again! Return. Life itself is calling you with all its pleasure and pain. And then a new note came into the voice of the harp. It is I who calls you, Morgane of Avalon, priestess of the mother. And I raised my head, seeing not Kevin's twisted body and sorrowing features, but where he had stood was someone, tall and shining, a sunlit glory about his face, and in his hands the shining harp and bow. I caught my breath before the god as the voice sang on. Return to life, return again to me, you who have sworn. Life awaits you beyond this darkness of death. I struggled to turn away. It is not the god who can command me, but the goddess. But, said the familiar voice in the silence of that eternity, you are the goddess, and it is I who call you. And for a moment, as if in the calm waters of the mirror of Avalon, I saw myself robed and crowned with the high crown of the Lady of Life. But I am old, old. I belong now to death, not to life, I whispered. And in the silence, words heard again and again in ritual suddenly came to life from the lips of the god. She will be old and young as it shall please her. And before my eyes, my own mirrored face was again young and fair as the maiden who had sent forth the young stag to challenge the running deer. Yes, and I had been old when Acheron came to me, yet I had sent him forth to the challenge, heavy with his child. And even old and barren, yet life pulsed within me as within the eternal life of the earth and the lady. And the god stood before me, the eternal one who summoned me forth to life. And I took one step, and then another, and then I was climbing, climbing from the darkness, following the distant notes of the harp that sang to me of the green hills of Avalon and the waters of life. And then I found I was on my feet, reaching for Kevin, and he put the harp gently aside and caught me, half fainting in his arms. And for a moment the shining hands of the god burned me. And then it was only Kevin's sweet, musical, half-mocking voice that said, I cannot hold you, Morgane, as well you know. And he placed me gently into my chair. When did you last eat, Morgane? I cannot remember, I confessed. And suddenly I was aware of my deathly weakness. He called the serving woman and said, speaking in the gently authoritative voice of a druid and a healer, Bring your mistress some bread and some warmed milk with honey. I raised a hand to protest, and the woman looked indignant. And now I remembered that twice she had tried to coax me to eat with these very things. But she went to do his bidding, and when she returned, Kevin took the bread and soaked it in the milk and fed it to me, gently, a few mouthfuls at a time. No more, he said. You have been fasting too long. But before you sleep, you must drink a little more milk with an egg beaten into it. I will show them what to do. The day after tomorrow, perhaps, you will be strong enough to ride. And suddenly I began to cry. I wept at last for Acheron lying dead on his pall, and for Arthur, who hated me now, and for Elaine, who had been my friend. 
and for Vivian lying dead beneath a Christian tomb, and for Egrain, and for myself, for myself who had lived through all these things. And he said again, Poor Morgane, poor girl, and held me against his bony breast, and I cried and cried until at last I was quiet, and he called my women to carry me to my bed. And for the first time in many days, I slept. And two days later, I rode to Avalon. I remember little of that northward journey, sick in body and mind. I didn't even wonder that Kevin left me before I came to the lake. I came to those shores at sunset when the waters of the lake seemed to run crimson and the sky was all afire, and out of the flame-coloured water and sky appeared the barge, painted and draped all in black, oars muffled to the silence of a dream. And for a moment it seemed to me that it was the sacred boat on the shoreless sea of which I may not speak, and that the dark figure at the prow was she and that somehow I bridged the gap between earth and sky. But I don't know whether that was real or a dream. And then the mists fell over us, and I felt within my very soul that shifting which told me I was once again within my own place. Ninian welcomed me at the shore, taking me in her arms, not as the stranger I had seen but twice, but as a daughter greets a mother she hasn't seen for many years. Then she took me away to the house where once Vivian had dwelt. She did not, this time, send young priestesses to tend me, but cared for me herself, putting me to bed in the inner room of the house, bringing me water from the sacred well. And when I tasted it, I knew that although the healing would be long, I was not yet beyond healing. I had known enough of power. I was content to lay down the burdens of the world. It was time to leave that to others and to let my daughters tend me. Slowly, slowly, in the silence of Avalon, I recovered my strength. There, at last, I could mourn for Acolon. Not for the ruin of my hopes and plans. I could see now what madness they had been. I was priestess of Avalon, not queen. But I could mourn the brief and bitter summer of our love. I could grieve, too, for the child who hadn't lived long enough to be born, and suffer once again that it had been my own hand that had sent him into the shades. It was a long season of mourning, and there were times when I wondered if I should mourn all my life and never again be free of it. But at last I could remember without weeping, and recall the days of love without unending sorrow welling up like tears from the very depths of my being. There is no sorrow like the memory of love and the knowledge that it is gone for ever. Even in dreams I never saw again his face, and though I longed for it, I came at last to see that it was just as well, lest I live all the rest of my life in dreams. But at last there came a day when I could look back and know that the time for mourning was ended. My lover and my child were on the other shore, and even if I should somehow meet them beyond the gates of death, none of us would ever know. But I lived, and I was in Avalon, and it was my task now to be lady there. I do not know how many years I dwelt in Avalon before the end. I remember only that I floated in a vast and nameless peace, beyond joy and sorrow, knowing only serenity and the little tasks of every day. Ninian stood ever at my side, and I came, too, to know Nimue, who had grown to a tall, silent, fair-haired maiden, as fair as Elaine when first I knew her. She became to me the daughter I had never known, and day after day she came to me, and I taught her all those things I had learned from Vivian in my own early years in Avalon. In those last days, too, there were some who had seen the tree of the holy thorn in its first flowering for the followers of Christ, and worshipped their Christian God in peace, 
seeking not to drive out the beauty of the world, but loving it as God made it. In those days, they came in numbers to Avalon to escape the harsh and shriveling winds of persecution and bigotry. Patricius had set up new forms of worship, a view of the world wherein there was no room for the real beauty and mystery of the things of nature. From these Christians who came to us to escape the bigotry of their own kind, I learned something, at last, of the Nazarene, the carpenter's son who had attained Godhead in his own life and preached a rule of tolerance. And so I came to see that my quarrel was never with the Christ, but with his foolish and narrow priests who mistook their own narrowness for his. I know not whether it was three years, or five, or even ten before the end. I heard whispers of the outside world like shadows, like the echo of the church bells we heard sometimes even on that shore. I knew when Urians died, but I didn't mourn him. He had been dead to me for many years. But I could hope that in the end he had found some healing for his griefs. He had been kind to me as best he might, and so let him rest. Now and again some rumour of Arthur's deeds and those of the knights would come to me. But in the serenity of Avalon it seemed not to matter. Those deeds sounded like old tales and legends, so that I never knew whether they spoke of Arthur and Kai and Lancelot, or of Lear and the children of Diana, or when tales were whispered of the love of Lancelot and Guinevere, or later of Marcus's wife Isotta and young Druston, they were not, after all, retelling some old tale of Diamid and Granet from the ancient days. It seemed not to matter. It seemed that I had heard all these tales long ago in my childhood. And then, one spring, when the land lay beautiful before us, and the first apple trees of Avalon were white with blossom, Raven broke silence with a cry, and perforce my mind returned to the things of that world I had hoped to leave forever behind. Chapter 9 The sword, the sword of the mysteries is gone. Now look to the cup, now look to all of the holy regalia. It is gone, it is gone, taken from us. Morgain heard the cry out of sleep, and yet when she tiptoed to the door of the room where Raven slept, alone and in silence as ever, the women who attended her slept. They hadn't heard that cry. But there is nothing but silence, lady, they told her. Are you certain it wasn't an evil dream? If it was an evil dream, then it came to the priestess Raven as well, Morgain said, staring at the untroubled faces of the girls. It seemed to her that with every passing year the priestesses in the House of Maidens grew younger and more like children. How could little girls like this be entrusted with the holy things? Maidens whose breasts had scarcely formed. What could they know of the life of the goddess, which was the life of the world? Again, it seemed, that chattering cry rang through Avalon, rousing alarm everywhere. But when Morgaine asked, There! Did you hear? They looked at her again in dismay and said, Do you dream now, lady, with your eyes wide open? And Morgain realised that in the bitter cry of terror and grief there had been no actual sound. She said, I will go to her. But you may not do that, one of them began, then stepped back, her mouth open, as she realised the full meaning of who Morgain was and she bent her head as Morgaine stepped past her. Raven was sitting up in bed, her long hair flung about her in mad disarray, and her eyes wild with terror. For a moment, Morgaine thought that indeed her mind had overheard some evil dream, that Raven walked in the worlds of dream. But she shook her head, and then she was wide awake and sober. She drew a long breath and Morgaine knew that she was struggling to speak to overcome the years of silence. Now it was as if her voice wouldn't obey her. At last, 
Trembling all over, she said, I saw, I saw it, treachery, Morgane, within the very holy places of Avalon. I could not see his face, but I saw the great sword Excalibur in his hand. Morgane put out a hand, quieting her. She said, We will look within the mirror when the sun rises. Do not trouble yourself to speak, my dearest. Raven was still trembling. Morgane put her hand firmly over Raven's, and by the flickering light of the torch, she saw that her own hand was lined and spotted with the dark spots of age, that Raven's fingers were like twisted ropes around the narrow, fine bones. We are old, she thought, both of us, who came here maidens in attendance on Vivian. Ah, goddess, the years that pass. But I must speak now, Raven whispered. I have been silent too long. I kept silence even when I feared this would come. Listen to the thunder and the rain. A storm is coming, a storm to break over Avalon and sweep it away in the flood. And the darkness over the land. Hush, my dear, be still, Morgane whispered and put her arms around the shaking woman, wondering if her mind had snapped, if this was all an illusion, a fever dream. There was no thunder, no rain. Outside the moon was shining brilliantly over Avalon, and the orchards white with blossom in the moonlight. Don't be frightened. I will stay here with you, and in the morning we will look into the mirror and see if any of this is real. Raven smiled a sad smile. She took Morgane's torch and put it out, and in the sudden darkness Morgane could see, through the chinks in the wattle, a sudden flare of lightning in the distance. Silence, and then, very far away, a low thundering. I do not dream, Morgane. The storm will come, and I am afraid. You have more courage than I, you have lived in the world and known real sorrows, not dreams. But now perhaps I must go forth and break silence for evermore. And I'm afraid. Morgane lay down beside her, pulling Raven's cover over them both, and took Raven in her arms to still her shaking. As she lay quiet, listening to the other woman's breathing, she remembered the night she had brought Nimue there and how Raven had come to her then, welcoming her to Avalon. Why does it seem to me now that of all the love I have known, that is the truest? But she only held Raven gently, the other woman's head on her shoulder, soothing her. After a long time there was a great clap of thunder startling them, and Raven whispered, You see? Hush, my dear, it's only a storm. And as she spoke, the rain came down, rushing and rattling, bringing a chilly wind within the room, drowning speech. Morgane lay silent, her fingers just entwined with ravens, and thought, It is only a storm. But something of raven's terror communicated itself to her, and she felt herself shivering too. A storm that will drive down out of heaven and smash into Camelot and scatter the years of peace that Arthur has made in this land. She tried to call the sight to her, but the thunder seemed to drown thoughts. She could only lie close to Raven, repeating to herself again and again, It is only a storm, a storm, rain and wind and thunder. It is not the wrath of the goddess. This ends Disc 5. The Prisoner in the Oak, Disc 6 After a long time the storm subsided, and she woke to a world new-washed, the sky pallid and cloudless, water shimmering on every leaf and raining down from every blade of grass as if the world had been dipped in water and not dried or shaken. If Raven's storm were to break in truth over Camelot, would it leave the world thus beautiful in its wake? Somehow, she thought not. Raven woke and looked at her, wide-eyed with dread. 
Morgaine said, quiet and practical as always. We shall go to Ninian at once, then to the mirror before the sun rises. If the wrath of the goddess is to descend on us, we must know how and why. Raven gestured her a silent assent, but when they were dressed and about to leave the house, Raven touched Morgaine's arm. Go to Ninian, she whispered, with the racking struggle to make her unused voice do her bidding. I will bring Nimui. She too is part of this. For a moment, Morgaine was startled almost to protest. Then, with a glance at the paling sky in the east, she went. It might be that Raven had seen, in the evil dream of prophecy, the reason that Nimui had been brought here and kept in seclusion. Remembering the day when Vivian had told her of her own mission, she thought, Poor girl. But it was the will of the goddess. They were all in her hands. As she went silent and alone through the wet orchard, she could see that all was not so calm and beautiful after all. The wind had ravaged the blossoms, and the orchard lay under a white drift like snow. There would be little fruit this autumn. We may plant the grain and till the soil, but only her favour brings the fruit to harvest. Why then do I trouble myself? It will be as she wills. Ninian, roused from sleep, looked at her as if she were mad. She is no true priestess, Morgaine thought. The Merlin spoke the truth. She was chosen only because she was Taliesin's kin. The time has come, perhaps, to stop pretending who is truly the Lady of Avalon and take my proper place. She didn't want to offend Ninian or seem to strive for power and set the younger woman down. She had had enough of power. But no true priestess chosen of the goddess could have slept through Raven's cry. Yet somehow this woman before her had passed through the ordeals which go to the makings of a priestess. The goddess hadn't rejected her. What would the goddess have her do? I tell you, Ninian, I have seen it, and so has Raven. We must look before sunrise into the mirror. I put not much faith in such things either, said Ninian quietly. What must come will surely come. But if you will, Morgaine, I will go with you. Silent, like spots of blackness in the white and watery world, they moved toward the mirror below the sacred well. And as they went, Morgaine could see, like a shadow at the corner of her eyes, the tall, silent form of Raven, veiled, and Nimue, like a pale shadow, all blossom and pale flowers like the morning. Morgaine was struck at the girl's beauty. Even Guinevere, in the fullest flush of her youth, had never been so beautiful. She felt a wild stab of pure jealousy and anguish. I had no such gift from the goddess in return for all I must sacrifice. Ninian said, Nimue is a maiden. It is she who must look into the mirror. Their four dark forms were reflected in the pallid surface of the pool. Against the pale reflection of the sky, where a few pale pink streaks were beginning to herald the sunrise. Nimue moved to the edge of the pool, parting her long, fair hair with both hands, and Morgaine found herself seeing in her mind the surface of a silver bowl and Vivian's stilled, hypnotic face. Nimue said in a low, wandering voice, "'What would you that I should see, my mother?' Morgaine waited for Raven to speak, but there was only silence. So Morgaine said at last, has Avalon been breached and fallen victim to treachery? What has befallen the holy regalia? Silence. Only a few birds chirped softly in the trees, and the soft sound of water rippled, falling from the channel which overflowed from the well to make this still pool. Below them, on the slopes, Morgaine could see the white drifts of the ruined orchards, and high above, the pale shapes of the ringstones atop the tor. Silence. At last, Nimue stirred and whispered, 
I cannot see his face. And the pool rippled, and it seemed that Morgain could see a hunched form, moving slowly and with difficulty. The room where she had stood silent that day behind Vivian, when Taliesin laid Excalibur in Arthur's hand, and she heard his voice forbidding, No, it is death to touch the holy regalia unprepared. For a moment Morgaine could hear the voice of Taliesin, not Nimue's voice. But he had the right. He was the Merlin of Britain. And he took them from the hiding place, spear and cup and dish, and hiding the holy things under his cloak, he went out and across the lake to where Excalibur gleamed in the darkness. The holy regalia now reunited. Merlin, whispered Ninian aloud. But why? Morgaine knew her face was like stone, as she said. Once he spoke of this to me, he said that Avalon was now outside the world, and that the holy things must be within the world to the service of man and the gods, by whatever name men called them. He would profane them, Ninian said hotly, and put them to the use of that god who would drive out all other gods. In the silence, Morgaine heard the chanting of monks. Then the sunlight touched the mirror and turned it all to shooting fire which flooded her head and eyes, burning, blazing. And in the glare of the rising sun, it seemed as if all the world burned in the light of a flaming cross. She shut her eyes, covering her face with her hands. Let them go, Morgaine, whispered Raven. The goddess will certainly care for her own. Again, Morgaine could hear the chanting of the monks. Kyrie Eliason, Christe Eliason. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. The holy regalia were but tokens. Surely the goddess had let this befall them as a sign that Avalon needed these things no more, that they should go into the world and be in the service of men. The flaming cross burned still before Morgaine's eyes. She covered them and turned away from the light. Even I cannot abrogate the Merlin's vow. He swore a great oath and made the great marriage with the land in the king's stead, and now he is forsworn and his life forfeit. But before I deal with the traitor, I must deal with the treachery. The regalia must be returned to Avalon even if I must bring them hither again with my own hands. I will go forth to Camelot at dawn. And she suddenly saw her plan complete as Nimue whispered, Must I go forth too? Is it mine to avenge the goddess? She, Morgaine, would deal with the holy regalia. They had been left in her care and if only she had taken her proper place here instead of reveling in sorrow and considering her own comfort, this could never have come to pass. But Nimue should be the instrument of the traitor's punishment. Kevin had never seen Nimue. Of all those who dwelt on Avalon, the Merlin had never seen that one who dwelt in seclusion and silence. And as always transpires when the goddess brings down punishment... It should be the Merlin's own undefended fortress which should bring him to ruin. She said slowly, clenching her fists. How had she ever softened to that traitor? You shall go forth to Camelot, Nimue. You are Queen Guinevere's cousin and the daughter of Lancelot. You will beg her that you may dwell among her ladies and beg her to keep it secret, even from King Arthur, that you have ever dwelt in Avalon. Pretend even, if you must, that you have become a Christian. And there you will come to know the Merlin. He has a great weakness. He believes that women shun him because he is ugly and because he is lame. And for the woman who shows no fear or revulsion of him, for that woman who shows him again the manhood he craves and fears, he will do anything. He would give his very life. Nimue she said, looking straight into the girl's frightened eyes. You will seduce him to your bed. You will bind him to you with such spells that he is your slave, body and soul. 
And then, said Nimue, trembling, what then? Must I kill him? Morgane would have spoken, but Ninian spoke first. Such death as you could give would be all too swift for such a traitor. You must bring him, enchanted, to Avalon, Nimue. And there he shall die a traitor's cursed death within the oak grove. Trembling, Morgane knew what fate awaited him. To be flayed alive, then thrust living within the cleft of the oak, and the opening stopped with wattle and daub, leaving only enough space so that his breath wouldn't fail, lest he die too quickly. She bowed her head, trying to conceal her shudder. The blinding sun was gone from the water. The sky dripped with pale dawn clouds. Ninian said, Our work is done here. Come, mother. But Morgane pulled herself free. Not done. I too must go forth for Camelot. I must know to what use the traitor has put the holy regalia. She sighed. She had hoped never again to go forth from the shore of Avalon but there was no other to do what must be done. Raven put out her hand. She was shaking so terribly that Morgane feared she would fall, and now she whispered, her ruined voice only a distant hiss and scratching like wind against dead branches. I too must go. It is my fate that I shall not lie where all those before me have lain in the enchanted country. I ride with you, Morgane. No, no, Raven, Morgane protested. Not you. Raven had never set foot off Avalon, not in fifty years. Surely she couldn't survive the journey. But nothing she could say shook Raven's determination. Shivering with terror, she was adamant. She had seen her destiny and must go with Morgane at any cost. But I'm not going as Ninian would travel, in the pomp of priestess garb, in the litter of Avalon, riding in state to Camelot, she argued. I'm going in disguise, as an old peasant woman, as Vivian travelled so often in the old days. But Raven shook her head and said, Any road you can travel, Morgane, I too can travel. Morgane still felt a deadly fear, not for herself but for Raven. But she said, Be it so. And they made ready to ride. And later that day they took their secret ways out of Avalon. Nimue, travelling in state as the kinswoman of the queen, riding on the main roads. And Morgane and Raven, wrapped in the sombre rags of beggar women, out of Avalon by the back ways and side roads, making their way on foot toward Camelot. Raven was stronger than Morgane had believed, as they made their way, day by day, slow-paced and afoot. At times it seemed she was the stronger. They begged broken meats at farm doors. They stole a bit of bread left for a dog at the back of a farmstead. They slept once in a deserted villa, and one night beneath a haystack. And on that last night, for the first time on their silent journey, Raven spoke. Morgane, she said, when they were lying side by side, wrapped in their cloaks under the shadow of the hay. Tomorrow is Easter at Camelot, and we must be there at dawn. Morgane would have asked why, but she knew Raven could give her no answer but this, that she had seen it as their fate. And so she answered, Then we shall leave here before dawn. It is no more than an hour's walk from here. We might have kept walking and slept in the shadow of Camelot, if you told me this before, Raven. I could not, Raven whispered. I was afraid. And Morgane knew that the other woman was weeping in the darkness. I'm so frightened, Morgane, so frightened. Morgane said brusquely, I told you that you should have remained in Avalon. But I had the work of the goddess to do whispered Raven. In all these years I have dwelt in the shelter of Avalon, and now it is Caridwen, our mother, who demands my all in return for all the shelter and safety I have had from her. 
but I am afraid, so afraid. Morgain, hold me, hold me. I'm so frightened. Morgaine clasped her close and kissed her, rocking her like a child. Then, as if they entered together into a great silence, she held Raven against her, touching her, caressing her, their bodies clinging together in something like frenzy. Neither spoke, but Morgaine felt the world trembling in a strange and sacramental rhythm around them, in no light but the darkness of the dark side of the moon, woman to woman affirming life in the shadow of death. As maiden and man, in the light of the spring moon and the Beltane fires, affirmed life in the running of spring and the rutting which would bring death in the field to him and death in childbearing to her, so in the shadow and darkness of the sacrificed god, in the dark moon, the priestesses of Avalon together called on the life of the goddess, and in the silence she answered them. They lay at last quiet in each other's arms, and Raven's weeping was stilled at last. She lay like death, and Morgain, feeling her heart slowing to stillness, thought, I must let her go, even into the shadow of death, if that is the will of the goddess. And she couldn't even weep. No one took the slightest notice of two peasant women, no longer young, in the turmoil and tumult about the gates of Camelot this morning. Morgaine was used to this. Raven, who had lived so long in seclusion, even on quiet Avalon, turned white as bone and tried to hide herself under her ragged shawl. Morgaine also kept her own shawl about her. There were some who would recognize the Lady Morgaine, even with her hair streaked with white and in the garb of a peasant woman. A drover, striding through the yard with a calf, ran into Raven and came near to knocking her down, and he cursed her when she only stared at him in dismay. Morgaine said quickly, My sister is deaf and dumb. And his face changed. Oh, poor thing. Look, go up by there. They're giving everybody a good dinner at the lower end of the king's hall. You two can creep in that door and watch them when they come in. The king has got some big thing planned with one of the priests in the hall today. You'll be from up country and not know his ways. Well, everyone in this countryside knows that he makes it a custom. He never sits down to his great feasts unless there's some great marvel arranged. And we heard today that there is to be something truly marvellous. I doubt it not, Morgaine thought disdainfully. But she only thanked the man in the rough country dialect she had used before and drew Raven along with her towards the lower hall, which was filling rapidly. King Arthur's generosity on feast days was well known, and this would be the best dinner many people had all year. There was a smell of roasting meat in the air, and most of the people jostling round her commented greedily on it. As for Morgaine, it only made her feel sick, and after one look at Raven's white, terrified face, she decided to withdraw. She shouldn't have come. It was I who failed to see the danger to the holy regalia. It was I who failed to see that the Merlin was traitor. And when I have done what I must do, how will I manage to flee to Avalon with Raven in this condition? She found a corner where they would be disregarded, but where they could see reasonably well what was happening. At the higher end of the room was the great Mead Hall table, the round table, which was already almost legendary in the countryside, with the great dais for the king and queen, and the painted names of Arthur's companions over their customary places. On the walls hung brilliant banners, and after the years spent in the austerity of Avalon, this all seemed gaudy and garish to Morgain. After a long time there was a stir, and then the sound of trumpets somewhere, and a whisper ran through the jostling crowd. Morgaine thought, It will be strange to see the court from outside, after being a part of it for so long. Kai was opening the great doors to the upper end of the hall, and Morgaine shrank. Kai would know her, whatever garb she wore. 
but why should he even look in her direction? How many years had she spent quietly drifting in Avalon? She had no idea. But Arthur seemed even taller, more majestic, his hair so fair that no one could have told whether or no there were silver strands among the carefully combed curls. Guinevere, too, although her breasts sagged under the elaborate gown, bore herself upright and seemed slim as ever. Look how young the queen looks, muttered one of Morgaine's neighbours. Yet Arthur married her the year I had my first son. And look at me. Morgaine glanced at the speaker, bent and toothless, stooped like a bent bow. I heard that which sister of the king, Morgaine of the fairies, gave them both spells to keep their youth. Spells or no, mumbled another toothless crone tartly. If Queen Guinevere had to muck out a byre night and morning, and bear a babe every year and suckle it in good times and bad, there'd be none of that beauty left, bless her. Things are as they are. But I wish some priest would tell me why she gets all the good in life, and I get all the misery. Stop grumbling, said the first speaker. You'll have your belly full today, and get to see all the lords and ladies. And you know what the old druids used to say about why things are what they are? Queen Guinevere up there gets fine gowns and jewels, and a queen's business, because she did good in her last lives. And the likes of you and me are poor and ugly, because we were ignorant. And some day, if we mind what we do in this life, there's a better fortune for us, too. Oh, aye, grunted the other old woman. Priests and druids are all alike. The druid says that, and the priest says, if we do our duty in this life, we'll go to heaven and live with Jesus and feast with him out there, and never come back to this wicked world at all. It all winds up the same, whatever the lot of them say. Some are born in misery, and I in misery, and others have it all their own way. But she's none so happy, I've heard, said another of the group of old women wedged in together. For all her queening it, she's never born a single babe. And I have a good son to work the farm for me, and one daughter married to the man at the next farm, and another who's servant to the nuns on Glastonbury. And Queen Guinevere has had to adopt Sir Galahad there, who's the son of Lancelot and of her own cousin Elaine for Arthur's heir. Why, that's what they tell you, said a fourth old woman. But you know and I know... When Queen Guinevere was absent from court in the sixth or seventh year of his reign, something like that, don't you think they were all counting on their fingers? My stepbrother's wife was a kitchen woman here at court, and he said it was common talk all round here that the Queen spent her nights in another bed than her husband's. Keep quiet, old gossip, said the first speaker. Just let one of the Chamberlains hear you say that aloud. And you'll be ducked in the pond for a scold. I say Galahad's a good knight, and he'll make a good king. Long live King Arthur. And who cares who his mother is? I think meself he's one of Arthur's by-blows. He's fair like him. And look yonder at Sir Mordred. Everyone knows he's the king's bastard son by some harlot or other. I heard worse than that, said one of the women. I heard Mordred's the son of one of the fairy witches, and Arthur took him to court in pawn for his soul to live a hundred years. You'll see, he'll not age Sir Mordred there. Just look at Arthur. He must be past fifty, and he could be a man in his thirties. Another old woman spoke a barnyard obscenity. What's it to me, all of that? If the devil were about business like that, he could have made yonder Mordred in Arthur's own image, so anyone could accept him as Arthur's son. Arthur's mother was of the old blood of Avalon. Did you never see the Lady Morgaine? She was dark too, and Lancelot, whose his kin, was like that. I'd rather believe what they said before, that Mordred is Lancelot's bastard son by the Lady Morgaine. You've only got to look at them. The Lady Morgaine, pretty enough in her way, little and dark as she was. She's not among the ladies, one of the women remarked. 
and the woman who had known a kitchen woman at court said authoritatively, "Why she quarrelled with Arthur and went away to the land of fairy, but every one knows that an All Hallows night she flies round the castle on a hazel twig, and any one who catches sight of her will be struck blind." Morgane buried her face in her ragged cloak to smother a giggle. Raven, hearing, turned an indignant face to Morgane, but Morgane shook her head. They must keep still and not be noticed. The knights were seating themselves in their accustomed places. Lancelot, as he took his seat, raised his head, looking sharply round the hall, and for a moment it seemed to Morgane that he sought her out where she stood. That his eyes met hers, shivering, she ducked her head. Chamberlains were moving at both ends of the hall, pouring wine for the companions and their ladies, pouring good brown beer from great leather jacks down among the peasants crowded in at the lower end. Morgane held out her cup and Raven's, and when Raven refused, she said in a harsh whisper, "Drink it. You look like death." And you must be strong enough for whatever is coming. Raven put the wooden cup to her lips and sipped, but she could hardly swallow. The woman who had said that the Lady Morgane was pretty enough in her way asked, "Is she sick, your sister?" Morgane said, "She is frightened. She has never seen the court before. Fine, aren't they, the lords and ladies? What a spectacle!" And we'll get a good dinner soon," said the woman to Raven. "Hey, doesn't she hear? She isn't deaf, but dumb," Morgane said again. "I think maybe she understands a little of what I say to her, but no one else. Now you come to speak of it, she does look simple-minded at that," said the other woman, and patted Raven on the head like a dog. "Has she always been like that?" What a pity! And you have to look after her. You're a good woman. Sometimes, when children are like that, their folks tie them to a tree like a stray dog, and here you take her to court and all. Look at the priest in his gold robes. That's the bishop Patricius. They say he drove all the snakes out of his own country. Think of that. Do you think he fought them with sticks? It's a way of saying he drove out all the druids. They are called serpents of wisdom, Morgan said. How the likes of you know a thing like that? Morgan's interrogator scoffed. I heard for sure that it was snakes, and anyhow, all those wise folk, druids and priests, they hang together. They wouldn't quarrel. Very likely, said Morgan, not wanting to draw further attention to herself. Her eyes going to Bishop Patricius. Behind him, there was someone in the robes of a monk, a hunched figure bent over and moving with difficulty. Now, what was the Merlin doing in the bishop's train? She said, her need to know overcoming the risk of attracting attention. What's going to happen? I thought surely they would have heard their mass in the chapel this morning, all the lords and ladies. I heard. Said one of the women, that since the chapel would hold so few, there would be a special mass here today for all the folk before meat. See, the bishop's men carrying in that altar with the white cloth and all. Shh, listen. Morgan felt she would go mad with rage and despair. Were they going to profane the holy regalia beyond any possibility of cleansing by using it to serve a Christian mass? Draw near, all ye people," the bishop was atoning. "For today the old order giveth way to the new. Christ has triumphed over all the old and pretended gods, who shall now be subservient to His name. For the true Christ said unto mankind, 'I am the way and the truth and the life.' Also He said, 'No man may come to the Father except he come in My name.'" For there is no other name under heaven in which you may be saved. And by that token, then, all those things which once were devoted to false gods before mankind had knowledge of the truth, 
now shall be devoted to Christ and newly dedicated in service to the true God. But Morgaine heard no more. Suddenly she knew what they were planning to do. No, I am sworn to the goddess. I must not allow this blasphemy. She turned and touched Raven's arm. Even here, in the midst of this crowded hall, they were open to one another. They would use the holy regalia of the goddess to summon the presence. Which is one. But they would do it in the narrow name of that Christ who calls all gods demons, unless they invoke in his name. The cup the Christians use in their mass is the invocation of water, even as the plate whereon they lay their holy bread is the sacred dish of the element of earth. Now, using the ancient things of the goddess, they would invoke their own narrow god. Yet instead of the pure water of the holy earth coming from the clear crystal spring of the goddess, they have defiled her chalice with wine. In the cup of the goddess, O oh mother, is the cauldron of Caridwin, wherein all men are nourished, and from which all men have all the good things of this world. You have called upon the goddess, O ye willful priests, but will you dare her presence if she should come? Morgaine clasped her hands in the most fervent invocation of her life. I am thy priestess, O mother. Use me, I pray, as you will. She felt the rushing downward of power, felt herself standing taller, taller as the power flooded through her body and soul and filled her. She was no longer conscious of Raven's hands holding her upright, filling her like the chalice with the sacred wine of the Holy Presence. She moved forward and saw Patricius, stunned, draw back before her, she had no fear, and though she knew it was death to touch the holy regalia unprepared, how, she wondered in a remote corner of her waking mind, did Kevin manage to prepare the bishop? Had he betrayed that secret too? She knew with certainty that all her life had been preparation for this moment when, as the goddess herself, she raised the cup between her hands. Afterward, she heard. Some said that they saw the holy chalice borne round the room by a maiden clothed in shimmering white. Others said that they heard a great rushing wind fill the hall and a sound of many harps. Morgaine knew only that she lifted the cup between her hands, seeing it glow like a great sparkling jewel, a ruby, a living beating heart pulsing between her hands. She moved toward the bishop, and he fell to his knees before her as she whispered, Drink, this is the holy presence. He drank, and briefly she wondered what it was that he saw. But then he fell away behind her as she moved on, or the cup itself moved, drawing her with it. She couldn't tell. She heard a sound as of many wings rushing before her, and she smelled a sweetness that was neither incense nor perfume. The chalice, some said later, was invisible. Others said that it shone like a great star which blinded every eye that looked on it. Every person in that hall found his plate filled with such things as he liked best to eat. Again and again later she heard that tale, and by that token she knew that what she had borne was the cauldron of Keridwen. But for the other tales, she had no explanation, and needed none. She is the goddess. She will do as she will. As she moved before Lancelot, she heard him whisper in awe, Is it you, mother, or do I dream? And set the cup to his lips, filled with overflowing tenderness. Today she was mother to them all. Even Arthur knelt before her as the cup briefly passed before his lips. I am all things, virgin and mother, and she who gives life and death. Ignore me at your peril, ye who call on other names. Know ye that I am one. Of all those in that great hall, 
Only Nimue, she thought, had recognised her, had looked up in astonished recognition. Yes, Nimue too had been reared to know the goddess, whatever form she might take. You too, my child, she whispered with infinite compassion, and Nimue knelt to drink, and Morgane felt somewhere through her the surging of lust and vengeance, and thought, yes, this too is a part of me. Morgane faltered, felt Raven's strength bearing her up. Was Raven beside her, holding the cup? Or was it illusion? Was Raven still crouching in her corner, holding her upright with a flow of strength which poured through them both into the goddess bearing the cup? Later, Morgane never knew whether in truth she had borne the chalice, or whether that too had been part of the vast magic she had woven for the goddess. Yet it seemed to her, still, that she bore the cup around the great hall, that every man and every woman there knelt and drank, that the sweetness and the bliss flooded her, that she walked as if borne along on those great wings she could hear. And then Mordred's face was before her. I am not your mother. I am the mother of all. Galahad was white. Overawed. Did he see it as the cup of life, or as the holy chalice of Christ? Did it matter? Gareth, Gawain, Lucan, Bedivere, Palomides, Kai, all the old companions, and many she didn't recognize. And it seemed at the last that they walked somewhere beyond the spaces of the world, and all of those who had ever been among them even those who had passed beyond this world, came to commune with them at the round table this day. Ectorius, Lot, dead years since at Mount Baden, young Druston murdered in jealous rage by Marcus, Lionel, Bors, Berlin and Balin, hand in hand like brothers again past the gates of death. All those who had ever gathered here around the round table, past and present, Today, we're gathered here in this moment beyond time, even at last before the wise eyes of Taliesin. And then it was Kevin kneeling before her, the cup to his lips. Even you I forgive all this day, whatever may come in the times yet to be seen. At last she raised the chalice to her own lips and drank. The water of the sacred well was sweet on her lips. And though she saw now all the others in the hall eating and drinking, somehow it seemed, when she took a bite of bread, that on her lips it was the soft honey bannock that Igraine had baked for her when she was a child in Tintagel. She replaced the cup on the altar where it shone like a star. Now, now, Raven, the great magic... It took all the strength of all the druids to shift Avalon from this world. But now we need not do so much. The cup and the dish and the spear must go. They must go from this world forever, safely into Avalon, never again to be touched or profaned by mortal men. Never again may they be used for our own magic among the ringstones, for they have been defiled by their moments on a Christian altar but never again will they be profaned by priests of a narrow god who would deny all other truths. She felt Raven's touch, hands gripping hers, and it seemed to her that beyond Raven's hands she felt other hands, she knew not whose. And in the hall it seemed as if the great wings flapped for a final time, and a great rushing wind swept through the hall and was gone white daylight broke into the room, and the altar was bare and empty, and the white cloth was crumpled and lying there untenanted. She could see the pale, terrified face of Bishop Patricius. "'God has visited us,' he whispered, "'and today we have drunk of the wine of life by the Holy Grail.' Gawain leapt to his feet. "'But who has stolen away the holy vessel?' he cried. 
We have seen it veiled. I swear I shall go forth to find it and bring it again to this court. And on this quest I shall spend a twelve-month and a day till I see it more clearly than here. Of course it would have to be Gawain, thought Morgain, always first to set himself face to face with the unknown. Yet he had played into her hands. Galahad stood up, pale and shining with excitement. A twelve-month, Sir Gawain. I swear that I shall spend all my life, if need be, till I see the grail clear before me. Arthur held out his hand and tried to speak, but the fever had caught them all, and they were crying out, pledging themselves, all talking at once. There is now no other cause so dear to their hearts, Morgane thought. The wars have been won. There is peace in the land. Between wars, even the Caesars had the sense to set their legions to the building of roads and the conquest of new lands. Now this quest, they think, will unite them again in the old fervour. Once again they are the companions of the round table, but this will scatter them to the four winds. In the name of that god you would set above Avalon, Arthur. The goddess works as she will. Mordred had risen and was speaking, but Morgain had eyes now only for Raven, fallen to the floor. All round her the old peasant women were still chattering about the fine foods and drink they had tasted under the spell of the cauldron. White wine it was, rich and sweet as fresh honey and grapes. I never tasted it but once, years ago. Plum cake I had, stuffed with raisins and plums, and a sauce of rich red wine. I never had anything so good. But Raven lay silent, white as death. And when Morgaine bent to her, she knew what she had already known when she first saw her lying there. The weight of that great magic had been too much for the terrified woman. She had held firm, buoyed by the great magic, until the grail had gone away to Avalon. All her own strength poured out selflessly to strengthen Morgaine in the work of the goddess. And then... That strength withdrawn, her life had gone with it. Morgaine held her close in wild grief and despair. I have killed her too. Truly, truly, now have I killed the last one I had to love. Mother, goddess, why could it not have been me? I have nothing more to live for, no one to love. And Raven has never harmed a living soul. Never. Never. Morgain saw Nimue come down from her high seat beside the queen and speak with the Merlin, her look warm and sweet, and lay a confiding hand on his arm. Arthur was speaking with Lancelot, the tears streaming down both their faces. She saw them embrace and kiss as they hadn't done since they were boys. Arthur left him then and walked down into the lower end of the hall, moving among his subjects. Is all well, my people? All were speaking to him about the magical feast, but as he came nearer, someone called out, He is an old deaf and dumb woman, my lord Arthur. Dead. The excitement was just too much for her. Arthur walked to where Raven lay lifeless in Morgaine's arms. Morgaine didn't raise her head. Would he recognise her, cry out, accuse her of witchcraft? His voice was gentle and familiar, but distant. Of course, she thought, he isn't speaking now to sister or priestess or equal. He sees no more than a crouching old peasant woman, white-haired, clad in rags. Your sister, my good woman, I'm sorry this has come to you at a festival, but God has taken her at a blessed moment into the very arms of his own angel. Would you have her lie here for burial? She shall lie in the churchyard if you wish. The women around drew breath, 
and Morgaine knew this was, indeed, the highest charity he could offer. But her cloak still over her head, she said, No, and then, as if compelled, looked up into his eyes. They had changed so much, both of them. She was old and burdened, but Arthur, too, had changed from the young king stag. Not then, nor ever, did Morgaine know whether Arthur had recognized her. Their eyes met for a moment. Then he said gently, Would you take her home, then? Be it as you will, mother. Tell my stableman to give you a horse. Show them this. He put a ring into her hand. Morgaine bent her head, squeezing her eyes tight against tears. And when she raised it again, Arthur was gone. Here, I'll help you carry her, said one of the women nearby, and then another, and they bore Raven's slight body from the hall. And Morgaine was tempted to look back into the hall of the round table, for she knew she would never see it again, nor ever set foot again upon Camelot. Now her work was done, and she would return to Avalon. But she would return alone. Now she would always be alone. Chapter 10 Guinevere, watching the preparations in the hall, hearing Bishop Patricius's soft voice saying, No man may come to the father except he call upon my name, looked on the cup with mixed emotions. Half of her said, This beautiful thing should be dedicated, as Patricia's wishes, to the service of Christ. Even the Merlin has come at last to the cross. But the other half of her insisted, quite against her will, No, it would have been better to destroy it, to melt down the gold if need be, and fashion from it another chalice, dedicated from its first making to the true service of the true God. For this one is of the goddess, as they call her, and that same goddess is that great harlot who has from the beginning of time been the enemy of God. Truly the priests say, with woman came evil into this world. And then she was confused, for surely not all that is woman can be evil. Even God chose a woman to bear his son, and Christ himself spoke of heaven to his chosen disciples and their sisters and wives. One at least had forsaken that goddess. She felt her face soften as she looked on Nimue, Elaine's daughter, and very like Elaine as a child, but even more beautiful, with something of the smiling gaiety and dancing grace of the younger Lancelot. So fair and sweet was Nimue, she couldn't believe anything of her was evil. Yet this woman had served since childhood in the very house of the goddess. And now she had repented of that evil service, and come to Camelot, begging that no one should know that she had served in Avalon, not even Bishop Patricius, not even Arthur. It would be hard, Guinevere thought, to refuse Nimue anything at all. She had willingly pledged herself to keep the young maiden's secret. She looked past Nimue to where Patricius was standing, ready to take the cup with his hands. And then... And then it seemed to Guinevere that a great angel, wings falling away in shadow behind the shining form, raised between its hands a cup that glowed like a great shining star. It was crimson like a beating heart, a glowing ruby. No... But it was the very blue of the deepest heaven, and there was a scent like all the roses of every garden she had ever entered in all her life. And a great, clean-scented wind seemed suddenly to blow through the hall, and though they were at holy service, Guinevere suddenly felt that she could rise from her seat and run out of doors on the hills, into the great spaces which belonged to God, under his great wide healing sky. She knew knew deep within her heart that she would never again be afraid to leave the prison of chamber and hall. She could walk under the open sky and on the hills without fear, because wherever she might go, 
God would be with her. She smiled, disbelieving she heard herself laugh aloud, and the small, once prison thing within her asked angrily, At holy service? But the real Guinevere said, still laughing, though no one heard, If I may not take delight in God, then what is God to me? And then, through the sweet scents and joy, the angel was before her and the cup at her lips. Shaking, she drank, lowering her eyes. But then she felt a touch on her head and looked up, and she saw that it wasn't an angel, but a woman veiled in blue, with great sad eyes. There was no sound, but the woman said to her, Before Christ ever was, I am. And it was I who made you as you are. Therefore, my beloved daughter, forget all shame and be joyful, because you too are of the same nature as myself. Guinevere felt that her whole body and heart were made of pure joy. She hadn't been as happy as this since she was a little child. Even in Lancelot's arms, she had never known this absolute bliss. Ah! Could I only have brought this to my lover? She knew that the angel, or whatever presence had touched her, had moved on, and she was saddened that it had withdrawn. But the joy was still pulsing inside her, and she looked up with love as the angel held the burning cup to Lancelot's lips. Ah, if only she can give you some of this joy, my sorrowing lover. The fiery flames and the rushing wind filled the hall and were silenced. Guinevere ate and drank, although she never knew what it was, only that it was sweet and savorous, and she gave herself up to the delight of it. Surely, whatever has come among us today, it is holy. Silence fell on the hall. It seemed bare and empty in the pale noonday and Gawain had risen, crying out, and after him, Galahad. I swear that I shall spend all my life, if need be, till I see the grail clear before me. Bishop Patricius looked faint, and she remembered that he was old, and the altar where the cup had lain was empty. She rose swiftly from her place and went to him. Father, she said, and held a cup of wine to his lips. He sipped, and as the colour began to come back into his lined face, he whispered, Surely something holy has come among us. I was fed truly at the Lord's table by the very cup from which he drank on that last holy night before he went to his passion. Guinevere was beginning to know what had happened. Whatever had come to them that day by God's will was a vision. The bishop whispered, did you see, my queen, the very cup of Christ? She said gently, Alas, no, dear father. Perhaps I wasn't worthy for that. But I saw an angel, I think. And I thought for a moment it was God's holy mother who stood before me. God has given us each a vision, said Patricius. How I have prayed that something might come among us to inspire all these men with the love of the true vision of Christ. Guinevere thought of the ancient proverb, Have a care what you pray for, it might be given you. Surely something had inspired these men. One after another they were rising, pledging to spend a year and a day searching, and she thought, All of the round table now is scattering to the four winds. She looked at the altar where the chalice had lain. No, she thought. Bishop Patricius and Kevin the Merlin, you were wrong as Arthur was wrong. You cannot call down God to serve your own purposes this way. God blows through human purposes like a mighty wind, like the rush of angels' wings, which I heard in this hall this day, and tears them asunder. And then she wondered, what is wrong with me, that I am thinking to criticise Arthur or even the bishop for what they did? Yet then, with a new strength, she thought, By God, yes. 
They are not God. They are only men, and their purposes are not sacred. She looked at Arthur, walking now among the peasants and subjects at the far end of the hall. Down there something had happened. Some peasant had fallen down dead, perhaps overfilled with the joy of the Holy Presence. He came back, looking sorrowful. Gawain, must you go? Galahad, not you too, my son. Bors, Lionel, what, all of you? My lord Arthur, called out Mordred. He wore, as always, the crimson which suited him so well, and which exaggerated almost to the point of caricature his likeness to the young Lancelot. Arthur's voice was gentle. What is it, my dear boy? My king, I ask your permission not to go on this quest, he said. Though it may be laid on all your knights, someone must remain at your side. Guinevere felt an overflowing tenderness for the young man. Oh, this is Arthur's true son, not Galahad, all dreams and visions. Had there ever been a time when she had disliked and distrusted Mordred? She said, heartfelt, May God bless you, Mordred. And the young man smiled at her. Arthur bowed his head and said, Be it so, my son. It was the first time Arthur had called him so before other men. Guinevere gauged his disturbance by that. God help us both, Gwydion. Mordred, I should say, with so many of my companions scattered to the four corners of the world, and God alone can say whether or no they will ever return. He reached out and clasped Mordred's hands, and for a moment it seemed to Guinevere that he leaned on his son's strong arm. Lancelot came to her side and bowed. Lady, may I take my leave of you? It seemed to Guinevere that tears were as near the surface as joy. Oh, love, must you go on this quest? And cared not who heard her speak the words. Arthur, too, looked troubled, holding out his hand to his cousin and friend. Will you leave us, Lancelot? He nodded. There was something rapt otherworldly, shining in his face. So it had come to him, too, that great joy. But why, then, did he need to go forth to seek it? Surely it was within him as well. All these years, my love, she said, have you told me that you are none so good a Christian as all that? Why, then, must you run away from me on this quest? She saw him struggling for words, and at last he said, all those years I knew not whether God was nothing but an old tale told by the priests to frighten us. Now I have seen. He wet his lips again with his tongue, trying to find words for something beyond them. I have seen... something. If a vision such as this can be shown, whether of Christ or of the devil... Surely, interrupted Guinevere. Surely it came of God, Lancelot. So you say, for you have seen. You know, he said, holding her hand against his heart. I am not sure. Methinks my mother mocked at me, or all gods are one, as Taliesin used to say. I am torn now between the darkness of never knowing and the light beyond despair, which tells me... And again he fumbled for words. It was as if a great bell called to me, far away. A light, like to the faraway lights in the marsh, saying, Follow. And I know that the truth, the real truth, is there, there, just beyond my grasp, if I can only follow it, and find it there, and tear away that veil which shrouds it. It is there, if only I can reach it, my Guinevere. Would you deny me the search, now that I know there is truly something worth the finding? It seemed as if they were alone in a room, not in the court before all men. She knew she could prevail on him in all else, but 
but who can come between a man and his soul? God had not seen fit to give him this sureness and joy, and she didn't wonder that he must now go seeking for it. For if she had sensed it was there, yet without the surety, she too would have spent the rest of her life in that seeking. She reached both hands to him and said, feeling as though she embraced him before all men in the clear light of day, "Go then, my beloved." And God reward your search with the truth you seek. And he said, "God remain with you always, my queen, and may He grant that some day I return to you." Then he turned to Arthur, but Guinevere didn't hear what they said, only that he embraced Arthur as he had done when they were all young and innocent. Arthur stood, his hand on Guinevere's shoulder, watching him go. I think," he said softly, "that Lance is the best of us." And she turned to him, her heart overflowing with love for this good man who was her husband, and said, "I think so too, my dearest love." He said, surprising her, "I love you both, Gwen. Never think, never, that you are less to me than anything on earth." I'm almost glad you have never borne me a son," he added, almost in a whisper. "For then you might think I loved you only for that, and now I can say to you, I love you beyond all else, save only my duty to this land, whereof God has given me the stewardship, and you cannot be jealous of that." No," she said softly, and then, for once, meaning it absolutely without reservation, she said. And I love you too, Arthur. Never doubt that. I have never, for a moment, doubted that, my own dear love. And he raised both her hands to his lips and kissed them. And Guinevere was filled again with that great and overflowing joy. What woman alive has had so much of life that the two greatest men within the borders of this world have loved me? All around them, the noises of the court were rising again, demanding notice for the things of everyday life. Everyone, it seemed, had seen something different—an angel, a maiden bearing the Grail. Some, like herself, had seemed to see the Holy Mother, and many, many others had seen nothing—nothing nothing but a light too bright to bear—and had been filled with peace and joy, and been fed with such meats and drinks as they liked best. Now a rumor was going about that, by the favor of Christ, what they had seen was the very Grail from which Christ had drunk at the Last Supper among his disciples, where he broke the bread and shared the wine, as if it were body and blood of the ancient sacrifice. Had Bishop Patricius chosen his moment to spread that tale, while they were all confused, and no man knew precisely what he had actually seen? There was a tale Morgaine had told her, Guinevere remembered, crossing herself. Jesus of Nazareth, they said in Avalon, had come here in youth to be educated among the wise druids in Glastonbury, and after his death, his foster father, Joseph of Arimathea, had come here and struck his staff into the ground where it had blossomed into the holy thorn. Did it not then seem reasonable that this same Joseph had brought hither the cup of the sacrifice? Surely, whatever passed, it was holy. Surely this was a holy thing, since if it hadn't come of God, it couldn't be anything but a most evil enchantment. And how could such beauty, such joy, be evil? Yet whatever the bishop said. It had been an evil gift, Guinevere thought, shaking. One by one, the companions had arisen and ridden forth on their quest, and now she looked on a hall which was all but empty. They were gone, all the companions, save for Mordred, who had vowed to remain, and Kai, who was too old and lame to ride forth. Arthur turned away from Kai. She knew he must be comforting Kai for not riding on this quest with the others, 
And he said, Ah, oh, I too should have ridden forth with them. But I could not. I would not shatter their dream. She came and herself poured him some wine, and she wished suddenly that they were within their own rooms, not here where they were left alone in the hall of the round table. Arthur, you planned what happened. You told me that something amazing was being planned for Easter. Yes, he said, leaning back wearily in his chair. But I swear to you that I knew not what was planned by Bishop Patricius or by the Merlin. I knew that Kevin had brought here the holy regalia from Avalon. He laid a hand on his sword. I was given the sword at my crowning, and now it has been given to the service of this kingdom and of Christ. It seemed to me, as the Merlin said, that the holiest of mysteries of the ancient world should be put to the service of God, since all the gods are one, as Taliesin always told us. In the old days the Druids called their god by other names, but these things belong to God and should be given to him. Yet I know not what happened in the hall this day. You know not? You? Does it not seem to you that we beheld a true miracle, that God himself came before us to show that the Holy Grail should be reclaimed for his service? At times, I think so, said Arthur slowly. And then I wonder, was it not the magic of the Merlin which enchanted us, so that we should see a vision and think thus? For now are my companions gone forth from me, and who knows whether they shall ever return. He raised his face to her. She noticed, as from very far away, that his eyebrows were all white now and that his fair hair was liberally silvered. He said, Knew you not that Morgain was here? Morgain? Guinevere shook her head. No, I knew it not. Why came she not to greet us? He smiled. You ask that. She left our court under my great displeasure. His lips tightened and again his hand sought the hilt of Excalibur, as if to reassure himself that still it lay at his side. It hung now in a leather scabbard, a coarse and ugly thing. She had never dared to ask him what had become of the one Morgaine had made for him so many years ago. But now she guessed that was behind their quarrel. You knew it not, that she had rebelled against me, she would have put her paramour, Acolon, on the throne in my place. Guinevere had thought she would never again feel wrath at any living creature after the day's joyous vision. Even now, what she mostly felt was pity for Morgaine, and pity too for Arthur, knowing how he had loved and trusted the sister who had betrayed him. Why did you not tell me that? I never trusted her. That is why, said Arthur, pressing her hand. I thought I couldn't bear it to hear you say how you trusted her never, and how you had often warned me against her. But Morgaine was here this day in the guise of an old peasant woman. She looked old, Guinevere, old and harmless and sick. I think she had come in disguise for another look, perhaps, at that place where once she had held high state, and perhaps for another glimpse of her son. She looked older than our mother looked when she died. And he was silent, reckoning for a moment on his fingers, and saying at last, Why, and so she is, as I am older than my father ever was, my Guinevere. I think not. Morgaine came to do mischief. And if she did, why, for sure, it was prevented by the holy vision. And he was silent. Guinevere knew with her sure instinct that he didn't want to say aloud that he loved Morgaine still, and that he missed her. As the years pass, there are so many things I cannot say to Arthur, or he to me. But at least we both spoke today of Lancelot, and of the love that was among us all. And it seemed to her, for the moment, 
that this love was the greatest truth in her life. And that love could never be weighed out or measured. So much for this one, and so much for that. It was an endless and eternal flow, that the more she loved, the more love she had to give, as she gave it now to everyone, as it had been given to her by her vision. Even toward the Merlin today she felt that flow of warmth and tenderness. Look how Kevin struggles with his harp. Shall I send someone to help him, Arthur? Arthur smiled and said, He needs it not, for Nimue is ministering to him, see? And again she felt the flood of love, this time for Lancelot's daughter and Elaine's, child to two of those she had loved best. Nimue's hand under the Merlin's arm. Like the old tale of the maiden who fell in love with a wild beast from the depths of the forest. Ah, but today she even felt love for the Merlin too, and was glad that he had Nimue's strong young hands to help him. And as the days passed in the near empty court at Camelot, Nimue came to see more and more like the daughter she had never had. The girl listened with attentive courtesy when she spoke, flattered her subtly, was ever quick to wait upon her hand and foot. Only in one thing did Nimue displease Guinevere. She spent far too much time listening to the Merlin. He may now call himself Christian child, the queen warned, but at heart he is an old pagan. "'sworn by the barbaric rites of the Druids, which you have renounced. "'You can see still the serpents he wears on his wrists.' "'Nimue stroked her own satiny wrists. "'Why, so does Arthur,' she said gently. "'And I too might have worn them, cousin, had I not seen the great light. "'He is a wise man, and there is no man in all Britain "'who can play more sweetly upon the harp.' "'And there is the bond of Avalon to bind you,' said Guinevere, "'a little more sharply than she intended. "'No, no,' said Nimue. "'I beg of you, cousin, say this never to him. "'He didn't see my face at Avalon. "'He knows me not. "'And I do not wish him to think me an apostate from that faith to this.' "'She looked so troubled that Guinevere said lovingly, "'Why, if you wish, I will not tell him.' I haven't told even Arthur that you came to us from Avalon. And I am so fond of music and of the harp, Nimue pleaded. May I not speak with him? This ends Disc 6. The Prisoner in the Oak, Disc 7. Guinevere smiled indulgently. Your father, too, was a fine musician. Once he said that his mother had set a harp in his hand for a plaything before he was old enough even to hold a toy sword and taught him to touch the strings. I would like the Merlin better if he stayed with his harp and sought not to be one of Arthur's counsellors. Then she shuddered and said, To me the man is a monster. Nimue said patiently, I'm sorry to see you so against him, cousin. It isn't his doing. I'm sure he would rather be as handsome as my father and as strong as Gareth. Guinevere bent her head. I know it isn't charitable of me, but from childhood I've had a revulsion for those who are so misshapen. I'm not sure it wasn't the sight of Kevin which caused me to miscarry when last I had a chance to bear a son. And if God is good, does it not follow that what comes from God must be beautiful and perfect, and what is ugly and misshapen must be the work of the foul fiend? No, said Nimue. It seems not at all likely to me. God himself sent trials to the folk in holy writ, for he afflicted Job with leprosy and boils, and he caused Jonah to be swallowed up by a great fish. And again and again we are told he made his chosen people to suffer. And even Christ himself suffered. 
One might say that these people suffer because it is the will of God that they shall suffer more than others. It may be that Kevin suffers this affliction for some great sin he did in some life before this one. Bishop Patricius tells us that is a heathen notion, and no Christian should believe that abominable lie that we are born and reborn again. Or how should we ever go to heaven? Nimue smiled, remembering Morgain saying to her, "Never speak to me again of anything Father Griffin said to you." She thought she would like to say it now to Guinevere, but she kept her voice gentle. "Oh no, cousin! For even in Holy Scripture, it is told how men asked of John the Baptizer who he was. Some men said that Jesus Christ was Elijah come again, and he said instead." I tell you that Elijah has come among you already, and ye knew him not, and men knew, so it says in Holy Writ, that he spoke of John, and so, if Christ himself believed that men were reborn, how can it be wrong for mankind so to believe? Guinevere wondered how so much knowledge of Scripture had come to Nimue, living upon Avalon. And she remembered that Morgaine too had known more. She sometimes thought of the holy writings than she herself did. Nimue said, "I think perhaps the priests do not want us to think of other lives, because they wish us to be very good in this one. Many priests think there isn't much time remaining before the world will end and Christ come again." And so they are afraid that men will wait for another life to be good, and will not have time to attain perfection before Christ comes. If men knew they would be reborn, would they work so hard to be perfect in this life? That seems to me dangerous doctrine, Guinevere said. For if people believe that all men must at last be saved in some life or other, what would keep them from committing sins in this one? In the hope that at last God's mercy would prevail. I do not think that fear of the priests or of God's wrath, or anything else, will ever keep mankind from committing sins," said Nimue. "But only when they have gained enough wisdom in all their lives that they know error is useless and evil must be paid for, sooner or later." "Oh, hush, child," Guinevere said. Suppose someone should hear you speaking such heresies. Although it is true, she said after a moment, that since that day of Easter, it seems to me that there is infinite mercy in God's love, and perhaps God doesn't care so much about sin as some of the priests would have us believe. And now I am talking heresy too, perhaps. Nimue only smiled again. Thinking to herself, I didn't come to court to bring enlightenment to Guinevere. I have a more perilous mission, and it is not for me to preach to her the truth that all men, and all women too, must one day come to enlightenment. Do you not believe Christ will come again, Nimue? No, thought Nimue. I do not. I believe that the great enlightened ones, like Christ. Come but once after many lives spent in attaining wisdom, and then they go forth for ever into eternity. But I believe the divine ones will send other great masters to preach the truth to mankind, and that mankind will always receive them with the cross and the fire, and the stones. What I believe doesn't matter, cousin. What matters is the truth. Some priests preach that their god is a god of love. And others that he is evil and vengeful. Sometimes I feel that the priests were sent to punish people, since they would not hear Christ's words of love. God sent them the priests with their message of hatred and bigotry. And then she stopped short, for she didn't want to anger Guinevere. But the queen only said, "Well, Nimue, I have known priests like that." And if some priests are bad men," said Nimue, "I find it not wholly beyond reason that some druids might be good ones." 
There must, thought Guinevere, be some error in that reasoning, but she couldn't make it out. Well, my dear, you may be right, but it makes me queasy to see you with the Merlin. Although I know Morgaine thought well of him. It was rumoured here at court even that they were lovers. I wondered often how a woman so fastidious as Morgaine could have let him touch her. Nimue hadn't known that, and she thrust it away in her mind for reference. Was that how Morgaine had known of his undefended fortresses? She said only, Of all I learned in Avalon, what most I loved was music, and what I have heard in Holy Writ that pleases me most was the psalmist who told us to praise God with the lute and the harp. And Kevin has promised me that he will help me to find a harp, for I came away without my own. May I send for him here, cousin? Guinevere hesitated, but she couldn't resist the sweet entreaty in the young girl's smile, and said, To be sure you may, my dearest child. Chapter 11 After a time, the Merlin came. No, thought Nimue, I must remember he is no more now than Kevin the Harper, traitor to Avalon, and behind him a servant carrying my lady. Nimue thought, Now he is a Christian, there is no law that no other may touch his harp. It is simpler than keeping an initiated man about him to bear my lady when his strength fails. He walked with two sticks, dragging his tortured body after them. But he smiled at the ladies and said, You must consider, my queen and my lady Nimue, that somehow my spirit has made to you the courtly bow that my unruly body is no longer able to make. Nimue whispered, I beg you, cousin, ask him to sit. He cannot stand for long. Guinevere waved permission, glad for once of her near sight. That meant she needn't clearly see the misshapen body. For a moment, Nimue was afraid that Kevin's man was from Avalon and would recognise and perhaps greet her. But he was only a servant in the dress of the court. How had Morgaine, or old Raven, been able to see so far ahead to order her as a child into seclusion, so that when she came to womanhood, there would be one fully trained priestess in Avalon whom the Merlin would not know by sight. She understood that she was merely a pawn in the great work of the world, sent forth with no weapons but her beauty and her guarded virginity, to work the vengeance of the goddess on this man who had betrayed them all. Nimue placed another cushion from her own chair under the Merlin's arm. His bones seemed to protrude through the skin, and when she barely touched his elbow, it seemed that there was so much heat in the swollen joints that it burned her, and she felt a moment's pity and rebellion. Surely the goddess already works her own vengeance. This man has surely suffered enough. There Christ suffered a day on the cross, this man has been crucified in his broken body for a lifetime. Yet others had been burned for their faith, and hadn't broken, nor betrayed the mysteries. She hardened her heart and said sweetly, Lord Merlin, will you play your harp for me? For you, my lady, Kevin said in his rich voice, I will play what you will. And I could wish I were that ancient bard who could play till the trees danced. Oh, no, said Nimue with mocking laughter. What would we do if they came dancing in here? Why, we would have earth all over the hall, and all our maids with mops and brooms wouldn't be able to clean it. Leave the trees where they are, I beg you, and sing. The Merlin put his hands to the harp and began to play. Nimue sat beside him on the floor, her great eyes looking up, intent, into his face. The Merlin looked down on the maiden, just as a great dog might watch its master, with humble devotion and utter preoccupation. 
Guinevere took such emotion almost for granted. She herself had been the object of intense devotion so often that she never thought twice about it. It was simply the homage that men paid to beauty. Perhaps, though, she should warn Nimue lest her head be turned by it. Yet she couldn't imagine how Nimue could sit so close to his ugliness, or look at him so attentively. There was something about Nimue that puzzled Guinevere. Somehow. The girl's concentration was not quite what it seemed. It wasn't the delight taken by one musician in another's work, nor was it the artless admiration of a naive maiden for a well-travelled and mature man. No, thought Guinevere, and it wasn't a sudden passion either. That she could have understood, and in a sense sympathised with. She herself had known that sudden, overpowering love which sweeps away all obstacles. It had struck her like lightning, and had ruined all her hopes that her marriage with Arthur could be a good and proper one. It had been a curse, yet she had known it was something that came of itself, over which neither she nor Lancelot had any power. She had come to terms with it, and she could have accepted that it had happened to Nimue. Even though Kevin the Merlin seemed the most unlikely object for such a passion, but it wasn't that. She didn't know how she knew, but she knew. Simple lust. It might have been that on Kevin's part. Nimue was beautiful, and even though the Merlin had been most circumspect, she might have kindled any man. But Guinevere couldn't believe that Nimue had been likewise roused by such a one when she had remained courteous but cool and unattainable to all of Guinevere's handsomest young knights. From where she sat at the Merlin's feet, Nimue sensed that Guinevere was watching her. But she didn't turn her eyes away from Kevin. In a way, she thought, I am enchanting him. Her purpose demanded that she have him completely at her mercy, her slave, and her victim. And again, she stifled the flash of pity that she felt. This man had done worse than simply revealing the mysteries or the secret teaching. He had given the holy things themselves into the hands of the Christians to be profaned. Ruthlessly, Nimue refused to consider her next thought: that the Christians hadn't intended profanation. But hallowing, the Christians knew nothing of the inner truths of the mysteries, and in any case, the Merlin had betrayed a sworn oath, and the goddess appeared to prevent that profanation. Nimue had had enough training in the mysteries to know what she had witnessed. Even now, a shiver went over her at the thought of what had passed among the companions on that festival day. She hadn't wholly understood, but she knew that she had touched the greatest holiness, and the Merlin would have profaned this. No, he must die like the dog he was. The harp was silent. Kevin said, "I have a harp for you, lady, if you will accept it." It is one which I fashioned with my own hands when I was a lad on Avalon, and first come there. I have made others, and they are better, but this is a good one, and I have carried it long. If you will accept it, it is yours. Nimue protested that such a gift was all too valuable, but inwardly she was overjoyed. If she should possess something so valuable to him personally. Something he had fashioned with his own hands and labour, then would it bind him to her, just as if it were a lock of his own hair, or a drop of his blood. There were not many, even in Avalon, who knew that the law of magic went so far, that something which had been so intimately intertwined with the mind and the heart and the passions, and Nimue grasped that music was his deepest passion. Retained even more of the soul than hair clipped from the body retained the essence of the body. She thought with satisfaction, he himself, of his own free will, 
has put his soul into my hands. When he sent for the harp, she caressed it. Small and crudely made as it was, the post had been worn smooth with resting against his body, and his hands had touched the strings with love. Even now they lingered on it tenderly. She touched the strings, testing their music. In truth, the tone of the harp was good. He had somehow managed that perfect curve and structure that made the sounding board echo the strings with the sweetest tone. And if he had done this as a boy, with those mutilated hands. Again, Nimue felt the surge of pity and pain. Why did he not keep to his music and meddle not in the high affairs of state? You are too kind to me. She let her voice tremble, hoping he would think it was passion instead of triumph. With this, soon he will be mine, possessed body and soul. But it was too soon. The great tides of Avalon running in her blood told her that the moon was waxing. Such great magic as this could be worked only in moon dark, the slack time when the lady sheds none of her light on the world and her hidden purposes are made known. She mustn't let his passion grow beyond bounds, nor her own sympathy with him. He will desire me at full moon. This bond I am forging is a double-edged sword, a rope with two ends. I will desire him as well. I cannot prevent that. For an enchantment to be total, it must involve both enchanter and enchanted. And she knew, with a spasm of terror, that this spell she was weaving would work on her too, and rebound on her. She couldn't pretend passion and desire. She must feel them as well. She knew, with a fear that wrung her heart, that even as the Merlin would be helpless in her hands, so it might well be that she would come to be helpless in his. And what of me, O oh goddess, mother? That is all too great a price to pay. Let it not come on me. No, no, I'm afraid. Well, Nimue, my dear, Guinevere said, now that you have the harp in your hands, will you play and sing for me? She let her hair curtain her face as she looked timidly at the Merlin and murmured, Shall I then? I beg you to play, he said. Your voice is sweet, and I can hear that your hands will bring enchantment from the strings. They will indeed, if I am favoured of the goddess. Nimue set her hands to the strings, remembering that she mustn't play any song of Avalon that he would remember and recognise. She began to play a drinking song she had heard at the court, with words none too proper for a maiden. She saw Guinevere looking scandalised and thought, Good, if she is shocked by my unmaidenly behaviour, she will not inquire too deeply into my motives. Then she played and sang a lament she had heard from a northern harper, the mournful song of a fisherman out on the sea, looking for the lights of his home on the shore. At the end of the song she rose, looking shyly at him. I thank you for the use of your harp. May I borrow it again that my hands may keep their skill? It is my gift to you, said Kevin. Now that I have heard what music your hands can bring from it, it could belong to no other. Keep it, I beg you. I have many harps. You are too kind to me, she murmured. But I beg you, now that I can make music for myself, do not abandon me or deprive me of the pleasure of listening to yours. I will play for you whenever you ask me, Kevin said and she knew that his heart was in the words. She contrived to brush against him as she leaned forward to take the harp. She murmured softly, so Guinevere wouldn't hear, Words alone cannot express my gratitude to you. Perhaps a time will come when I can express it more fittingly. He looked at her, dazed, and she discovered that she was returning his gaze with the same intensity. 
A double-edged spell indeed. I am victim too. He went away and she sat obediently by Guinevere and tried to turn her attention to her spinning. How beautifully you play, Nimui, said Guinevere. I need not ask where you learned. I heard Morgaine sing that lament once. Nimui said, averting her eyes, Tell me something of Morgaine. She had departed from Avalon before I came there. She was married to a king in... Lothian, was it? In the north of Wales, Guinevere began. Nimui, who knew all this perfectly well, was still not completely false. Morgaine remained a puzzle to her, and she was eager to know how the Lady Morgaine had appeared to those who knew her in the world. Morgaine was one of my ladies in waiting, Guinevere was saying. Arthur gave her to me as such on our wedding day. Of course he had been fostered apart from her, and hardly knew her either. As she listened attentively, Nimui, who had been trained to read emotions, realized that beneath Guinevere's dislike for Morgaine, there was something else, respect, or even a kind of tenderness. If Guinevere were not so fanatically, mindlessly Christian, she would have loved Morgaine well. At least while Guinevere was talking of Morgaine, even though she condemned her as an evil sorceress, she was not mouthing the pious nonsense that bored Nimui almost to weeping. But she couldn't give Guinevere's tales her full attention. She sat in an attitude of passionate interest. She made the proper sounds of attention or astonishment. But within, her mind was in turmoil. I'm afraid. I can come to be the Merlin's slave and victim as I would have him mine. Goddess, great mother... It is not I who must face him, but you. The moon was waxing, four nights until full, and she could already feel the stirring of that tide of life. She thought of the Merlin's intent gaze, his magical eyes, the beauty of his voice, and knew that already she was deeply entangled in her own spell weaving. Already she had ceased to feel the slightest revulsion against his twisted body, feeling only the strength and life force flowing within it. If I give myself to him at full moon, she thought, then will the tides of life within us both be taken at the flood. Then will my purposes become his own. Then will we blend together as one flesh. She felt an ache and agony of desire, longing to be caressed by those sensitive hands, feel his warm breath against her mouth. Everything in her ached together in hunger, which, she knew, was at least partly an echo of his own desire and frustration. The magical link she had created between them meant she too must be tormented with his torment. When life runs full at the rounding of the moon, then shall the goddess receive the body of her lover. It wasn't altogether beyond belief. She was the daughter of the Queen's champion and the King's closest friend. Kevin, the Merlin, unlike a Christian priest, wasn't forbidden to marry. The court would be pleased at a marriage so high-placed, even though some of the ladies would be shocked that she could yield up her delicate body to a man they considered a monster. Arthur surely knew that Kevin could not, after what he had done, return to Avalon but he had a place at court as the king's counsellor. Also, he was a musician of surpassing skill. There would be a place for us, and happiness. When the moon is full, brimming with life, he will plant a child in my womb, and I will bear it joyfully. He is not monster-born. His deformity is from childhood injuries. His sons would be handsome. And then she stopped herself, disturbed by the power of her own fantasies. No, she mustn't become so deeply entangled in this spell. She must deny herself, even though the waxing moon made the surging blood in her veins a very agony of frustration. She must wait. Wait. 
as she had waited all those years. There is a magic that comes with yielding to life. The priestesses of Avalon knew it when they lay in the fields at Beltane, invoking the life of the goddess in their own bodies and hearts. But there is a deeper magic which comes from guarding the power, damming up the stream. The Christians knew something of this when they insisted that their holy virgins live in chastity and seclusion, that they might burn with the darker flame of that harnessed force, that their chaste priests might pour all their contained power into their mysteries, such as they were. Nimue had felt that power in the lightest word or gesture from Raven, who had never wasted words on anything trivial, so that her force, when she spent it, was tremendous. She had wondered often, alone in the temple at Avalon, when she was forbidden to mingle with the other maidens, or to go to the rites, when she felt that life force in her veins with such power that she sometimes burst into hysterical crying, or tore at her hair and her face, why had they set her aside for this? Why must she bear the terrible weight of all this without relief? But she had trusted the goddess, and obeyed her mentors, and now they had entrusted this great work to her, and she mustn't fail them through her own weakness. She was a charged vessel of power, like the holy regalia, which it was death to touch unprepared, and all this power of her long preparation would be hers to bind the Merlin to her. But she must wait for the tide to slacken and fill again. At the dark moon she must take the other tide which came of the other side of the moon, not fertile, but barren, not of life at all, but of dark magic, older than human life. And the Merlin knew these things. He knew of the old curse of the dark moon and the barren womb. He must be so wholly inspelled by her that he wouldn't even wonder why she had refused him at the spring tide and sought him out at the slack. 